What's up guys? It's yo boy Omnisensei. Welcome to a remastered version of one of my earliest series, What If I Was Reborn in Naruto as as a Blind Natural Sage Samurai. Part 2. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story. Link in the description. With all that out of the way, enjoy. POV narration, Ken and Saburo's clones continue dashing from tree to tree, with the blind swordsman adjusting his speed and allowing the clones to keep up with him. They eventually stopped in the middle of a clearing, with Saburo looking at Ken with a curious gaze through many pairs of eyes. So, now that we are away from that mess? What does your organization have to offer, Red Dot? One of Saburo's clones stepped forward, who had been acting as an Umbu captain previously. First off, Call me Ken. That moniker is not something I actually go by. Ken sighed as he sat down a bit, speaking in an even tone with Saburo. Second of all, my organization is still quite new, and growing, it hasn't even made an appearance in the world as of now. Ken didn't bother lying or sugarcoating the state of his organization. So we're talking about a fledgling group of nameless shinobi? Saburo's tone sounded a bit less impressed. We aren't exclusively recruiting former shinobi. Plenty of our recruits are just former orphans that we deem talented enough to learn. Ken wasn't exactly discouraged, he had already decided that Saburo was going to join him, so he wasn't exactly stressed out about impressing the strawman with the state of his organization. He can either prove to be a great asset or a liability. If he refuses to join, or his demands are too annoying, then I will kill him and all of his clones. If he joins, then all the better. His technique does seem extremely useful for reconnaissance. Former orphans? Well, I guess that's certainly a way to build up a loyal following. Say, how many people are there currently in this organization? Adjusting to development speed, and some information that my right hand provided, there should currently be around 16 people, 15 of which are in training. Ken remembered Tasho mentioning that he had found a dilapidated orphanage to recruit from, so the blind swordsman expected even more people to be recruited on his next time checking up with Tasho. That doesn't sound quite as promising as what I had in mind. Saburo seemed wholly disappointed now. The only reason I'm still even talking to this man is that he is truly powerful enough to build something great. In the future, he will certainly build something worth joining, but I also need support in the short term. The strawman scratched his chin a few times, weighing his options. I can see you aren't quite as satisfied with what you're hearing. Ken decided to just call out the strawman on his indecisiveness. I won't lie to you, Ken. I expected a lot more from someone like you, but you did say it's a new organization. Hmm, I can understand a bit of hesitation. Maybe I can help convince you further. Currently, I am close to 11 years old, my current strength should speak for itself. Ken decided to attract Saburo with his talent instead, seeing as his organization wasn't proving to be enough. Saburo and all of his clones seemed to start choking instantly when hearing that. Any composure that the strawman might have had vanished completely. He studied Ken for a few seconds, and now he could see it. Ken was still short by adult standards, he was also skinny by adult standards, even if he was well defined. In retrospect, one could still guess Ken's age from his appearance. But his raspy voice, scars, and overall demeanor made it absolutely impossible for anyone to guess his age. To think. To think that the one to bring a village to its knees would be a child. Saburo still remembered seeing Ken coldly ripping people apart, how his tail and claws cut through everyone who even got close to him. If he is already this strong, then he even has a chance to become the next god of shinobi, doesn't he? I would ask for further proof. But I doubt someone like you would have any identity documents relating to any nation. Saburo smiled with a glint in his eyes. Ken just nodded, not bothering to say anything more after confirming his age. Since he's so young, doesn't that mean I can take advantage of his lack of experience and end up leading this organization? No, I can think about that later, 
He doesn't seem especially inexperienced in the ways of the world either. I agree then. Just because I want to see how much you are able to grow in the future. If your organization grows large enough to rival other villages, then that's also good. Saburo extended his hand, and Ken shook it without any hesitation. The masked swordsman's grip was strong, much stronger than a child's grip had any right to be. Saburo could only sweat a bit at that. I'm guessing we'd want to go to your main body first, right? It's not even that far from here. Ken then turned his head in a random direction, and Saburo instantly paled, retracting his hand and jumping away in fear. H how dash Saburo's voice was filled with fear. For a few seconds, he had forgotten how dangerous Ken was, letting his guard down and thinking of him as a child. Your clones, you are connected to every single one. I discovered this during the fight, but a thread of chakra exists between you and all of the clones. Ken didn't bother to tell the scared strawman that he needed to be in contact with the clones in order to feel that connection they had with the main body, he felt that there was no need to get into details. No reason to act scared now, you are already part of my organization. I don't see any need to harm you right now. Ken then started walking in that random direction, with Saburo slowly walking behind him alongside his many clones. Right now, huh? So I guess taking advantage of him isn't going to be easy. The strawman almost wanted to scowl, but he didn't wish to show any displeasure to the blind monster in front of him. Saburo simply decided to see where their partnership would go, it wasn't like he was planning on backstabbing Ken anytime soon, or ever, depending on how things went. By the way, I'm assuming I shouldn't expect too many funds right now, correct? Moving will necessitate quite a bit of equipment being left behind, as it isn't easy to carry, too big to fit in a ceiling scroll too. The strawman said as he followed a few steps behind the blind monster. Funding won't be an issue. I have made quite a bit during my bounty hunting career. Also, I stole all of the money I could find in the grass village, so we aren't exactly strapped for cash. Ken smiled a bit as he continued walking. Saburo only smiled when hearing that, chuckling a bit internally as he remembered Ken bragging about not being interested in their wealth. The way that the child in front of him could shamelessly lie right in front of the face of every shinobi present was actually astoundingly amusing to the strawman. I guess following his orders will be more entertaining than following a few crusty old men. And since it's a small organization with a lot of cash, I can receive much larger funding. Saburo almost couldn't help but smile at the thought of continuing his experiments unhindered. Ken and the clones continued strolling all the way to a large tree, Ken yawned a bit before tapping the trunk of the tree with the tip of his shoe in a specific spot. After noticing that nothing was happening, he raised his leg a bit more and was about to kick the tree away. Saburo stopped him though, sweating a bit as he did so. No need to destroy the entrance. This place could still be useful. The strawman's argument was actually extremely reasonable. So Ken ended up just nodding and allowing Saburo to open up the fake tree. The clone stepped forward and tapped the tree in a few specific locations a few times until a lock mechanism seemed to click, and a part of the trunk slid open like a tatami door. Nice hiding spot. Ken said as he felt the opening lead down, through the roots of the fake tree and into a large underground cave. It did take a few years on the run to come up with something like this. Saburo shrugged, quite pleased with the compliment although he was still disappointed an almost 11-year-old child would be able to find his main body and hide out. Saburo's clones made way for Ken, who jumped down the open fake tree and landed in a rather well-lit corridor that led to a metallic door. The clones followed suit and once again opened the door for him using a strange set of hand signs. There was some type of seal spread out on the door from what Ken could sense. This place really is rather well defended. I wonder how much it would take to build something similar for our organization. By the way, what name does this organization of ours have? Saburo asked as the steel doors slid open. The name is still a work in progress. Ken simply shrugged, sensing the inside of the laboratory with a calm smile. This place is a lot bigger than I expected. The laboratory was much bigger inside than even the Kage building he had besieged previously, so Ken was a tad surprised by the amount of work put into that secret hideout. The organization has no name? Saburo sweated a bit when he heard that, looking around and wondering just how new the organization actually was. 
Well, we are still only a few months off from starting it. No reason to rush, we won't be announcing it to the world anytime soon either. Ken simply shrugged away the strawman's concern. Well, the name would also help provide the current members with a sense of belonging if we play things right. The name isn't just for outsiders. Saburo scratched the back of his head as he brought a rather good point to the table, something that Ken hadn't really thought about. I guess you're right? Ken started scratching his chin instantly, somewhat embarrassed, but not quite enough to react outwardly in any way. We'll have to come up with a name by the time we return, I guess. We will? Saburo was a bit confused when hearing that, his eyebrows scrunched up together as he looked at Ken through many pairs of eyes. You're officially one of the leaders of this organization and the one in charge of all research. I hereby give you the right to help me come up with a name. Ken crossed his arms and spoke in a resolute, confident tone. An outsider wouldn't even notice just how shamelessly the blind swordsman was pushing his work onto Saburo if they listened to his tone. His confidence made it look as if he was rewarding Saburo in some way. I guess he really is still a child. Well, I can still work with this. Saburo was too flabbergasted to speak for a while, and Ken continued inside. I guess I'll come up with a few possible names by the time we arrive at the location of our main base. The strawman could only relent, not willing to call out his new leader on his shamelessness. Is this place to your liking, Ken? Another version of Saburo walked up to the group from inside the room, behind him were another two dozen clones. Oh, finally speaking to the original, huh? This place is much nicer than I expected. Ken said as he turned his head towards the one that had stepped forward. From what the blind swordsman could feel, the original Saburo looked much the same as his clones did, he was however dressed in casual attire, and not wearing a headband of any kind. The original Saburo also seemed to be about as much chakra as a high-level jonin, though Ken had no way of knowing how good he really was when it came to technique, he could just assume that he was at least as good as his clones were. I am indeed the original, though I didn't think anyone would be able to catch on to my technique so easily. Saburo tilted his head and smiled warmly at his new leader. The strawman instantly decided to start sucking up to Ken. But it didn't seem to be having much of an effect. As well faked as his smile was, Ken still didn't react to it in any visible way. I am just special. I doubt anyone would be able to tell you apart from your clones under normal circumstances. Ken was quite sure that he was speaking the truth. He was also quite sure that the elders of the grass village actually thought that one of the Umbu clones was actually Saburo. From the number of people that had come to greet him at the door, Ken could also observe that Saburo had kept quite a few clones hidden from the village. Special ha? Huh? I guess he truly is special in more ways than one. His talent is quite unheard of. Under normal circumstances, my technique would be flawless. Yet you also managed to find this place with relative ease. That's inevitable, my powers as a sensor are a lot greater than any shinobi I've ever met. I would say that is actually my strongest point. Ken nodded his head, looking to reassure the strawman that his technique wasn't exactly faulty in any way. Understood. That is his strongest point? So that transformation, coupled with his skill in taijutsu and kenjutsu are not even his main powers? Now, let us start heading out, have you already grabbed everything you needed from this place? The blind swordsman asked as he tapped the tip of his shoe on the ground a few times. He could feel quite a lot of interesting things residing inside that laboratory, including a mound of corpses that Ken assumed were shinobi. The blind swordsman was still quite unwilling to harm innocent even if they were civilians, I won't be getting into a fight with Saburo over this. He's too useful, and they are already dead, so it can't be helped. I'll just make sure his victims are criminals and other shinobi in the future. I have already prepared everything that is needed. I don't wish to destroy this place however, I hope that is okay with you. Saburo seemed happy to leave as soon as possible, but he still wanted to keep the laboratory intact. No reason to destroy it. Seems like it could be useful in the future as well. Ken seemed to be quite okay with it, he had already not destroyed the entrance, so it wasn't like he was going to have a change of heart. Let's get going. We still need to go and get Akira. The thief? Yep, he is also a recruit. And just like that, Ken and Saburo started heading off. Saburo's clones now were somewhere around 50 in total, so the organization's numbers were bolstered greatly just like that. 
The blind swordsman continued dashing from tree to tree, quite excited to make his way back home and introduce Tasho to the new recruits. POV narration, Ken and Saburo started making their way towards the cave that Akira resided in without wasting more time. They had sealed the secret lair entrance to keep it hidden and intact, to make sure no one would just accidentally stumble upon it, though that was already unlikely. Ken realized that if a sensor as good as him ran by it, they could still spot it, but it was really impossible to plan for all possible situations. Still, the blind swordsman was quite pleased with the way things had developed. With Saburo, we've gained 45 able-bodied shinobi, all chunin or above. Well, 44 to be more exact. I doubt the original body will ever go in any missions. He shouldn't even be allowed to. Losing him would be a lot more annoying than losing a single highly trained assassin. With his help, I can finally jumpstart this organization for good, start hunting bounties on a broader scale. Ken was well and truly excited for Saburo to settle into his little organization, getting the strawman's allegiance was the greatest reward for all of his trouble with the grass village. Their techniques and money were also good, but he wasn't even sure how much money was in the scrolls he had stolen, nor what techniques he had received. The most valuable thing is the friends we made along the way. Ooh. Ken couldn't help but laugh internally at his own bad jokes, some small chuckles escaping outside as the blind swordsman was not as cautious as usual. The most amusing part was that Ken and Saburo were the furthest apart from friends. They were both well aware that as soon as their business relationship soured, they would be at each other's throats with no hesitation. Ken put no trust in Saburo. And the strawman was not oblivious to that. No, he even respected it. Such is the mentality one must have in this bleak world. That was what the strawman thought. Though he found it exceedingly odd that a child could adapt to their world so quickly and easily. Ken's occasional giggle and raspy chuckle along the way as he remembered some random joke was the only thing that could remind Saburo that the blind monster was still a child. The strawman always just looked at the masked child with a raised eyebrow, not bothering to ask what had amused him so much. The entire situation was amusing to him, to begin with, so he wasn't about to judge the perpetrator for laughing. An entire village begging the one they had attacked to please leave them alone was a funny prospect. Ken and Saburo reached Akira's cave after a few more minutes. Instantly, Akira became alert when seeing close to 50 shinobi descend on his hideout, he immediately tried to run away but seeing Ken calmed him down greatly. The thought of Ken allying himself with the grass village and hunting him down again didn't even cross his mind. Well, it had slightly. Ken was traveling with plenty of shinobi visibly wearing a grass village headband, but Akira shoved the idea out quickly as it was a rather stupid conclusion to reach. After all, if that had been the case Ken would have already knocked him out and or killed him. He also took notice of Ken's appearance, his long coat was now both tattered and bloody, it also revealed parts of his body, filled with scars and lithe muscles but no wounds whatsoever. I was about to think you wouldn't make it back, boss. Akira immediately started calling Ken his boss and rubbing his hands together like a shrewd businessman. Seeing him come back and scathe made Akira want to follow him immediately. After all, someone that could stand up to an entire village was usually someone worth following, and Akira was already a wanted man, he needed protection. If you keep doing that with your hands I'll cut them off. Akira immediately stopped rubbing his hands together at Ken's threat though. What's with all of the shinobi though? Are you getting escorted out of their territory or something? Akira pointed at Saburo and his many clones. They will be joining me from now on. I am building an organization currently, and some extra hands are welcome. Yours will do just fine too. Ken decided to just be upfront with Akira, as he wanted to invite the thief to join them as well. Thanks, boss. I'd be more than glad to join you. Akira immediately kneeled in front of the bounty hunter, calling him boss once more. His shamelessness made Saburo sweat slightly, but the strawman could understand the thief's thought process well enough. The weak follow the strong for benefit. That much is just natural law at this point. Is it really wise to trust the former shinobi of the village you just raided? Akira was a bit skeptical about Saburo though. I assure you that MR relationship with the grass village was nothing more than transactional. Saburo decided to step out and speak for himself, meanwhile his clones also just threw away their headbands, as they didn't need them anyway. Akira could only raise an eyebrow at that. 
Shinobi never threw away their headbands, they never threw away the marks of their original village, even if they cut a line in the middle of it. It was a sign of loyalty, a sign that something still tied them to the place they came from. Be it spite, hatred, longing, or regret, all rogue shinobi kept their headbands. In truth, most of them were just brainwashed to think highly of their respective hidden villages from a young age. All of their friends and families gathered in one place. It was a great way to foster loyal shinobi and it was also extremely easy to indoctrinate them and convince them that dying for the village was acceptable and even heroic. The hidden villages had managed to draw a parallel in between families and the village. Some had even managed to convince shinobi to put the village above their families. The good of the village was, at the end of the day, much more important than personal happiness and the safety of your loved ones. Other times, the safety of the village was directly related to the happiness of your loved ones. It was a rather well thought out system. Few outsiders could see it for what it was, and Akira was one of them, as he had seen many shinobi and he had traveled a lot despite his young age. That was why the scene of shinobi just throwing away their headbands was so jarring. But it did its job of convincing Akira. The thief was still a bit skeptical, of course, but he didn't voice any displeasure anymore. Ken didn't bother to explain that Saburo was just one person, extremely sadistic and opportunistic at that. The blind swordsman also didn't bother to introduce Akira to anyone but the original strawman, calling him the de facto leader of the deserting shinobi. Akira was a bit weirded out by how silent every single one of the shinobi was, but he didn't voice out any more complaints, he was just glad that his savior slash benefactor was back in one piece. The thief was rather shocked to hear a bit more about what had transpired in the village, but it was still within his expectations after seeing Ken decimate the group that had attacked them. It was already clear enough that numbers won't help you much against the Red Da. This just helped solidify that, and this should also help the world realize that he isn't someone to mess around with. Still, none of the people present expected the news to come out of the village quickly. They expected the grass village to internally suppress it for a few weeks at the very least. They didn't know that a storm was already brewing throughout the world, in but a few hours, every important figure got wind of the fact that a single bounty hunter brought a hidden village to its knees. Bohahahaha. A, the third rakage, couldn't help but burst out laughing when reading that. He slapped his desk with jubilation as he heartily laughed at how absurd Ken's achievements seemed to be for a single bounty hunter. Immediately, the rakage became even more interested to have the masked assassin in his fold. Not only was the report thorough, it included everything, even the fact that the grass village was forced to surrender and that they weren't able to do any meaningful damage to the red dot. Overall, the reputation of the grass village was tarnished, and their power was extremely diminished, with even their umbu captain and a sizable number of umbu going and joining the bounty hunter instead. It was a pathetic loss for a hidden village to ever admit to. Even the rakage was shocked to see how willing the grass village was to write on its own sorry condition. However, the rakage couldn't really bring himself to laugh at them, as he could see exactly what the elders of the hidden village were trying to do. They seemed to have a rather clear goal in mind when announcing their failure so quickly. Asking for aid from one of its former allies, Kanahagakur, the village hidden in the leaves. Elder Yu was initially going to try to bide his time a bit, but discovering that he had absolutely nothing to work with inside the village, he knew that the faster he revealed everything and asked for help the better he was off. The hidden village immediately called Saburo and his shinobi criminals. They didn't denounce him for any of his unsavory experiments though, as they didn't wish to implicate themselves with that. Thankfully, the second shinobi war was already coming to an end, and most of the villages were somewhat spent. None were willing to attack the grass village when reading reports that Ken had already taken everything from them, and they also didn't have much land or resources to take either, as it was a rather small nation. By revealing the news in such a way, the shrewd elder had managed to momentarily take the target off his back and put it on the bounty hunter that was now technically one of the richest men alive. Such power and wealth are currently just roaming the world, huh? Many bounty hunters were tempted to try their hand at the newly risen Red Da. But not that many were actually willing to try. His reputation was already quite fearful before, but now it had already reached a whole new level. It was clear that no shinobi was going to stop by and sit down at any of his roadside grill parties. 
The fear had now truly set in, and it was clear that Ken didn't just go for targets. It was still unknown what exactly made Ken attack the village, so people would rather choose to not find out on their own skin. The limits of the Red Dot's patience that is. The five Kage were well aware of the full situation though, especially those that had wanted Ken dead. No one bothered to speak out on Ken's reasons, so they remained a mystery, and the blind swordsman was called a bloodthirsty monster and criminal. Ken and the rest had caught wind of that, about one week into their journey while passing through a small village. The people there were visibly fearful of Ken and his men, a squad of close to 50 shinobi rolling up on a village was rather intimidating after all. They also received other new and rather interesting pieces of information. The second shinobi war has officially ended, huh? One week, in one week the villages had finally stopped their fights. The highlights? Kanahagakur had managed to defeat Amakagur and Sunagakur, or at least it did so on paper. Losses were great on all sides. Now, the Leaf Village was the strongest hidden village. It had proven itself by fighting on multiple fronts and having the most powerful shinobi. For one, the Hokage, Sarutobi Hiruzen, the current god of shinobi, is said to have mastered all ninjutsu. There were also his disciples, all three of which had become renowned in the war and had gained the title of the Sanin, legendary three shinobi. They had gained their titles by facing off against Hanzo of the Rain, who had bestowed the titles upon them by himself during their battle. It was a rather heroic tale, as Hanzo was known for his strength, a man powerful enough to stand on the same stage as the five Kage. Another prominent figure was Kanoha's White Fang, who had also distinguished himself against the Sunagakure. Overall, the village was simply brimming with talent and power. How could it not? Especially with the strong foundation that the first and second Hokage had left them. Still, the end of the war made no difference to Ken. It only meant that he would be able to go about his business while witnessing a bit less bloodshed on the way. The blind swordsman was already lucky enough to have stumbled upon three different sites where shinobi had killed each other en masse during his bounty hunting. It was a rather grim scene, and even nature seemed unwilling to grow there for a while, though that might have been because of the scorched ground and cracked earth. Ken and the rest continued their journey without bothering too much to dwell on the news. It wasn't like they didn't expect the grass village to paint Ken as some sort of maniac. That much was so obvious that it hadn't even deserved mention before. The point that the blind swordsman had wanted to make had still come across. That he was a bounty hunter whom one shouldn't be messing around with. That was the reputation that Ken had wanted to build when he had set out in the first place, so in a sense, he could thank the grass village for the help. Ken also remembered something quite crucial as soon as he entered the forest where his hideout was. I forgot to tell Tasho to prepare housing for all of us ahead of time. POV narration when naming an organization, it was important to get across the message of what the organization was about and for. In truth, Ken had no clue what to name it initially. He wanted the organization to be his eyes in that world, but he didn't want to give them a name hinting at his lack of vision. While he didn't care about that fact getting out, he didn't want to put an even bigger sign on his back claiming that he was special. After all, when Ken finally took his mask off and Akira and Saburo saw his face, both of them seemed petrified. Saburo especially, who had personally seen Ken in action. His blindness didn't affect his awareness of the world in any great manner but knowing he used his senses to see allowed others to find ways to use that as a weakness against him. Just like the explosions had overloaded his senses for a few seconds back in the grass village. If Ken was fighting a powerful shinobi that was already privy to the fact that the blind monster was susceptible to such attacks, they would have used them to distract him constantly. There was a clear fix for that. Ken could always just use his nature energy to sense his surroundings constantly. There was nothing stopping him from sensing others using that, as no living life form could truly hide their natural energy. The problem was that Ken would have to shut off his other senses, making him well and truly blind to the world. He would feel the aura, he would feel attacks coming, but he would not be able to see them. It would be like a normal sensor, well, a sage, fighting with a blindfold on. In the end, Ken decided to keep that part of him a secret in order to avoid enemies taking advantage of it when the time came. So that left him without any ideas of how to name the group he was creating. That was when Saburo came with a few pieces of advice and ideas. Why not come up with something to strengthen the bond between recruits? 
make them feel like they belong in something more than just a bounty collecting business and information gathering squad. The former shinobi came up with plenty of ideas that Ken liked when it came to strengthening the bond. All of them are greater than the last. He also wanted the name to represent their work. He wanted a name that people would hear once, and would understand what type of business they dealt in. But eventually, the name that Ken settled on was something that Akira came up with. How about the Dark Brotherhood? It's a brotherhood, so it will help with forging the bonds between recruits later. And we do plan to be assassins mainly, so something broody like that sounds fitting. It was a bit simplistic, maybe. But it somehow managed to both give their organization some identity and help with forging bonds between the recruits, which was exactly what they were brainstorming towards anyway. Having all recruits be brothers and seniors slash teachers to be elder brothers and elders, in general, was a bit of a classic when it came to creating camaraderie and strengthening bonds. Still, there was really no reason to reinvent the wheel at the end of the day. Saburo also instantly liked the idea. And Ken had nothing to complain about it either. The blind swordsman was more than glad to be able to tell Tasho about their organization now finally had a name. There was still the problem of housing though. Tasho came out with a blade as soon as he felt around 50 shinobi descending on his location. He instantly calmed down when seeing Ken's masked face in front of them all. His situational awareness wasn't so bad that he would attack a group led by his leader. He immediately rushed to greet them. Or more specifically. Ken. Leader. Tasho shouted as he arrived in front of them with impressive speed, shocking Akira slightly. The masked retainer immediately took a knee and bowed his head, much like one would when greeting a king. Saburo and Akira also looked at the compound and the man kneeling before them with a curious gaze. A tall black-haired man dressed much like Ken, a red armor covered by a black coat and a straw hat. The only difference was that his mask had one red line in the middle of it, instead of a dot. Saburo instantly narrowed his eyes when seeing him. His speed, his lack of presence, all of them made the strawman quite wary. This man. Ken's second in command, huh? He feels a bit worse than regular Jonin when it comes to Chakra. But he seems to be almost as difficult to detect as Ken himself, so he is certainly a master assassin. Saburo immediately judged Tasho as a dangerous individual. Even if his chakra reserves weren't anything special, Tasho was still the most skilled person in the Dark Brotherhood. With the exception of Saburo himself and Ken of course. Akira wasn't able to judge Tasho's skills that much, just muttering that he felt a bit sneaky, before finally looking around at their base. It was, strangely big and rather homey. About a dozen somewhat large wooden homes and one large training area with targets, rocks and wooden dummies. All buildings were designed beautifully and spaced out perfectly, the area having clearly been made with great passion. The entire small village was built right in front of a large cave entrance, which seemed to have a sealable entrance, using a wooden gate and an actual airtight seal that Tasho had managed to buy at some point. The sealed cave was the one that Ken had initially carved out for training, which was designated as the main training hall, the cave being expanded to house more interconnected rooms to accommodate more and more recruits. It had been grueling work for Tasho in the past few months, but he was able to recruit 20 people by the time Ken had gotten there. 10 people more than the last time he had reported to Ken. It was a rather great achievement for Tasho, and he was quite proud of himself as well. Ken also felt his surroundings and sighed with a satisfied smile on his masked face. You've done a great job, Tasho. It seems you were preparing for a large recruitment drive with all of the homes. Ken finally addressed his retainer and trusted right hand. Yes. I had first focused on creating the accommodations, only starting recruiting when I felt that the site was ready. Tasho finally raised his head, his masked face looking towards his leader. He immediately started reporting the situation and going into detail about the recruitment process and what orphanages he had approached and paid to do recruitment in. Orphanages were close to selling children as slaves in some regions, so gaining recruits was really not difficult when one had the budget. Tasho would have had a lot more of them if he wasn't handpicking only the ones willing to join and grow stronger. Saburo couldn't quite tell what emotions Tasho was displaying. But it was clear that the retainer held a lot of admiration and respect for Ken, a child that was likely not even half his age from the looks of things. It was a rather strange scene, 
but the strawman couldn't really blame Tasho for respecting and or admiring Ken. Akira didn't really look into things in such a detailed manner. He just continued looking around, seeing the two dozen children that were training in the compound. They didn't seem to have noticed the approaching shinobi, all focused on their training, throwing weapons, sparring and even doing regular physical training. Saburo also looked towards them with one of his many pairs of eyes. Judging them rather quickly as still fledglings, none even reaching the level of Genin currently. It was to be expected of a new organization though. Not many people were as talented and or as determined as Tasho, to improve at such an impressive pace. Not only that, even the earliest recruit had only been training for around two months, which wasn't much. From Tasho's reports, it seemed that their only real issue currently was the fact that they were nowhere near being self-sufficient when it came to food. They had no one to really handle cultivation, so Tasho always had to leave for food, leaving the oldest in charge for days at a time every month. It was not uncommon for him to return and there to be a recruit less than when he had left. It seemed that leaving orphans unattended on a deserted mountain range was not a good idea after all, wow, who would have thought? Alas, the ones that remained at least learned not to wander randomly, so at least that was good. Still, the children seemed to be in quite high spirits from what Saburo was able to see. All of them were intermingling with each other, creating rivalries and friendships as they would have inside the academies of the hidden villages. It seemed that Tasha was prepared to recruit at least three times as many children, and he had already made accommodations for them. It seemed that Saburo's clones wouldn't have to sleep outside in the dirt after all. Alas, they didn't really need sleep anyway. Only Saburo's main body really needed it. But it did help keep up the facade that they were real people and not puppets. Also, when Saburo was actually asleep, all of the clones would enter a vegetative state as well, as there was no way for him to split his consciousness into so many different bodies while unconscious. It was good for there to be a place where they could hide while Saburo rested. In the end, it was also time for the children slash recruits to learn who the leader was. They had always been calling Tasho their teacher and mentor. But they already knew that he wasn't the leader of the organization they had chosen to join. To them, Tasho had given them a chance for a better life. But the one to have made all of it possible was someone they hadn't ever met. In a way, it helped make Ken seem a lot more enigmatic. But actually seeing the blind swordsman in person made them all shudder. All of them stopped training when seeing him walk over. Ken was by no means a tall man, yet, but he had a great presence even to most shinobi, so one could only imagine what the children were feeling when he walked into their line of sight. It was a strange feeling for the children. They could all feel that Ken was not normal. It was as if the world itself was telling them that. That filled them all with both blind admiration and fear. Especially when seeing dozens of shinobi trailing behind him in rows, including Tasho. Ken scanned the children in front of him. He could feel their fear, their emotions hardly hidden, though some of them did try to keep their emotions in check. Children. They immediately flinched when hearing Ken's raspy voice. Saburo found it rather ironic, as Ken was likely not much older than the recruits. No reason to fear me. I am the last person that will hurt you in this life, all you have to do is not betray me. Ken's voice, despite being rough and raspy, still had a calming cadence to it, managing to relax some of the young boys and girls in front of him. Thank you. Thank you all for choosing to join us. From this moment on, you are officially part of the Dark Brotherhood. Those who have joined are now family, whether you like it or not. That was all that the leader said. Finally announcing the name of the organization to the children, who were rather excited when hearing it. Family. That was a rather powerful word for war orphan children. It was something that many of them were tragically denied in that life. But now it was offered to them. They had already started considering each other family, but they didn't know what the future had in store. Officially becoming a family had managed to finally seal the deal for the recruits. Tasho and the rest could see how their motivation became stronger. How the fire burned brighter in their eyes. Saburo simply smiled when seeing that, considering the indictment of the young orphans to be a rather successful endeavor. It does feel good to follow someone competent for a change. I wonder how far he will go. With his talent, I think I will get to climb to the peak in this lifetime. After that, the children continued their training. Their wills were strengthened by their finally seeing their leader and listening to his speech. Now, they
They could also finally start calling themselves brothers and sisters, something they had longed to do for a long time. As they trained, the rest of the adults, and Ken, also got to work. Saburo put his tireless clones to work instantly, building a few more houses to have spare storage space just in case. They also voted for Ken to get the largest house for himself, as he was the leader at the end of the day. The leader must get a house befitting his status. With our current budget, even making it out of the most expensive materials would be feasible. Saburo was surprisingly the one to come up with the idea. It was a clear tactic to garner even more respect for Ken, as his position of leader would give him his own housing. However, Ken argued that it could also garner some jealousy from the recruits. Though that was quite unlikely with how high their opinion of the blind swordsman had become. Still, Ken simply found the concept rather wasteful. In the end, only his closest retainers were to live with him, each having their own room. By closest retainers, Ken simply meant Tasho, Akira, and Saburo. The newer recruits were not really on the same hierarchical level as Tasho, at least Akira wasn't. But Ken still trusted them enough. Saburo especially became the head of the research department. And Ken promised to build him an underground laboratory in the village after they settled in properly. Then, Tasho, Akira and Saburo all received a task. Sorting through everything that Ken had stolen and categorizing their spoils properly. Saburo didn't think much of it at the time. But it seemed that Ken had gathered quite a good amount of resources in quite a few ceiling scrolls. This might take a while. The strawman could only sweat when seeing the piles of books and scrolls that lined the table in front of them. Ken wasn't helping them by the way. Akira tried to complain, but Ken simply waved his palm in front of his eyes and basically told him to fuck off. POV narration The compound of the Dark Brotherhood quickly grew in the next few months, and their budget also suddenly grew as they were able to finally count the amount of wealth Ken had actually stolen. Several Saburo did actually burst out laughing at the same time when he realized that Ken had somehow stolen the entirety of the Grass Village's funds that had been gathered for over a decade. To him, it was just funny, though he did also realize that the Grass Village was likely never going to forgive them in any way. The good part about that was that neither Ken nor anyone working for him really gave a shit about the Grass Village anymore. Ken being strong enough to take the entire village on really just spoke for itself at that point. And not even the orphans slash recruits seemed to be scared at the prospect of their leader angering a hidden village. If anything, they were actually excited to hear about his exploits. Tasha was rather disappointed that the children were no longer admiring him as much, but he did understand that Ken was worthy of their admiration as well. Besides gaining a large budget and expanding with a few more buildings. This time, they even managed to invite an actual good construction crew to remodel and make adjustments to the current buildings as well. It wasn't that Tasho had done a bad job, but it wasn't as if he was an experienced builder. Every home, and especially the leader's abode was remodeled to fit with their new expanded budget. Saburo did plan to kill them after they finished their jobs, to protect the location and knowledge of their base. But Ken made it clear that Saburo would follow them to the grave if anything happened to them, which took that idea out of the strawman's head. In the end, they decided to simply pay the men for their silence. It was likely only a temporary fix, but the blind swordsman was okay with it. Ken decided to spare no expense and give the recruits the best accommodation and food possible, the type that would make middle-class families blush. The blind swordsman only really cared about training being harsh after all, he didn't believe that his recruits also needed to sleep on the hard floor or eat weeds. Though he did incorporate sleeping on a stone floor as training, at least one week per month, he believed it would be good for the recruits to get used to sleeping in any environment. The Dark Brotherhood was advancing more and more, with more orphans gathering than before, now at the prospect of joining a brotherhood instead of a nameless organization of assassins. Suddenly, Tasho's orphanage scouring across the land of iron and nearby areas became a lot easier, with him managing to surpass his goal and increase the number of recruits to a whopping 86 in a mere few months. Although, that number was bound to stop growing for a time, as Tasho had already exhausted the avenues he was using for recruitment. They only hand-picked orphans under the age of 10, so they were all children easy to build rapport with and easy to gain the loyalty of. As long as they were treated well, of course, but that was never an issue, 
as Ken's organization presented the recruits with human rights that were very much above the usual standards that hidden villages provided. Some certainly complained about the difficulty of the training, but at the end of the day, they all were allowed to leave whenever they wanted. They were given the choice of becoming something more than just victims of a prolonged war. Their wills were strengthened by their losses and life experiences. Besides a surplus of recruits, the Dark Brotherhood also gained a stable source of income in the form of Saburo's clones hunting bounties of bandits. The strawman was more than glad to send some of his Jonin clones to hunt down notorious bandit groups. He was also more than capable enough to engage in several fights at the same time, so all was well as long as he didn't run into any annoying enemies. The fact that they were situated in the Land of Iron also helped a bit, as it was a neutral land and somewhat filled with bandits because of that. That meant that the Daimyo was always putting up bounties for new bandit groups in the area, and the Dark Brotherhood was more than happy to collect them all. Tough Ken did provide a rule that they weren't going after groups of deserters unless they had more crimes on their record. Even then, Saburo's clones would have to stalk them for a bit to verify their guilt. It seemed that Ken had a soft spot for deserters. Saburo could somewhat understand it, they were after all just numbers to their leaders, some would obviously reach the conclusion that dying for a worthless cause was foolish. Alas, there were plenty that also just wanted to profit off the war and the common folk. Those were actually the Dark Brotherhood's prime targets. Saburo was a bit annoyed by the extra steps he had to take in vetting groups, but he did need to respect orders. The Dark Brotherhood now also had a more concrete internal structure. With Ken as the leader, the head of the organization. Many of the orphans had also taken to calling him, Father. Ken didn't complain, and the name started to stick in the minds of the recruits. His costume remained unchanged, as he didn't see any need to change it. Tasho, Akira and Saburo were part of the leadership, part of Ken's retainers. They were called the, Blades. They all had similar costumes. Tasho's remained unchanged, while Saburo got a mask with two small red lines in the middle, and Akira got one with three. Each of them was to lead departments of their own and grow as the strongest in the organization besides Ken himself. Then, after the Blades. There were the Numbered. A ranking system based on strength inside the Brotherhood. Each department would have its own rankings, of course. Currently, the only numbered in the organization were Saburo's clones. Belonging to the research department, which also acted as a bounty hunting department, at least for now. They were wearing regular thin black clothing with long black coats that covered their bodies. All of their faces were covered by completely white masks, slightly obstructed by large straw hats. The recruits were still not part of the system, they were only given regular training garb and clothes. They were to become numbered upon, graduating, from their training, later to be delegated into different departments of their choice. There were still many things that Ken planned out for the Dark Brotherhood, but he'd first have to wait and train the current batch of recruits that the organization had. Now, Ken wasn't dumb, neither was Saburo or Tasho. Akira was arguably the least intelligent among them, but even he caught on rather quickly. All of their actions, all of their current exploits and rapid growth, basically gave away their exact position and announced to the world that they were there, in the land of iron. Ken, however, didn't care about their base location being found out. He knew that it was impossible to keep it a secret, especially since he had no way for the Dark Brotherhood to be self-sufficient when it came to food in the short term. Ken knew that he needed to establish clear trade routes, to arrange for and create a proper marketplace at some point. Farming would only become feasible down the line, so the Dark Brotherhood was going to only be able to gain its food through trade, which wouldn't be possible as their organization grew. He had planned to build a secret organization at first, but after finding out that it would be near impossible to keep it a secret, he decided that he would go all in and create an entire village. Not a village of commoners, mind you, a village inhabited only by the Dark Brotherhood's trained assassins. Every merchant that came and went would be from the Dark Brotherhood, every farmer would also work part-time as an assassin. All of them would be adopted and raised inside the Brotherhood, and all of them would learn and develop as assassins first. As their talents developed, they would get the chance to go into different fields. It was going to take a long time, but Ken was sure that it was possible. He slowly started putting a framework in place. His end goal? Well, that was a bit more complicated. 
Ken wanted at first to have eyes in the world, so it was going to act as an informational network. But there was also something else. Seeing the damage of the war on those orphans, Ken grew more and more disappointed in the world he found himself in. But he also knew that it wasn't possible to change it, to change humans in general. So, he would have to at least provide a safe haven for all of the children affected by the war. To all those willing to join him and grow stronger. Talented or not, they all had a right to a better life, and Ken was going to provide it for them. But that would take years, many years to develop and reach everyone throughout the world. For now, Ken needed to focus on the present as well. Akira was actually the first one to point out that the daimyo of the Land of Iron would certainly send his men to check out the place and probably even collect taxes. Even the construction company was only aware that they were helping build a village, so Ken expected the daimyo to treat them like a new community at first. Saburo seemed to also be a bit curious about how Ken would decide to interact with the daimyo, as it was definitely going to be crucial to the future of the Dark Brotherhood. If he does agree to pay taxes, then the Dark Brotherhood would essentially become the Land of Iron's hidden village. But if he doesn't then even a war could become a possibility. Ken may be strong, but facing off against 10.000 trained samurai and retainers isn't feasible. At least not yet, maybe in a few years. The strawman had already judged Ken's power and did know where exactly on the scale to put him. He was simply on the level of an actual kage. Someone from the large villages. When it came to power and fighting strength, he seemed to be weaker than the rakage in both speed and defense, but the two of them seemed to have similar styles. It's hard to tell how a fight between them would end though. A is still stronger than Ken, by a rather large margin as well. He is more durable and has more power in general. But Ken's potential for growth is much much larger. At least, that was the conclusion the strawman had reached after the incident in the grass village. Ken sensed his retainers and could feel the worry seeping from Akira, as well as the curiosity emanating from Saburo. I don't plan to pay any taxes to the Land of Iron. This village is built in a deserted and rather inhospitable mountain range, and all of it was made using our own resources. The leader made his stance clear, and Saburo couldn't help but nod. Agreeing with the decision and the logic behind it, still, he hoped that Ken was prepared for the repercussions. Alas, Saburo was prepared to turn tail and run at any moment if the situation looked truly unwinnable, so he was okay with whatever choice Ken made, as long as he could continue getting support on his research. Though, his research was postponed for a bit as his laboratory was still under construction. As still? Doesn't that mean that they'll try to kill us all? Akira decided to simply voice out his worries once more, being the more honest of the ones present. Akira still felt like he owed Ken a lot. The blind swordsman was really the only reason he was even alive. He had already decided that he'd stick with him till the end. To him Ken's fate was his fate, so his worry was well justified. The daimyo will certainly try something, but I will first have a talk with him. I will set up a meeting when he eventually sends his men here. Don't worry, I'll handle everything. Ken, once again, didn't seem very concerned about the daimyo. He simply relaxed and stretched in his chair a bit, pointing at some reports on the table as Akira helped him read them. The situation with the daimyo was bound to end in a bad way regardless of what Ken chose. So the blind swordsman was going to have to do what he knew best and make sure that his village was well protected as it grew. After reading a few reports, Akira eventually reached the subject of techniques. The reserve that the Dark Brotherhood had was still rather pitiful when compared with a hidden village, but they did thankfully still have plenty of jutsu to teach to their younglings. They even had the secret techniques of the grass village. Though those also required a bloodline from what Ken was able to hear, so they turned out to be pretty useless for now. Saburo himself was also able to impart a few techniques to them, which certainly helped. But it wasn't for free, of course. Everything that Saburo did was a transaction, so in exchange, he was taught the technique that Ken used to hide his presence as well. Saburo was genuinely shocked after learning about it and the way it worked. It was well and truly demented, requiring an almost insane level of dedication and hard work to gain even a little bit of mastery over it. It involved gaining absolute control of one's bodily functions, of every sense and organ in the human body. The technique consisted of slowing down one's heartbeat to an unnatural extent, lowering the body's temperature down to dangerous levels. 
The training involved rapid and constant changes in the environment. Oftentimes jumping from heavy training inside saunas to training under a cold waterfall or inside a cold ice bath in the span of a few seconds. Such changes would oftentimes cause a high risk of cardiac arrest, it was bearable for already trained shinobi though. Alas, the recruits would only start training after gaining a proper base as regular assassins. Such harsh training would otherwise kill them at such a fragile age. It was a technique that Ken had come up with in his previous life, in his rather long career as the best assassin in the world. He could use that method to easily slip by most detection methods with ease. Including infrared and night vision, as long as he was dressed appropriately, he really could sneak in just about everywhere. The technique wasn't perfect, however. Ken was unable to pass through the highest levels of security undetected. The latest models and security systems in his old world would detect and snap at even the smallest blade of grass moving with the wind, so a human sneaking by would easily be noticed. Still, Ken was able to do every job thanks to his fighting skills as well, killing countless people and going through a lot of hardships to hone his skills. In his current life, Ken was able to further perfect that technique with the discovery of chakra and nature energy, making his technique essentially perfect, making him almost impossible to ever spot. Eventually, Ken even decided to give it a name. Simple and self-explanatory. Presence control, through mastery and constant training, allowed the user to have a near-perfect mastery over their presence thanks to nature energy, the blind swordsman was able to do a lot more than just hide his presence perfectly. He also managed to affect the surroundings with his aura. He used that before, mainly to spark fear into the hearts of his enemies before the battle. Alas, he couldn't teach others how to use nature energy, he himself didn't have the greatest understanding of what it was. So, at most, they would have a weaker version of presence control. That was what Tasho learned was still training in and what Akira was currently struggling to learn. Saburo was excited to get to learn it as well. But he became disappointed that he likely would have difficulty using it with his clones as well. The technique involved exact control over one's own body, the amount of concentration it would take would be too much for it to be done on multiple bodies at once. The strawman was on his own there, as Ken was not all that familiar with the clone technique he was using. As Saburo stood and pondered on how to use presence control alongside his clones, the door to Ken's office swung open, and Tasho walked inside in a rather hasty manner. Sorry for intruding, leader. But there are people outside insisting on speaking with the leader of the village. Tasho sounded a bit annoyed, probably having gotten into a bit of an argument with said visitors. The Daimyo's delegation has already arrived? News sure travels fast. POV narration The Daimyo of the Land of Iron, Harada Yuichi, didn't simply sleep on the news of a strange village popping up in the middle of a mountain range in his territory. Even if it was on the border, it still fell under his jurisdiction. He did learn that the ones that helped build it were paid handsomely, upon interrogating one of the workers, he learned a bit more about the people occupying it. Shinobi, as well as children that seemed to be victims of the war. It was a concerning situation for the land of iron. The first thought that came to mind was that deserters from the Second Shinobi War had decided to create a new village in the Land of Iron, to provide a home for the ones that had their lives ruined by the war. Yuichi couldn't quite bring himself to respect deserters and shinobi, but he actually found the idea a bit heartwarming. However, he didn't want to get involved in a dispute with any of the hidden villages regarding the shinobi that had taken refuge in his country. That was why Yuichi had decided to send a delegation to the Sprouting community. To see what exactly was their deal and understand what course of action he should take. As much as I like the idea of war orphans having a home, I don't want it to be done at my expense. I need to find out where this village gets its funding and whether or not it's a threat to national stability. If it isn't, and they've managed to help our country, then they should at least pay taxes like any other village. That was the thought process of the daimyo, at the end of the day, if the community was to contribute to the country, he didn't care if they were former shinobi. He would be willing to tell the hidden villages to fuck off if the need arose. There was however the possibility that they were actually spies sent by one of the hidden villages. But it seemed unlikely, none of the hidden villages had anything to gain from aiming for the land of iron. 
The land of iron was mostly a mountainous region, all of their castles and cities were easy to defend and all of their soldiers were used to the terrain and cold temperatures. Back in the warring era, many clans had tried to take the land of iron, only to be forced to back away by samurai determined to defend their homes. Many warriors had distinguished themselves at that time, their families now part of the nobility in the land of iron. They weren't afraid of any of the other lands surrounding them, even if they were smaller in size. After all, from reports, none of the shinobi were wearing any headbands. Meaning they had abandoned any loyalty they once had with their former villages. The delegation he sent was comprised of one Hokushu, a noble appointed by the shogun, and two Hatamoto, banner carriers that were there to protect the noble messenger in his quest. They were there specifically to invite the leader of the community to meet with the daimyo, the noble was there to represent the land of iron's honest intentions. The delegation was greeted at the gate, it was newly constructed, and a small wooden fence surrounded the small village from what they could see. There were two masked men guarding the gate, standing eerily still and not moving even an inch as they waited on the orders of their leader. The Hokushu had already been greeted by a person wearing a different mask, one with a red line down the middle. Their conversation hadn't gone quite well. You want to summon our leader to your castle? Of course, it's only customary that a landowner greets the true ruler of the lands he occupies. True ruler. Ha! Huh? Tasho said mockingly as he shook his head a bit. The delegate scowled a bit when sensing the disdain in the masked man's voice. Watch your mouth when speaking of the daimyo. You are currently in the land of iron, you shall treat its ruler with respect. The Hokushu spoke with a confident and accusatory tone. He didn't appreciate his superior's name being taken in vain, nor did he appreciate Tasho's disrespectful nature. Alas, Tasho who had lived as a poor peasant for the better part of two decades didn't have much respect for the rich ruling class. Whatever. I'll inform our leader of your presence. You can speak to him yourself, Tasho simply waved his hand and turned around. The Hokushu wanted to admonish the masked retainer when hearing his dismissive tone. Tasho's back disappeared before he had the chance to. The Hokushu and the Hadamato wanted to enter the village then, but the two guards simply raised their palms. We shall escort you to the leader's compound. One of the masked guards said as it gestured for the delegation to follow him. At that point, the Hokushu simply nodded respectfully, he was displeased with the fact that this leader hadn't come out to greet them, but he appreciated being escorted inside nonetheless. The inside of the village looked quite beautiful, even by the Hokushu standards. It was clear that it was built with quite a large budget. And in the distance, he and the Hatamoto were able to see dozens of children happily training and walking around, watched over by masked men that looked similar to the guards. The delegation immediately became tense, as they realized a rather chilling fact. This. They're training children to become shinobi. They knew that they needed to report the matter to the daimyo with haste. The community that they were visiting now was clearly not just a regular village, and every resident seemed to either be a masked shinobi, or a child still in training. Building a hidden village in our territory. This spells trouble. The Hokushu gulped a bit as he looked at his surroundings. The guard leading them was just as quiet as before, in fact, none of the adults seemed to be talking or conversing in any way. It was as if they were just wardens. At least the children don't look to be mistreated. That was the one redeeming factor in all of that. The Hokushu noticed how they all seemed to be wearing new clothes, and all of them seemed to be well fed. Even better, to the side, he could see one of the masked guards cooking a large pot of warm stew. The Hokushu could clearly see that there was a lot of meat inside that stew. At the very least these are people we may be able to talk to. Overall, it gave both the two Hatamoto and the Hokushu a decent impression of the village. That didn't change the fact that they all detested how the shinobi started training their young though. Eventually, the delegation reached a large building, which seemed to be more akin to a mansion, with a wooden structure and a tiled roof. There were two more guards stationed at the entrance, which greeted the delegation with a nod, before showing them inside. The halls inside reminded the Hokushu of his own home. Large and spacious, spotless and clean, while also being well lit and decorated. It's clear that this leader knows how to live. It was rather impressive after all. The village was starting to look less like a village and more like a compound with a mansion housing a stray noble. 
The faces of the delegation changed as soon as they entered the room of the leader though. Two more guards at the door opened it for them, allowing them to enter. The leader sat in a chair, his spiky long black hair flowing behind him as he sat down with his legs crossed. The man wore a black coat that covered most of his body, just like all of the other adults in the compound, but the delegation instantly noticed something different. His white mask had a large red dot in the center, one that sent shivers down their spines. Shit. Why is this man here? The short man was currently the most famous bounty hunter. The madman had attacked a hidden village unprovoked and brought it to its knees. He was both dangerous and unpredictable. In that instant, the delegation felt as if the situation was just going to take a turn for the worst. The Hatamoto by his side also immediately tensed up, their hands trembling as if they prepared to reach for their blades. The red dot wasn't even alone in the room. By his side stood two people. All dressed the same as him, but their masks all had a different number of lines on them, instead of a dot. Greetings, representants of the Land of Iron. The bounty hunter's voice broke out first, relieving some of the tension in the room, at least momentarily, with his polite tone. The Hokushu even sighed in relief when hearing that. Unlike Tasho, Ken seemed to be respectful at the very least. Greetings, I must apologize for the prolonged silence. I was a bit taken aback by your presence. The Hokushu decided to simply calm down and carry out his mission. He was just a messenger at the end of the day. It was unlikely for him to be killed off for no reason. As long as he acted with respect, the Hokushu believed he would be just fine. The Hatamoto at his side were also trained enough to know when acting was a bad choice. So they both chose to remain completely silent. I can understand how my presence may be a bit off-putting, especially with the rumors that have been circling around lately. However, I assure you that you are in no danger currently. I do not wish to make an enemy out of the Land of Iron. At that point, the Hokushu was completely relieved. Not only was the Red Dot nothing like the rumors, but he was also polite and well-spoken. A man that knew his way around diplomacy, at the very least. I am glad to hear that. However, I am afraid that the Daimyo wouldn't quite agree with you building a hidden village here. The noble decided to also address the elephant in the room after realizing that Ken was someone he could converse with. Oh, I can assure you that we are not building a hidden village. This is merely the compound of my bounty hunting organization. It hasn't been established for long, but I was planning on getting in contact with the daimyo myself. Ken decided to not tell the whole truth in the end. He didn't feel that the Land of Iron needed to learn of his intentions and aspirations for now. Hmm? A bounty hunting organization? That is quite unheard of. I guess you will have to speak to the daimyo directly regarding the rights to build such a thing in his territory. The delegation still didn't seem completely convinced by Ken's answer, but they weren't quite willing to challenge him directly. I am sure we will be able to come to an agreement regarding that. Regardless, this organization is only funded and built through the money we make from hunting bounties and killing threats to the land of iron. I doubt the daimyo will be unable to see the benefits of keeping such an organization around. Ken's answer was just as polite as before. Constructed well, almost as if he had already been expecting them, and had thought of exactly what to say beforehand. I am able to see the benefits of such a thing. I am sure the daimyo will also be curious to learn more. I am here to formally extend an invitation to you. The daimyo wishes to meet you in person in his castle. You may come at your own convenience, but please try to make haste. I am sure you understand that this is a rather delicate matter. The Hokushu placed a small scroll on the table in front of Ken as he spoke, wanting to quickly complete his mission so that he could leave the compound slash village. Of course. I shall start making my way there this week. Thank you for delivering this message to us. The red dot simply nodded, not bothering to extend his hand and read the letter in front of the delegation. The Hokushu felt that it was a bit disrespectful of him, but decided not to say anything, as Ken had been quite polite up to that point. Of course, it's been a pleasure to finally make your acquaintance, Red Dot. The Hokushu bowed slightly before preparing to take his leave. A pleasure indeed. Ken nodded a bit, before turning his head to the side of one of his retainers. Second Blade. Please make sure to escort these men out of the compound. The delegation watched, the man that wore a mask with two lines simply nodded and walked to their side. There's no any dash, the delegation wanted to leave the village anyway 
but they didn't exactly feel safe walking around with one of the red dots retainers. Think of it as me showing my sincerity. We shall speak again at the palace. Ken didn't bother to hear them out anymore, simply gesturing for them to leave. The Hokushu wanted to protest once more, but decided against it, and simply looked at his men and started leaving. As soon as they left the room, Ken sighed. Rather annoying, huh? Tasho said as he looked at his leader with a side glance. Maybe, but it is something we would have had to deal with eventually. The blind leader shrugged a bit. This doesn't feel quite right? I think you should take us with you when you visit the castle. Akira said as he scratched his chin a bit. There is no need to overcomplicate things. I can always escape if I find out they're planning something. Besides, this doesn't feel much like a trap, at least not a physical one. The leader simply shook his head, placing his mask on the table, raising his head high and taking a deep breath. They will certainly try something if you don't agree to submit to them. But your reputation might make them reconsider taking action. Tasha was also a bit unsure when speaking, he wasn't quite used to politics either, so he was mostly going by what his gut was telling him. Regardless of what they attempt, I'll at the very least hear them out. Ken smiled a bit, revealing his sharp teeth and canines to his two retainers. We are still preparing for that mission though, so this isn't exactly ideal timing. Tasho said as he turned his head and looked at a billboard on the wall. It was filled with different pictures, currently obscured by a screen to their visitors, only visible from the leader's chair. On the billboard were the pictures of seven people, all impaled with knives on that wall. Indeed, but there is no hurry, we'll get to it after training our current set of recruits, which might take another two years. Ken simply shrugged. Indeed, I guess you'll really have to reach an understanding with the Land of Iron then. Saburo also walked back in at this time, already knowing what the discussion was about from the clones that stood at the door. I doubt it'll be that difficult. This compound is sure to have left a rather good impression on the delegation. It was a good choice for you to give the children a break from training and to start cooking with the windows open when they arrived. Of course, thank you for noticing my efforts. Though some of the children still continued training, hardworking seedlings, the lot of them. Saburo simply bowed slightly, smiling a bit under his mask. I guess you can't really hide anything from this child's eyes, huh? As a reward for your carefully planned presentation of our organization, I'll make sure to put a bit more funding into the laboratory. At the very least hurry its completion so that you may be able to restart your research. Ken didn't seem to pay any mind to Saburo's thanks. He instead decided to just give the man a tangible reward. A carrot on a stick for him to continue performing. That was the only strategy that would truly ever work with someone like the strawman. Saburo was aware of the way Ken thought about him and he was pleased that he didn't need to bother hiding his intentions around the blind child. The strawman simply smiled and nodded when hearing that he would be able to restart his research sooner. After all, he had placed everything on hold in order to help Ken with the Dark Brotherhood. Of course. They then continued going over a few papers, including the invitation from the Land of Iron's leader. Tasho also went to train the children. There were a lot of them now, so Saburo's clones were assisting him with the training as well. The next few days flew by quickly, and Ken eventually left his office with a smile on his face. Time for diplomacy, huh? POV narration The Land of Iron was structured in a rather strange way, unlike the other territories, it wasn't outright ruled just by the daimyo and the kage of its respective hidden village. However, just like any of the other nations. In the Land of Iron, the daimyo acted as the political leader of the country. As a strict and honor-ruled society, the Land of Iron saw shinobi with disdain and considered their assassination techniques and jutsu to be nothing more than petty tricks. The samurai in the Land of Iron relied only on kenjutsu, or sword techniques and fighting styles that coupled well with their chakra blades. A big part of why they could maintain their neutrality was their military strength. Each samurai was also much stronger than regular shinobi, which gave them an advantage on the world stage. But the leader of the armies was also a figure that could protect their country if push came to shove. The general and samurai warrior, Mifune. He had even been told to have fought Hanzo of the Salamander and survived. He had actually won Hanzo's respect, only losing because his blade had broken during the battle. 
Their fight was nothing more than a simple skirmish while the general was away on a mission near Amigecure or the village hidden in the rain. Even if he lost in the end, that fight had cemented Mifune as a powerful samurai, and had proved to everyone once again that the land of iron was not to be trifled with. This was all the more reason why the daimyo, Harada Yoichi, was having trouble understanding why Shinobi had decided to set up camp in their territory. After all, besides Mifune, there were also plenty of Hatamoto more than capable of fighting and killing even Jonin. Only after his delegation returned with a report that he had grasped the situation a bit more. The Red Dot. He was basically the only person in the world that could pull something like that off. Yoichi was a bit relieved when hearing that the Red Dot was only building an organization and not a full-on hidden village. But that didn't mean he was all that happy about not being consulted at all regarding the mountain range said the organization now occupied. Alas, the Red Dot did have the strength to just take whatever territory he desired, at least unless any of the five great Kage decided to speak up against him. In a sense, any of the five Kage would also be able to take up whatever territory they wanted if they were to be rogue shinobi. But they were all affiliated with their respective hidden villages and directly under the political jurisdiction of their land's daimyo. The Red Dot was a powerful figure not affiliated with any of the daimyo, and not under the jurisdiction of any power, that was what made him dangerous. That was also why plenty of the daimyo and Kage wanted him to disappear. He had gained a lot of fame and notoriety too quickly, which took the world by surprise but only ended up putting a target on his back in the end. At least that was what Yoichi had figured out when reading reports about him. But now his movements were starting to make more and more sense, the bounty hunter's intentions becoming clearer and more transparent. From reports, he could have easily never been seen during his missions. This means that he was specifically always looking to increase his reputation. I didn't really know why before, but it seems that it might be related to that organization of his. Not only that Yoichi started connecting the dots of all of the bounties that were being collected as of late. Many of the bandits with bounties died before the people he employed to deal with them even got close to finding their hideouts. Yoichi had received reports of masked men turning in those bounties, and now he realized that they were all affiliated with the organization that the Red Dot was building. It was quick and decisive, and it cleaned up a lot of the danger on the roads, which allowed merchants and villagers to feel a lot safer. A village of bounty hunters, huh? Training other children to follow the same profession. I am unsure how to feel about this still. In the end, the daimyo decided that he would just wait to meet with the Red Dot, as he had promised to visit rather quickly. It was a bit concerning considering the Red Dot's reputation, but the delegation did also vouch for his character, as he had been nothing but polite to them. Yoichi still summoned all his strongest guards at the castle while expecting the bounty hunter. Mifun was also there to assist in case something happened and represent the Land of Iron's military power. All of the leaders of the noble families were informed of the situation and they all sent their strongest warriors to the castle to defend their lord, just in case. Some of the leaders even showed up themselves, as they were renowned samurai in their own right. Everyone was gathered in the throne room, where a large table had been set up. Each noble was sat down, refreshments in front of them, and their personal guards behind them and lined up in the hall. The daimyo stood at the head of the table, dressed in expensive white royal attire garb, his face obscured by a golden veil connected to his large hat. Everyone had already been present at the castle for a few days, and some of the people present were getting a bit bored with waiting, Sake could only entertain them for so long at the end of the day. My lord, when exactly do you think this red dot is going to appear? Mifune was the one to speak up first, his long grey hair and pointy beard flowed in the wind, as the windows inside the throne room were all open. He was wearing a black garb underneath his grey samurai armor, and at his waist was a regular katana. The samurai and nobles in the room all refrained from speaking about their displeasure. But Mifune didn't seem to have the same reservations. Today is the last day, he had promised to arrive shortly, if he does not arrive, then I will have to send people after him and his organization. Yuichi spoke from behind the golden veil, his voice resounding throughout the hall, which caused many of the nobles present to nod in acceptance. Having a decisive leader was a good thing in their opinion, and they, as a nation, didn't see the red dot as a large danger to them. Mifune's point of view was, however, different. 
I appreciate your resolve, my lord. But please understand that going after the red dot might not be as simple as that. It would be a commitment that will require many lives, lives we cannot afford to spare. I urge you to reconsider. As the general, Mifune wanted to avoid losing the lives of too many of his men. And what do you propose? That our great country bends backwards to attend to the will of some vagrant? One of the nobles present spoke out in a haughty tone, spreading out her fan and asking a rhetorical question with a scowl on her face. She was dressed in a flower-themed red yukata, with her black hair flowing back all the way to her waist. Her face was fair, and her skin was as white as snow, mostly thanks to makeup, her eyes were also dark to match her hair. It all gave her the appearance of a noble beauty. She was mainly there because she wanted to deepen her relations with the other nobles, and also hopefully get to meet the elusive Red Dot. As he seemed like a useful ally to have. However, Ken had yet to show up, and she decided to voice out her displeasure without much hesitation. She was Yuko Chinatsu, the head of the Chinatsu merchant clan and one of the youngest leaders present, being only 26 years old. The elders in the room would have usually ignored her presence, or tried to dispute her words. Being a woman in their field was rather difficult after all, but now they all seem to unanimously agree with her. That vagrant can likely assassinate everyone in this room before the end of the week. We can't afford to underestimate him in any way. He's already proven himself in his skirmish with the Grass Village at the end of the Second Shinobi War. Mifune simply narrowed his eyes at the people in the room. His determined tone remained unflinching even when all of the nobles eyed him with scrutiny. He truly felt disdain for the nobles present, as he and his men would be the ones to suffer from their choices if a war was to break out within their territory. Mifune also felt bad for the civilians, who were already suffering enough because of the Shinobi War. Their country relied on exports as well, so the constant fighting in nearby territories directly hampered the lives of the regular honest living folk. If the Red Dot truly decided to wage war against them, Mifune was confident he could win, he knew of the forces that he commanded, and he knew that there were few in the world that could match them. But he was also sure the damage done to their land would leave them open for the other nearby nations, which was a much larger disaster than just some bounty hunter starting an organization in their territory. He truly is not a figure I would wish to face off against under normal circumstances, especially since he specializes in assassinations from initial reports. Alas, we can't afford to not take action, lest we become the laughing stock of other nations for harboring a band of supposed war criminals right under our noses. Yoichi was the one to respond to Mifune's concerns, though his response did little to help the general. Who cares about you losing face? The lives of my men and the future of our country are at stake here. Alas, Mifune didn't continue speaking, knowing that lashing out like that at the daimyo was not a good idea. To the side, Yuko also smiled a bit, covering it with her fan in the process. Just saying some stupid shit like this is enough to buy me some brownie points with these old fools. Alas, winning over the general might not be all that easy. Yuko couldn't care less about waiting for the red dot to show up. She simply wanted to build up relationships with as many of the noble families as possible. She could easily read the mood in the room and tell that everyone was displeased for having to wait around for a bounty hunter, so she voiced out their displeasure without any hesitation. To her this was all a game, a game she planned to win. She may not have been dealt the best hand, but that didn't mean she was unable to make the best of it. The dealings of a royal court are never going to get boring, huh? The people at the table couldn't help but blink a few times, as they wondered who the voice belonged to. At first, they thought it was one of the samurai to the side, but their samurai knew better than to interrupt the nobles. Then, they looked to the side, sitting at the same table as them was an unfamiliar figure, eating grapes and drinking wine alongside them. Suddenly, all of the nobles jumped away from the table in shock, all of their spines shuddering when catching a glimpse of the man they couldn't quite recognize. G guards. Yuko said as she gestured for the shocked samurai to draw their blades, as she herself unfolded a sharpened metallic fan. In an instant, all of the samurai presents drew their swords and pointed them at that chair, where one short man stood, still drinking wine with a smile on his eyeless face. The man was only wearing a black coat, and his long spiky hair was just as long as Yuko's who was still staring at his figure with an unnerved expression. Who are you? State your business right away. 
Mifune had also drawn his sword already, walking over to the disfigured man with careful steps. He was less flustered than the others but also shocked that he hadn't even realized when the man had entered the room. Oh? Wait, I forgot that no one has seen me like this before. The disfigured man then took a mask which had been hanging on his belt and put it on his face. Instantly, everyone in the room was staring at a man wearing a white mask with a red dot in the middle, and they all instantly understood who they were staring at. Red Dot. It's a pleasure to finally see you in person. The daimyo was the first one to recover, as the nobles were still processing what had just happened. The lord immediately glared at the samurai and clapped his hands, gesturing for them to sheath their blades. The pleasure is mine, Lord Daimyo. One rarely receives such an invitation after all. Also, please call me Ken, feels a lot more natural to me. The blind bounty hunter spoke out with confidence, not even bothered by the fact that dozens of samurai were aiming to kill him seconds before. The daimyo laughed heartily when hearing the blind man's request. Haha very well, Ken it is then. You may also call me Yuichi, no reason to mince words at this stage. The daimyo would have normally not accepted someone disrespecting him in any way. But Ken had technically just shown him that he could have killed them all at any second, so he decided to throw away honorifics for once, be it from shock or fear. Red Dot? Mifune also muttered as he sheathed his katana, his eyes narrowing as he studied the infamous bounty hunter's figure. Mifune could clearly see him sitting at the table, yet he couldn't feel him there at all. It was bizarre, to say the least. How did you manage to sneak in here undetected? Mifune immediately questioned him, the security of the castle being his number one concern at that stage. The windows are open. Most shinobi are also able to just crawl on the ceiling, these chairs are pretty tall. So from there, it was just a matter of dropping down when everyone's gaze was not focused on the table. Ken pointed at the large windows off to the side. He didn't see any issue in explaining how he had gotten in, it wasn't like he was there for an assassination, though his entrance definitely served as a demonstration of what he was capable of. I see. Interesting method indeed, a master in stealth, to say the least. How did the men on the other side of the table not notice you? Mifune was appreciative that the red dot answered honestly. But that didn't mean he was satisfied with the answer completely. Such a mishap was not something that could be overlooked. Now now, we didn't invite him here for an interrogation. I'm assuming the samurai present were just not staring at the table, in fear of provoking any of the nobles present. Yuko was the one to calm him down in the end, folding her fan and being the first noble to sit back down at the table. Seeing her do so made the other men also sit down, and Ken sighed as he finally sat up and walked a bit closer to Yuichi, Mifune made sure to stand in between them though, just for protection. In the end, Ken sat back down a bit closer to the lord, right in between Mifune and Yuko. The noblewoman's gaze was curious, sometimes shifting towards the bounty hunter that stood beside her. He would make a useful ally indeed. Yuko's thoughts immediately started running wild, as she imagined employing an assassin like him under her. Yuichi looked at the bounty hunter with a bit of sweat on his brow, before taking a deep breath and calling himself down completely. In the end, he smiled underneath his golden veil before he started speaking again. Now, I think it's time for us to get down to business. POV narration to say that Ken's entrance left an impression on the people present would have been a severe understatement. None of them had managed to sense him until he made himself known. The nobles especially hadn't even looked at his side of the table. And the samurai lined up near the table had also done precisely as Yuko had said, averting their gazes from the table where the most influential nobles ate. It was a great mishap on their part, but it wasn't completely their fault either. At the end of the day not even Mifun, their strongest samurai and general, managed to sense Ken. At least that occurrence gave them a bit of perspective on how grim the state of affairs would be if they were to actually start going after Ken. Mifune's prediction about the Red Dot being able to assassinate all of them by the end of the week seemed a lot more plausible now. It didn't help that they didn't have any seals or formations in place to detect intruders. Mifune was at least now aware of a major flaw in their defense. After all, if Ken was able to sneak in, then others would be able to do so as well. The last thing the Land of Iron needed was for their leader to be assassinated. Ken now sat at their table masked, but all of the nobles present still remembered how his face looked. 
or rather, lack of face. Mifun and the rest didn't really take it seriously though, they just took it as Jinjutsu or transformation. After all, Ken was well known for only his mask, they doubted he would reveal his real face to them. Yuko also became very curious, especially when seeing the abnormal appearance he had chosen to transform into. She now wanted to see his real face even more. I'm sure I'll have the opportunity if I do end up allying myself with him or his organization. Yuko smiled mischievously underneath her spread out fan. With precise and careful movements, she inched a bit closer to the bounty hunter at her side. No one besides Mifu noticed her actions. The general simply scoffed at the fox-like noble lady. Scheming types are always the most annoying to have in a court. Ken proceeded to ignore her presence completely. Now, Lord Yuichi, I'm glad you wish to get straight to the point. The bounty hunter nodded and crossed his legs, interlocking his fingers above the table as he turned his head towards the daimyo. Of course, I'm sure you are a busy man after all. Yuichi smiled underneath his golden veil, now finally calm. He was still planning on punishing all of the samurai in the room for letting a renowned assassin just sit at the same table as them unnoticed, but that would come later. I heard plenty of reports from my delegation, as I'm sure you were expecting. Yuichi brought up a small scroll, opened it up and started looking through it right in front of Ken. Of course, I assumed the daimyo would be interested in what happens in his own territory. The assassin simply nodded, his stature remaining the same. Indeed especially a land such as ours. I was not expecting to find out that you are building an entire organization right at the borders. Yuichi didn't bother mincing any words, he also wasn't putting on any airs of superiority while sitting at the same table as Ken. He was simply lining the facts, listing everything that he had found and that had been reported to him. Alas, I was never trying to hide it anyway. Rumors spread quickly even when silence is bought. Indeed, silence can only be bought from trustworthy people anyway. The construction workers you had hired weren't all quiet about what they had helped build. Figures. Alas, I want my associates to have the best possible arrangements and living conditions. Ken smiled a bit under his mask as he spoke of that. It wasn't even a lie. He knew that the morale and determination of his recruits were directly tied to their living conditions and food. The construction workers he had hired were only paid a bit for their silence, their real purpose was to spread word of the Dark Brotherhood while making it look like he wasn't actually trying to catch anyone's attention. And they had accomplished their mission perfectly, exactly as Ken had wanted them to. Mifune looked to the side with a raised eyebrow, studying the assassin with a careful gaze. Most of your associates are still children in training. The general scowled as he spoke, addressing the issue of Ken training up child soldiers instantly. Indeed, all of the children were given a choice when recruited. To either remain with their old orphanages and live their lives normally, hoping that no other wars break out and they survive or join our brotherhood and train as assassins. Ken recounted their recruiting process without withholding anything. He had given Tasho specific requirements for the recruitment, and it was likely the most humane slash morally sound way to go about things. Ken was against involving civilians in conflicts, but he wasn't planning on stopping them from joining if they wanted to. Which was why he decided on using that choice as a recruitment strategy. Tisk, and we're supposed to just believe you. Mifune was a bit skeptical, the same as the vast majority of nobles present. Yuko didn't seem to particularly care about the recruitment process, but she still decided to speak out. Now, I understand skepticism, I myself wouldn't be inclined to believe everything that our guest says at face value. However, if I remember correctly, the delegation was able to attest to the treatment of the orphans. Her melodious voice was calm. She spoke in a clear tone, defining her position and using the evidence they had to further her points, at the same time gaining a few points with the red dot. At least in her mind, Ken didn't see her any differently because she spoke out in his favor. He was still just as indifferent to her. She appeared impartial in her words, but it was clear to anyone with the brain that she was planning something. Even if your recruitment methods are humane, the fact that you are going to use child soldiers is still not in line with the customs of our land. Mifune was still unconvinced and was quite willing to bring up any subject. Even if he wanted to avoid a war, that didn't mean he was okay with what Ken was attempting to do in their territory. 
He just hoped they'd be able to convince the bounty hunter to move base elsewhere. Do not worry. I am also vehemently against using children assassins. I don't plan on sending any of them on the field before I feel they are truly prepared. And one of the factors necessary would be for them to mature properly. Ken didn't mind having to explain parts of his plans to the people present. His organization already had people working as assassins and bringing in revenue in the form of Saburo's clones. Their organization was still sitting on a lot of wealth stolen from the grass village, but that was not going to last them for the entirety of the recruits childhoods. The clones were genuinely the only reason they were able to recruit so many people at once. So Ken considered Saburo a very important ally, so he needed to treat him with care. I understand. If that is truly the case, then ethically speaking your organization is indeed not unaligned with our policies. The daimyo nodded as he spoke, rather pleased with what he was hearing. However, these claims do still need to be verified. Yuichi looked toward Mifune as he spoke. The general seemed to get the message. I would like to propose for one of my men to stay within the compound and report the status of the recruits to us on a regular basis. Mifune looked at Ken with a serious gaze, his eyes narrowed. Unacceptable. The Dark Brotherhood is a personal business, it has nothing to do with the land of iron itself. Ken didn't even take a second to think about it. He turned his head towards the general with a scowl underneath his mask. This Dark Brotherhood of yours is still within our territory. You can either move camp or accept our demands. Mifune was quick to hint at the possibility of Ken moving his base, but the swordsman was having none of it. Yuichi gave his general a strange look. A rather risky strategy to employ. But I can salvage this. I dash, Ken was about to tell Mifun off, but the daimyo interrupted their argument. Now, I believe we can come to a middle ground when it comes to this. The Dark Brotherhood will remain a private business, of course. However, I propose that we should be allowed to send a person to check it out at least once a month. Yuichi gestured for his general to calm down as he spoke, and he addressed Ken with a respectful tone. I can agree to that. We may discuss more details when the time for that comes. The masked swordsman nodded, and Mifune also seemed to agree with the compromise, though he still seemed a bit uneasy. I'm glad we can come to an agreement with that. However, there is also the issue of taxation. All revenue made within the territory is taxed by the ruling part of the said territory. Of course, the most important part. The daimyo would obviously also reach the subject of money and taxation. That is the case under normal circumstances, yes. However, our main and currently the only form of income is bounties. Those are not usually taxed under any jurisdiction. Ken had already made sure to study the law of the land of iron, and Saburo did help him a lot with his knowledge. Although the strawman was more inclined towards knowledge of human experimentation, he was still able to help Ken learn about the laws. Most of Ken's time after the delegation had visited them was actually spent listening to either Tasho or Saburo read books about the laws and customs of the land of iron and the land surrounding it. Indeed, taxation for bounties isn't an issue. It would actually be unethical for us to tax bounties. However, your organization itself stands on our land, so tax for the land does need to be paid. Bear in mind, that this will be the case in any land you got to unless you are to become affiliated with the government in question. Yuichi was surprisingly lenient, at least all of the nobles present were thinking that he was lenient. But no one raised their voice or complained. They didn't exactly want to enter the sights of the assassin that had just snuck up on them. So at the very least Ken's entrance did its part in helping him gain an edge in the negotiation. I was expecting this type of tax to come into question. I don't think I have a way of outright avoiding it, but the Dark Brotherhood can't currently afford to pay taxes on land, lest we go broke much faster than expected. I understand that some type of remuneration must be given for the land we are occupying, although I am not pleased with it. We have occupied an unused mountain range and started developing with money out of our own pockets. Yuichi nodded a bit when hearing Ken's words, and he instantly started thinking up a way to come to a compromise regarding that tax. They couldn't just avoid taxing the Dark Brotherhood, as it would make it look as if the Land of Iron was afraid of Ken. Well, maybe you should have reached out to ask for authorization before you started doing things on your own. Mifune was also of a similar mind, but he was still doing his best to antagonize Ken, 
and hopefully convince him to leave the land of iron altogether. Someone like him is bound to bring along a lot of trouble. I don't want his presence to burden my people. This time, Ken seemed to ignore Mifune's jab, only scratching his chin a bit as he started speaking again. Well, I understand your stance on this. I believe we can come to an agreement regarding taxation as well. For instance, my Dark Brotherhood can make sure that the streets are clean wherever we can. That in itself should boost your income as more and more merchants will start frequenting the safer areas. The daimyo nodded when hearing Ken's explanation, but it seemed that he wasn't fully satisfied with it. That is true. However, that is merely an aftereffect of your main business, which is collecting bounties. Yuichi didn't hold back at all, immediately pointing out the thing that was displeasing him. Of course, that can also be argued. However, you cannot deny that such a thing wouldn't happen without the presence of my organization. A lot of the members of bandit groups don't even have bounties, and we are taking care of them as well. Outlaws like that are bound to become less and less eager to set up their business in the land of iron due to our spreading influence. Overall, I think you have a lot more to gain from keeping us around than driving us away. The nobles in the room seemed to nod when hearing Ken's explanation, they all seemed rather pleased with it. Even Mifune seemed to be contemplating it seriously. Yuko at Ken's side once again hid her smile behind her fan. This. His answers are too careful, he definitely prepared everything beforehand. Either that or he is a really good speaker. Not only that, but instead of following up on his arrival and threatening us with our lives, he is genuinely debating the daimyo, proving he wishes for a partnership, and that he isn't hostile in any way. Either way, a business venture with him is starting to look more and more like a necessity for my clan to become more prosperous. The noblewoman's eyes narrowed as she started seeing Ken as a capable man. One worth keeping around at the very least. You do make a great point. It does seem that the benefits of keeping you around are far greater. Yuichi smiled underneath his golden veil, his thoughts were somewhat similar to Yuko's, but he was looking at ways from a very different perspective. This man. He is indeed formidable. I need to do my best to gain at least partial ownership of that organization. Heh, I think I have a plan for that already. But it will have to wait. Good points indeed. Now it was time for Mifune to speak out again. But, there is still the risk factor involved. At that point, all of the nobles looked at Mifune, glad that someone was addressing that as well. It is no denying that you are a controversial figure, Red Da, the shinobi you keep with you are also unknown, though we were unable to find anything on them, so it should be fine in that regard. Controversial indeed, however, none of the nations would ever be waging a war with a mere organization. Ken nodded at the general's concerns, understanding his concerns perfectly, and doing his best to dispel them. I don't want our nation dragged into the struggles of the shinobi. This is my main concern. Please don't drag my people into a bloody war. The general's voice sounded tired by the end, and this time Ken turned his head towards him again. I understand, I assure you that I don't want your people, or my organization, to ever get involved in the wars that shinobi are constantly fighting. In the first place, sending children that were mostly orphaned by war into a war would be exceedingly cruel. After that, the throne room was silent for a few seconds, as the nobles took a few seconds to process the words of the assassin leader. The masked swordsman pursed his lips, as he stretched his legs a bit underneath the table. Well, I for one am glad that we managed to reach an understanding. Ken nodded and slowly stood up, surprising the nobles present. You are departing already? A feast would be in order since this is the start of a rather fruitful partnership. The daimyo asked as he immediately waved to his servants and signaled them to bring more food to the table. Lord Yuichi, I appreciate the offer, however, I am needed elsewhere. It has been a pleasure, we shall meet again, of course. Ken then bowed slightly as the daimyo and the nobles were present, his black hair swaying slightly as he then started walking towards an open window. Some of the samurai eyed him carefully as he passed them by, some even reached for their blades, almost instinctually. Ken didn't react to that in any meaningful way, after all, it was rather normal for trained warriors to react in that way when a beast stared them down. No one stopped him as he leapt out the window either. And just like that, the meeting was over. POV narration as soon as Ken left the room Yuichi sighed and looked at everyone else at the table. So that was the red dot, huh? 
one of the elders said as he tapped the table with his finger. Or Ken, which might be either his real name or an alias, Yuko said as she smiled a bit. It might just be his real name. Not that it tells us anything. It's highly unlikely that someone like him is recorded anywhere. Yuichi said as he crossed his fingers and looked at everyone at the table through that golden veil of his. Indeed, from his demeanor, we can at least assume that he wishes to have a fruitful relationship with our land of iron. Mifune sighed as he rubbed his long bread. Still, having an organization that big acting independently from us in our own territory. It's certainly not a good look. One of the nobles said as he finally regained his bearings. It really can't be helped. The red dot has already proven that he's able to waltz in here at any time. At this point, we're lucky he didn't make any outrageous demands. Yuichi could only sigh once again when thinking about it. The daimyo was a smart man, he understood that they had little to no leverage over Ken, especially since he had decided to show himself in such a way. It was obvious that the daimyo would now be forced to tighten the security around his castle. Maybe even look into hiring a few shinobi guards to keep by his side. Mifune was also already thinking about hiring the Uzumaki clan to create a few seals around the castle. It was certainly going to be needed at the end of the day. He won't be able to waltz in here like that again. We'll make sure of it, Mifune said as he pondered on his idea more and more. The land of iron was certainly a rich country, so they could afford to hire the shinobi. The only issue was whether or not the shinobi were willing to help them in such a way. There was also the issue with the fact that the Uzumaki clan was being targeted by everyone currently, and it was only a matter of time before the forces that feared them banded together to destroy it. Mifune was only aware of it because he had connections with the shinobi world, but there was really nothing that he could do about it. He'll find a way. Even if we do detect him, are you confident in stopping him, General Mifune? Yuichi had clearly lost all trust in the capabilities of his guards to defend him, and Mifune couldn't really blame him. W well? If more of my men were here, then we would certainly be able to stop him, or at least rout him. Mifune was still rather confident in his answer, though he had stumbled a bit at the start when finding his words. It is not normal for a daimyo to have an army raised in his palace at all times. Yuichi simply shook his head. He understood that just a group of samurai wouldn't be enough to stop the red dot from taking his head. Well, we don't need to have the army in the castle at all times, but it will be a necessity if we do decide to antagonize him eventually, Mifune was well aware of the logistics of housing an army inside their castles. The resources needed would also cause a bit of a drain on the capital, so it would likely remain as a last resort when or if they decided to wage war against the Dark Brotherhood. You're really thinking about antagonizing him after this stunt? Yuko asked as she once again unfolded her fan and started slowly fanning her face. We need to prepare for every possible outcome. Mifune nodded as he crossed his arms and narrowed his eyes at the fox-like woman in front of him. There might be no need to antagonize them though. The daimyo spoke, reaching underneath the golden veil with one of his hands and scratching his chin. Hmm? Mifune looked at the daimyo with quite a bit of confusion. Oh, you have something planned already? Yuko smiled as she spoke, immediately perking up. Indeed. You see, the Red Dots organization only has one source of income currently. And that completely relies on our bounties, correct? Yuichi couldn't help but feel a smile creeping on his lips as he spoke as well. Wait. You don't mean. Mifun immediately became uneasy. No. We are not going to obstruct his business. However, he will eventually run out of bandits to hunt in his proximity, which will eventually lead to him running out of money. The daimyo's smile became more and more pronounced as he spoke. So you're playing a game of attrition then? Yuko narrowed her eyes as she continued smiling under her fan. Indeed, when he eventually runs out of money or is close to doing so, I will be there to provide his organization financial support. In exchange for a small part of the organization, of course. Yuichi felt a bit scummy saying it out loud, but it was really the only feasible way he could think of when it came to gaining control of Ken's business. Yuko simply nodded. That might just work, dear lord. But you're just assuming that the Red Dots organization won't expand at all in the meantime. That is a large mistake on your part. The noblewoman was not about to let such a thing happen. She already deemed Ken to be a highly capable diplomat and assassin. 
His sense of business was not something she was privy to, but she already decided to look for ways to ally herself with him. That alliance was bound to bring more funds to the Dark Brotherhood, and Yuko was well aware of that. But she didn't tell Yuichi or anyone else at the table. It's an interesting idea. But we might also have to put fewer bounties on bandits. We just need to not make it noticeable. One of the nobles at the table felt the need to add that, and most of the other nobles seemed to agree. I don't think that's a good idea. We're already playing with fire, trying to stick our hand in it doesn't seem like a good idea. Mifune was firmly against it. He didn't care if Yuichi attempted his scheme to buy out the Dark Brotherhood, as it wasn't something that directly harmed them and could antagonize the Red Dot. But actually hampering their one source of income would 100% cause the Dark Brotherhood to come for their heads. Mifun wasn't scared, sure, but he hated even thinking about the chaos that would ensue afterwards. Many civilians would have to suffer if all of the nobles were to die. They were, after all, the one thing that upheld the law in their own cities and neighboring villages. If they were killed systematically and quickly enough, then crime was bound to run amok in every village. Well, we are already taking a risk with this entire situation. I say we wait for now, wait for them to naturally run out of resources and then our delegation can offer our help. Yuichi also seemed to be against the idea of lowering Ken's revenue manually, as he also wanted to avoid a conflict. The nobles seemed to be discouraged, but they couldn't argue with the daimyo, so they just stopped speaking. One person was not scared to argue with the daimyo though. The plan is indeed good, Lord Daimyo Yuko's melodious voice rang throughout the throne room, causing everyone to look at her with confusion. However, what are we going to do if the Dark Brotherhood aims for bounties of other countries as well? Yuko was the head of a merchant clan. She decided to at least let her experience be known when it came to her area of expertise, which was making money. That is indeed a possibility. However, bandits in general will stop posting up anywhere near their organization. And news will spread about the Dark Brotherhood soon. Yuichi didn't mind having his ideas challenged or questioned. He responded in kind, with a patience befitting of a lord. The more bandits avoid their area, the more the Dark Brotherhood will have to spread out their forces, and the slower their income will come in. Which will eventually lead to the same results. Yuichi had already thought about that aspect as well, rather, he expected it to happen. He expected the Dark Brotherhood to hunt bounties around the elemental nations after all. Just like the Red Dot himself had hunted down bounties wherever he could, chasing rumors and listening in on whispers. Yuichi was still confident that the Dark Brotherhood would eventually still reach the point where they would no longer be self-sufficient, to him it was just a matter of when. Understood my lord. It seems you have thought of everything already. Yuko smiled and bowed slightly towards the daimyo. A few nobles could be heard muttering about the noblewoman, saying that she once again spoke out of line. Alas, being a young woman among a group of old men was rather difficult. Yuko somewhat struggled to have everyone treat her like an equal. I thank you all for gathering here. I shall start making arrangements for the inspectors that will visit the Dark Brotherhood monthly from this day onward. The rest of you can continue business as usual, I shall summon you all if something requires your attention. The daimyo waved his hand and all of the nobles and samurai present bowed and left. Mifune remained, as the two of them would still need to discuss the security of the castle. And while all that was happening, the person that was the cause for all of that stir was simply strolling around the city without any stress. Ken lazily walked around in the capital of the Land of Iron, having just left the meeting. It had gone much better than he had expected, but he had also prepared for it. It was clear that his entrance had a lot more impact on the nobles present than he had expected. Ken was a bit reluctant to do it at first. But at the end of the day, it was a subtle threat of sorts, a form of manipulation that he needed to use in order to tilt the scales in his favor. Petty tricks like those were his bread and butter at the end of the day. Though he had never been too used to diplomacy, especially the state of affairs in what he considered a medieval-slash-backward society. Even then, the land of iron was a lot more modern than the surrounding lands. As they absolutely abhorred using child labor or child soldiers. Their techniques and powers were also impressive. From what Ken had felt in that throne room, just the few dozen samurai lining the hall would have been enough to burn the grass village to the ground. 
Ken only gathered that from the way they had carried themselves when he had made his presence known. Most of them had already placed their hands on their blades, there was no hesitation and no wasted movement. All of them were prepared to fight Ken to the death at the flip of a coin. It was rather commendable. Mifune himself was also powerful. The general of the Land of Iron had an aura of his own, but Ken was still confident if he were to face them. I might need to train a bit more. Everyone in that room could have likely injured me even in my scaled sage mode. Trained samurai were always able to coat their blades in chakra. And their cutting power usually differed on ranking, but every samurai there gave Ken the feeling that they would be annoying to fight. Normal ninjutsu and genjustice are quite ineffective against me. Fighting an army of samurai might actually be more difficult than three grass villages at the same time. That small meeting helped give Ken some perspective, so now he simply strolled the streets, listening in on some interesting news and just casually studying the defenses of the capital. The capital itself was a rather large town, with the castle being built in the center of it. It was built in a rather scenic spot, being right in the mouth of one of the Wolf Mountains. The three large mountains that formed the Three Wolves. The city itself was covered by snow thanks to the strange shape of the mountain, which almost acted like a roof against the rain and snow above. The mountain itself was massive and stable, so there was no danger of it falling either. Everyone walked on the streets with smiles on their faces. No one even recognized the Red Dot, as he was really only well known in the Shinobi world. This is rather peaceful. Ken took a deep breath, moving his mask slightly to the side to uncover his mouth as he exhaled a small cloud of fog and smiled a bit. The sound of children playing in the distance. The sound of merchants doing business. The sound of drunkards singing, it was all so pleasing to the ear. But there was one sound that didn't sound like the others. The sound of blades clashing. Ken immediately turned his head in that direction. Tilting his head slightly, before instantly disappearing from his location. Shocking a few of the people nearby that had been looking towards him. Might as well check it out. POV narration now, Ken wouldn't have been shocked if he had heard blades clashing in the land of iron of all places. But the fact that it was coming from a random alleyway instead of a training ground was a bit interesting. There was also the fact that the smell of blood permeated the area, though it was faint. Who would be so bold as to start killing in the middle of the capital? Ken honestly had no clue, but he was about to find out. When reaching that alleyway, he was faced with a rather intriguing scene. Three people dressed as ninjas and two dressed as samurai cornering a single samurai who was doing his best to protect what Ken assumed was a young noblewoman. She seemed to be dressed in rather expensive clothes, but Ken couldn't really tell much else about her features. She was wearing a rather strange veil, which covered most of her face. Near them, were the corpses of two other samurai, looking like they had been backstabbed. Ah, the usual tomfoolery between murderers. Infiltration and backstabbing, true classics in our line of work. Ken could somewhat appreciate decent work when it was in front of him. But they had made a major mistake. The samurai they're cornering. He looks a lot stronger than them, but he's likely stuck protecting that girl, so he is unable to go all out. The five assassins should have aimed to finish this as soon as possible, alas, it already attracted unwanted attention after all. The assassins and the stronger samurai, who Ken assumed was a Hatamoto, seemed to be stuck in a stalemate for a few seconds. The assassins knew that getting close to the Hatamoto would definitely lead to one of them being killed. Ken had ample time to intervene. The true question was if it was even worth his time. Nobles being assassinated is not exactly uncommon, though I don't see how a young girl like her deserves such treatment. The blind swordsman stood there for a second, crouched down on a rooftop and studying the situation a bit more. Surprisingly, the assassins then started speaking. TSK? Hatamoto? Stop resisting already, you know it's futile. The five of us can easily kill you. Hand Lady Harada over and we may even share the ransom with you. Ken raised an eyebrow when hearing that. So, not assassins, kidnappers. Still, they made a rather elaborate plan to catch whoever this Lady Harada is. The Hatamoto simply stared at the five men with hate in his eyes, the young girl behind him trembled a bit in fear. Heh. We'll even let you play with her as well. One of the other kidnappers also tried to entice the Hatamoto, but he only received an angry shout. You dirty animals. She is but a teenager. The Hatamoto scowled deeply, 
grasping his blade tighter in his hands. Okay, they may have planned this out well, but not all of them are smart. Ken shook his head a bit when hearing the exchange. I guess I could kill them, it would be as easy as breathing. But I could also track them down for a while, wait for the lady's father to pay the bounty, and steal the money from them afterwards. Ken was seriously contemplating that, before a realization hit him. Wait a moment. Wasn't the Daimyo's family named Harada? Ken smiled deviously under his mask. Yes. Yes, it is. I guess getting involved in this suddenly became worthwhile. The blind swordsman stepped along the rooftops without making any sound, he smiled as he walked with carefree steps. It was extremely worthwhile to get the daimyo to owe him a favor. A favor like that was worth a lot more than any amount of money. Ken didn't interfere immediately though. A good farmer always knew to wait for the fruit to be ripe enough for picking. Instead, Ken watched the righteous Hatamoto fight with honor. The five kidnappers quickly closed in on the Hatamoto when noticing they couldn't bribe him. The second they stepped forwards, the Hatamoto's blade was already gunning for one of the men's necks. Even injured, he was more than capable of defending himself. The Hatamoto decapitated one of the kidnappers instantly, while the rest of them all dodged his slash with room to spare. One of the kidnappers threw a kunai at the noble lady, forcing the Hatamoto to block it with his blade, while another approached him and stabbed at his gut. Shit. The Hatamoto scowled when seeing their dirty moves, but he still managed to kick the blade away, causing it to only graze his side instead of gut him alive. Unfortunately, he left himself open, as one of the other kidnappers stepped to the side and kicked his other leg, breaking his balance and causing him to fall to the ground. Shit. Shit. The Hatamoto knew very well that the situation was not good for him at all. D. The kidnapper quickly stabbed down at the fallen samurai. The Hatamoto managed to roll away in time, slashing one of the kidnappers in two before his blade was blocked by another one of the kidnappers. Both swordsmen were covering their weapons in sharp chakra. But the tired Hatamoto was, unfortunately, the one to give way first, as his blade broke and the stronger kidnappers slashed him across the chest. I am sorry my lord. That was all the Hatamoto could think as he fell to the ground. Tisk, troublesome samurai. Had to kill two of my grunts before croaking huh? The strong kidnapper slash ring leader said as he then pointed his blade at the fallen samurai, prepared to finish him off. He looked at the noble lady with a sadistic grin as his sword glinted. His eyes shine with pleasure when seeing her fear. Lady Harada seemed to turn completely white when seeing her guard on the ground. She knew what fate awaited her. She simply closed her eyes, not wanting to see the man that had fought to protect her die in such a cruel way. One thing was for sure. She regretted not convincing Mifun to teach her how to wield a sword. Just as her hopes were dying down, a voice she didn't recognize spoke out. The strange thing? It seemed to be very close to her. Now now. This is a rather strange scene to come across in such a beautiful city. The ring leader immediately stopped his actions when hearing that voice, his blade also froze in place. But not because he wanted it, no no. The ring leader looked down, to see a short masked man with spiky long hair crouching down beside the Hatamoto. It was none other than Ken. And he was just holding the kidnapper's katana in place with his bare hand. Gripping it by its dull part without shaking even slightly, regardless of how much strength the kidnapper tried to apply. Children shouldn't play with weapons. The masked man stood as still as a statue, seemingly glaring at the strong kidnapper through his mask. The blind swordsman then gripped the blade tightly, causing cracks to appear everywhere on the blade. Before it crumbled completely, Ken infused it with his own chakra, causing lighting to cover the entire blade including the hilt, which ended up shocking the kidnapper and forcing him to let go of it and jump back towards his comrades. W what the hell do you want? Is he some sort of hidden guard or something? Would the daimyo of the land of iron really hire people this sneaky? The kidnapper was confused, but he didn't panic yet. Well, I was bored a bit earlier. Seeing how your blood spills might make my day a bit brighter. Ken nodded before standing up. He smiled a bit underneath his mask as he turned his head toward what he presumed was the daimyo's daughter behind him. She still seemed petrified in fear, but that was likely because she didn't know him either. At first, the blind swordsman wanted to wait for the Hatamoto to die, then swoop in when things looked the worst. 
But seeing the man fight with his life on the line like that did manage to make Ken respect him. Besides, it also felt like an appropriate enough moment to intervene, the fruit was ripe enough. Now now, there's no need to go that far. I bet you're just some random mercenary right? We can all split the ransom. Two of my men died here already, so you can get a decent share. The kidnapper was quick to try and entice Ken. After all, he was quite sure Ken wasn't associated with the daimyo, so he wanted to at least test his luck. Only two of your men died today? Ken simply tilted his head, not answering the question, instead asking a question of his own. Are you sure about that? The masked swordman's voice sent a shiver down the kidnapper's spine, he immediately turned around to look at his underlings. The two of them were standing still, with their arms raised. It was as if they were petrified, with their heads, twisted so much that they were almost broken off. Someone had twisted their necks with such ferocity that it went beyond a 360 degree angle. It was almost as if someone had tried to unscrew their heads from their bodies. The ringleader's back was filled with cold sweat when he noticed that their bodies were being held up by metal wire. Strung up for display. WN Dash, the kidnapper was instantly filled with dread, and the noble girl's attention was also finally brought to the other kidnappers, and she also almost covered her mouth and almost vomited in disgust. People these days really need to learn to pay more attention to their surroundings. Ken simply shook his head, acting disappointed while crossing his arms. I'll give you whatever you want. Please spare me. The kidnapper was instantly on his knees, knowing that there was no way he was killing or escaping from the man in front of him. Who? Spare? Ken immediately turned into a blur and appeared right behind the kneeling kidnapper. The kidnapper was knocked out cold before he even had the means to react, receiving an axe kick to the head, the street underneath him cracking heavily. Don't worry, you won't die. I'm sure the daimyo will appreciate having someone to torture and interrogate for this matter. Ken wasn't even thinking of killing the man in the first place. If he had wanted him dead, then he would have been dead before any words were exchanged, much like his comrades behind him. W who are you? Are you hired by my father? The noble girl finally mustered the courage to stand up, looking at Ken with wary eyes. Lady Harada, right? Heh. I am not under your father's employ. But I am an associate of his. Ken walked towards her slowly, approaching her carefully in order to not scare her in any way. It seemed to work, as the noble girl composed herself and calmed down a lot more now that she knew the man in front of her was related to her father. I see. Thank you for your help, sir? Ken. You can call me Ken, the blind swordsman then turned his head up and threw a small piece of paper in the air. The paper proceeded to explode, it was a small explosion, but it was enough to echo throughout the entire city. Why you can call me you? Thank you for alerting the guards. You was a bit spooked by the sudden explosion. But she thankfully figured out what it was for rather quickly. No problem. I could walk you over to the castle myself, but I just left from there, and I don't want to make things awkward. Ken nodded at the young girl in front of him. You smile trembled a bit when she heard that. You're worried about awkwardness in this situation? Well, from how the other kidnappers look, I guess this isn't all that special for him. You sighed a bit internally as she remembered the sight of the two kidnappers standing with their heads twisted. It was still a chilling scene for her, one that was sure to follow her into her nightmares. Although, the fact that the person that was capable of doing such a thing saved her was certainly going to help her sleep at night. I'll gladly invite you back to the castle, I'm sure my father would love to reward you handsomely for your service. You bowed slightly in gratitude when speaking. I appreciate the thought young lady, but I'll be fine. Just tell your father that he owes me a solid. Ken just waved his hand dismissively, smiling a bit under his mask as he started walking away. Biba Dash, you might want to reward the samurai that protected you before I came here. Were it not for him you would have been long gone before I even arrived at the scene. Ken was apparently not bothered by interrupting what was essentially the princess of the land of iron. You was a bit taken aback by that, she was used to people treating her with respect, but seeing the masked assassin's back getting further and further away gave her a strange feeling. I guess some people can go about in the world without any fear. Yu's eyes shined, and now she looked at the strung up corpses of her to be kidnappers in a different light. It now looked more like a morbid work of art, rather than the barbaric scene she had seen beforehand. 
I want to be like that someday. The young girl clenched her fists and smiled underneath her veil, looking once again in the direction that Ken had left in, wanting to go after him, only to notice that he was already nowhere to be seen. I'm sure I'll meet him again. I want him to teach me as well. I need to become stronger. POV narration, it didn't take long for Yuichi to get word of what had happened, Mifun could feel the rage radiating off of him, it was clear that someone was going to get executed. Yu was after all only a 12-year-old girl, she had not even gotten any training when it came to fighting, as Yuichi had wanted her to stay away from that world as much as possible. It seemed that had been a mistake on his part though. In truth, there wouldn't have been much for a 12-year-old girl to do against five grown men, but at the very least she could have tried to escape on her own and call the guards. Mifune was quite mad that the kidnappers had also somehow infiltrated their forces. Such a thing was unacceptable. He immediately launched an internal investigation, and all of the corpses were recovered and were to be identified. The guards were perturbed when coming across the bodies, more specifically the two that had been strung up for display in the alleyway. Yuichi was immediately worried about his daughter's mental state when hearing about the state of the bodies. It was certainly the work of a bloodthirsty maniac, but it seemed that the bloodthirsty maniac was the one to save his daughter's life. Yuichi wanted to seek out the man and recruit him at first, but then his daughter told him his name, as well as the fact that they were apparently associates. The red dot? It wasn't surprising that Ken would be capable of such brutality. He had already gone on record ruthlessly hunting down bandits and even attacking a hidden village. The more important thing was the fact that now Yuichi owed him a favor. I think my plans to acquire the Dark Brotherhood will have to be postponed for now. He was still going to take the opportunity if it arose, but now Yuichi needed to look into different ways to integrate the organization into their systems. Mifun was off to inspect the bodies and to personally question the one survivor whose head had been embedded into the ground. While all of that was happening, Yu was having a rather tiring time, as she was now stuck in her room for a while. She had done her best to tell everyone what had happened and went into detail to describe how the samurai that had protected her fought valiantly, deserving of his title. Yuichi was dissatisfied that the man had failed, but the odds were stacked against him, so he decided to reward him for his efforts anyway, as his daughter was safe thanks to him. However, she also described Ken in a concerningly positive light. She seemed excited to explain how he had easily dispatched the three remaining kidnappers before she could even react. Yuichi was a bit concerned by her enthusiasm. Yu herself, for some reason, was a lot less bothered by the mutilated corpses than the patrolling guards that had found the scene. She was actually found staring at them from reports. Though they did claim that she seemed petrified. Out of boredom, she started playing with some kitchen knives, throwing them at the wall with a smile on her face. In her mind, she imagined metallic wires connected to all knives, as she continued playing around. The little princess had found a new passion. It was debatable whether it was cute or morbid though. She had somewhat steeled herself. I'll ask dad to let Ken teach me. He said they were associates, and dad did seem to know him. Needless to say, Yuichi was going to have quite the headache to handle in the future. Ken wasn't thinking about any of that though. He didn't bother to consider how his actions would affect the young impressionable mind of the princess, nor did he care. He instead started making his way home after dodging the patrolling guards. He left the city easily despite the lockdown blending into the surroundings and even transforming himself into a spider and crawling on the city walls and above them. The transformation jutsu became a whole lot more useful to him after Tasho taught him a few tricks, like the fact that he could transform into inanimate objects and animals. That part was something that hadn't been covered in the small booklet that one of his dads had gotten for him. Ken hadn't gotten around to using it often, it did have one rather obvious downside. To use the transformation he'd have to continuously channel his chakra, which would make him easier to detect a sensory-type shinobi. Fortunately, it seemed that the Land of Iron didn't have many sensors at the part of the wall that Ken picked. Not that it would've mattered. It wasn't like Ken was at war with the Land of Iron, he was just testing their defenses and preparing for the future. I can expect them to be a lot more on guard if they do start fighting me in the future. Especially Yuichi, he'll likely start using body doubles as long as I'm around. It wasn't uncommon for lords to use body doubles. Ken was aware of it as well, in his mind, 
He already had made a plan to kill everyone he had met in that room. Whether or not he would need to make use of his plans. Well, that was entirely up to them. To him, it was just something he was used to. Have a plan to kill everyone you meet? Although it sounded a bit silly, it was a core rule for an assassin. Be it ally or foe, you must be prepared to kill them under any circumstance. That was also how Ken had managed to kill all of the allies that had betrayed him before being caught by the police because he was alert at all times, prepared to kill them at any moment. He always made sure to study the weaknesses of each and every person that he worked with or against. And he would always fight and form his plans around said weaknesses. Alas, he was still a human back then. He may have outskilled them, but he was still outnumbered and injured badly. Thankfully, he was no longer just any human. Now he was something more akin to a freak of nature, someone that far surpassed the strength, speed and dexterity of regular humans. Now, he could carry out his plans much easier. The Seven Swordsmen of the Mist. Ken had already pinpointed their whereabouts, he could exact his revenge at any point he wanted if he aimed to simply kill them. But simply killing them was not going to be enjoyable enough. Maybe at first, he would have been satisfied with spilling their guts on the ground with his bare hands, but now he had other plans for them. Alas, said plans required the wave of recruits to be trained for at the very least two more years. They were to play a part in his plan after all. The swordsmen would just have to wait for their turn to die. Ken also had a few plans for revenge on the lord of the land that put bounties on the heads of his family members. But he decided not to kill him at all, his family members were criminals, and that much was undeniable. Deserters were treated harshly in the land of iron, so Ken couldn't fully blame only the daimyo. He would decide what to do with them after taking care of the swordsmen of the mist. After all, revenge was a dish best served cold. Ken had always been a patient man. He felt no need for momentary satisfaction. The blind swordsman dashed through the woods with a smile underneath his mask. He wondered for a second, whether to return to his base or go on a bit of a hike and hunt down a few bounties on his own. After a little bit of deliberation, Ken decided that he would first go home, get Tasho to prepare a few bounties for him to hunt down, and then leave on a mission. There was no need for him to stay at his base at all times after all. Tasho and Saburo were both more than capable of training the young recruits and Akira. In a twisted sort of way, Saburo had already become the Jonin teacher that Akira had never had. As the strawman had a wealth of experience, and Akira was somewhat akin to a blank book. The situation was only somewhat twisted because Saburo had initially tried to kill Akira relentlessly. But the former thief turned assassin didn't hold it against him, so all was fine. Saburo had already managed to befriend Akira, but Tasho didn't seem to trust him one bit. Having more experience in life, he could tell that Saburo was as fake as a person could get. A man that would say anything and everything to make you feel better about yourself and to raise your opinion of them. Saburo clearly followed some hidden agenda, which was why Tasho simply couldn't allow himself to be comfortable around him. Ken was also well aware of that. But he knew that Saburo wasn't stupid enough to betray him. As long as their interests aligned, then everything would be fine. And if there happened to come the day when Saburo would act out, then Ken was confident he'd be able to put him in his place. It didn't matter how much he tried to hide his original body, the blind swordsman would always be able to find it. Ken didn't take more than two days to arrive back at his home. He stepped into the village with a smile on his face. Saburo's clones that guarded the entrance to the village simply nodded at him. Upon entering, Ken noticed that half of the recruits were busy being trained in the caves, while the others were in the field still training their bodies. Tasho really did pick children with potential. I guess he just got lucky, not like he was selective, he accepted anyone that wanted to join, even children that were missing a limb. Among the recruits, Ken was able to sense two children that were missing an arm, one of them seemed to be blind in one eye. And another was surprisingly missing a leg. War orphans weren't always left unharmed by the war after all. Now, the child without the leg was a special case. Ken was going to make sure he received rigorous training, but he didn't plan on sending that particular child on any missions unless he managed to prove himself despite his disability. Ken didn't want the orphans he took in to end up dying in his care. It simply felt weird for him to just treat them all like resources whenever they always stopped their training to greet him. Many of them called him, father. 
Ken had never had children of his own, well, none that he knew of. But in general, he was a loner for all of his first life, and his only family were his father's in his second life. Still, his time with them had shaped him into the person that he became, which was also why he wanted to avenge them even more. One step at a time. No need to rush into things, let all the pieces fall into place. Ken sat down in his office, taking off his mask and placing it to the side. His bangs now covered the part of his face where his eyes should have been. They weren't close enough to cover the two noseless nostrils that were standing a bit above his mouth. I think I'm due for a haircut? Saburo, tell Tasho to come here for a bit. Ken spoke out as he shook his head and crossed his legs. Saburo wasn't in the room, but his clones at the door could hear him. He could feel one of the clones nod, but neither of them moved. Tasho arrived a bit later, with a bit of dust on his clothes, having just come out of the caves from training the children. Master, I'm glad you're back so soon, I hope everything went well. Tasho took a knee immediately upon entering the room and closing the door, his masked face staring at Ken's expressionless face. Everything went smoothly, a lot better than expected even. We are now allies, of sorts, with the Land of Iron. Ken nodded as he spoke. I find it difficult to believe that the Land of Iron would become allies with a stray organization. Another voice joined in on the conversation, and Saburo entered the room with a curious look in his eyes. You can find it difficult to believe, but it did happen. Be it through intimidation or charisma, it seems that at the very least the nobles think we are worth keeping around more than otherwise. Ken wasn't bothered by Saburo's presence, he had expected him to show up as well. Akira was likely still training in the caves, though. I see. I'd love to hear more about what happened in detail. Saburo nodded a bit, Tasho didn't say anything, but Ken could feel that he was also curious. I will go into detail at a later date. For now, I am feeling like taking a stroll. Collecting a bounty or two in the process. Tasho nodded as he finally stood up, dusting himself off and walking to his leader's side. I will select a few interesting targets for you, sir. I actually had my eyes on one myself. Ken turned his head towards Tasho, smiling a bit as his curiosity rose a bit. Hmm? You found something interesting among the bounty posters? Saburo also seemed a bit curious about what his associate had found. Not among the bounty posters. But I did find a personal request directed at us. Asking us to investigate something called, the Cult of Jashin. Tasho took out a small unsealed letter and placed it on the table. Cult of Jashin? POV narration. Cult of Jashin? Ken asked as he supported his head on his palm, turning his head over to Tasho. Yep. I don't know much about it yet, besides what the letter said. Tasho nodded as he brought Ken's attention back to the fact that it was a request rather than a bounty. Personal request from an anonymous sender. Saburo muttered as he rubbed his chin with a raised eyebrow. The Dark Brotherhood had not yet grown to the point where it should have received requests from others. It was rather surprising that they did, but Ken couldn't exactly complain about it. Though it did bring up the possibility of it being a trap set up by an enraged noble. Not quite anonymous, actually. It wasn't difficult to find out that it came from a few of the nearby villages. Our operations do at least give us some renown in the area. Tasho clapped his hands with a smile on his face. Plenty of people have reported losing relatives and friends, odd disappearances all over the place, all linked to sightings of weird masked people. With the local nobles not bothering to do anything about them, the villagers figured it would be worth it to pull together some money and hire our organization to look into this. Tasho had already done his research on the situation. He was glad to share his findings with his now interested teacher slash master. So we're talking about an unknown group of people kidnapping others? How did they get their name? Ken rubbed his chin and tapped on his mask, which still lay on the table in front of him. Some of the villagers heard hushed whispers, talking about some religious group looking to convert more people to their belief, they believe they are the ones tied to the kidnappings. The blind swordsman nodded when hearing that, his head tilting slightly as he pondered on whether to personally go after the strange religious group, and investigate more about it at the very least. What do their beliefs consist of? Ken's curiosity stirred, as he figured a cult in such a pragmatic and sadistic world would make religious extremists back in his world blush. 
Well, they weren't able to find out much, just that it had something to do with immortality. That was unfortunately where Tasho's information seemed to fall apart. Them and just about every other cult and religion in existence. It's always immortality, be it in this life or the next. Ken wasn't very impressed, but he didn't let his disappointment show in whatever features he had. It just meant that he would have to find out more on his own. But the little Tasho confirmed did manage to stir the curiosity of someone else in the room. Immortality? That's quite interesting. What else are you able to tell us about this cult of Jashin? Saburo spoke out with a diplomatic smile, clearly interested in learning more himself. Alas, Tasho didn't have any good news for him. I don't have much more information than that. I've not been able to find much besides the fact that their headquarters are somewhere at the border region between the land of hot water and the land of frost. The first blade had not managed to learn a lot about the cult, he hadn't been able to go out and investigate himself. So all he had to rely on was what the villagers that had commissioned them could tell. Is the location of the headquarters from a believable source? The villagers can't possibly know that. Ken still wanted to make sure of a few things before proceeding with an investigation, he needed to know exactly what he had to work with. It was from a few traveling merchants, they claimed that people wearing similar masks to the one described by the villagers are spotted more often in those regions. Tasho shrugged, having already vetted out his sources. It's a rather wide area to look into, Saburo said as he turned and looked at Ken, trying his best to read the child leader's thoughts. Wide, but not too difficult for someone like me. Ken's senses and abilities as a sensor were likely good enough for him to spot the hideout if he was within a certain range. It wasn't difficult for his ears to pick up on human settlements, as nature was otherwise quiet most of the time. I can help with a few clones. But I can't let them get too far from me, the range of my technique isn't endless. The strawman was not unwilling to share some of his weaknesses at that point. At the very least, he was willing to share things that he thought Ken had already figured out on his own. Ken also noticed that Saburo had become awfully interested in that cult after immortality was mentioned. He made a mental note of that before shaking his head and responding. There's no need. I feel like going for a relaxing walk anyway. Ken slowly stood up, taking his mask and placing it on his face, covering his calm smile. What if you need to read their texts or books in order to find information? Saburo raised an eyebrow, somewhat confused at his leader's approach to the situation. At the very least he acted confused, inside he was simply displeased that he wouldn't be looking into the matter personally. Unfortunately for him, there was no changing his leader's decision at that point. I'll manage, I've always managed. Ken shrugged and stretched his arms a bit. Saburo looked at his leader, before sighing and shrugging. Suit yourself. He was smarter than to go and annoy Ken for too long. He would simply have to learn more after Ken eventually came back. I'll be leaving in a day. I'll leave tomorrow at dawn. I'll need Tasho's help to write up a report about what happened during my visit to the capital. The blind swordsman waved his hand and dismissed Tasho and Saburo, both of them going back to their previous jobs. The former was to return later in the evening to help Ken write up a report about their deal with Yuichi. Saburo himself was also busy, as his laboratory was already close to completion, so now he could resume his previous research, at least parts of it. He hadn't given Ken many details, but he did say that he was looking into the human psyche, the ways Jinjutsu affected the mind and the permanent effects that trauma suffered during Jinjutsu could have on a human. It was a rather grim experiment, and it obviously required test subjects, which Saburo was thankfully able to source from some of the bandit camps that he had raided. Ken had to build a small underground jail in him to hold his prisoners. It was connected directly to Saburo's lab, which made things much easier for the strawman. Saburo was actually quite glad to now be working with Ken, as he could now pursue his experiments openly, not needing to hide them from the village he worked for. Ken himself was not exactly a morally righteous individual, he seemed to not really care about the bandits that were being used as test subjects. He only made Saburo promise to give them all painless deaths after the experiments were over. The strawman readily accepted as he didn't really care either way. It's extremely nice, having an employer that sees the benefit in your research. That was also one of the big reasons why Saburo didn't wish to argue with Ken over the matter with the cult of Jashin. 
Even if he was now interested in finding out more about them, it wasn't in any way worth losing favor with Ken over it. The very next morning, Ken departed from the small village they had built with a smile on his face. Passing by and waving at the children that were still training in the courtyard was something he seemingly enjoyed doing. It did derail the training for a bit, as all of the children seemed very excited whenever they saw him. But it also did help them build some sort of affection with the recruits, as all of them appreciated the attention they received from their father. Saburo wasn't really fond of that particular tactic, however. He wanted Ken's presence to retain a bit of a mysticism to the children that called him father. That mysticism would inevitably lead to the children looking up to and revering Ken more over time. Alas, Saburo didn't really have a say in the way the recruits were being trained, so he didn't ever speak out of turn regarding the matter. He merely watched through his clones as Ken waved at the children as he passed through the village gates. As soon as he stepped out of the village, Ken's hand fell to his side, and he immediately disappeared, taking off into the forests, not leaving even a full afterimage behind. Ken's departure was quick, he headed down beyond the border and into the land of hot water, hiding his presence as he didn't want to bother encountering any shinobi along the way. He leapt from tree to tree, his steps not shaking the branches he walked on as his speed made him more akin to a blur. The blind swordsman stalked the border between the land of hot water and the land of frost for the following days, keeping his ears peeled the entire time as he silently advanced with his search. Rest was not really an issue for the natural-born sage, he could keep up his stride for what felt like an eternity. After all, one that could casually regrow limbs wouldn't have much of an issue with sprinting. Eventually, Ken could hear it, the sound of a crackling campfire. He had run into a few before, merely travelers and peddlers. But this one felt different, it felt bigger. It also brought with it an odd smell. Of burning flesh and smoldering bone marrow, Though, it might have been just an animal being cooked up. Ken didn't want to just jump to conclusions too quickly. Instead, he got closer and closer, until he could clearly feel the situation. There it is. Ken crawled on top of a tree, settling his attention on what felt like a large gathering in the middle of the woods. Dozens upon dozens of what felt like masked men were gathered around a campfire, kneeling with their foreheads on the ground as the large campfire. On the bonfire was nailed a woman, her guts seemed to be spilling down on the fire, as she was already burnt beyond any recognition. Ken couldn't see her state, sure, but he could easily tell from the smell after getting close enough. He was quite familiar with it at the end of the day. I guess they really are a mad cult, huh? If that woman was one of the people they forcefully converted to their religion, then I can't really expect any one of them to be alive still. The blind swordsman was left pondering on what to do next. Should I try to observe them a bit more? Should I just kill them all and interrogate whoever survives? They all seemed to be huddled around the campfire, but behind them was a cave that Ken couldn't really feel into. Likely some sort of seal. Ken could still feel a few humans inside that cave thanks to his nature energy, but he was completely unable to tell what level of chakra they had. There were bound to be some shinobi among them, though. The odd part was that the people down below didn't feel like fighters or shinobi to Ken. They didn't have any chakra, signaling that all of them were civilians. Well, at least most of them were. However, one thing was for sure, every single masked person had an aura that Ken was very familiar with. Bloodlust fueled by a sense of crazed determination. They're all bloodthirsty maniacs. I should have expected this. The bloodlust he could feel from them reminded him of some of the maniacs he had fought in his past life, killers for hire. It was a playground for the mentally diseased. A playground that Ken ruled for the better part of two decades. I guess I'll watch them a bit longer. See if anyone more concerning appears out of that cave. Ken simply crossed his arms and sat down, on the tree that was at least five kilometers away from the large bonfire that the cult had created. Whatever this cult is. I'll make sure to burn them to the ground, since I'm already here. POV Jashinist. And as we knelt and prayed, we watched the woman's body before as it burned. I believe she was one of pure heart and body as well. A great offering to our Lord and one of our most important rituals. Offering a heretic to our Lord in hopes that we will finally be noticed like our leader was. Thankfully, there's no shortage of offerings. We are able to easily lure in more and more people to provide as offerings to their Lord, some were kidnapped from faraway villages, 
some were coerced into coming there on their own, and then drugged into submission. Most of our offerings are comprised of women and children. However, children sometimes get the opportunity to join us as well. The children were akin to a blank slate, still pure enough to be converted to our beliefs. Our church is ever-growing, unbeknownst to anyone else. Some of us had tried to spread the word of Lord Jashin to some villages, but they never did manage to receive many recruits from that. Blasphemous pagans that lived without any purpose. Just thinking about their filthy existence makes me mad. I can barely wait for the day when we would finally be able to grow strong enough. Strong enough to spread chaos and death to this dirty world and its residents. Thankfully, we receive strength directly from their lord, should he notice our efforts. Varying degrees and ranks within our religion receive different gifts from Lord Jashin. It is said that our leader has even achieved a state of semi-immortality. Lord Jashin only grants that gift to one person each generation, he truly is fit to be our respected leader. Ah, how wonderful it is to see our efforts be rewarded in such a way. Alas, we recruits have yet to receive our Lord's blessing. More blood must be spilled, patience is something we must have, but not something we must ask of our Lord. We must shower him in offerings as is customary. Oh, there he is. Our esteemed leader. Master Kumiro, the shepherd to our damaged souls. Wearing nothing more than a black coat, showing off his tattoos and the symbols that adorn his body. He even painted his hair white, to match the depictions of our Lord Jashin. He has even appeared in the dreams of former leaders. A great man that has truly earned the right to wear the symbol of Lord Jashin on all of his limbs, and even on his tongue. Oh! Devout followers of Lord Jashin. Tonight, he has spoken to me. Master Kumiro spoke out to us, calling us devout, such high praise for us unworthy followers. Hail Lord Jashin. Hail Master Kumiro. Our voices resounded throughout the praying ground. Our master nodded his head with a warm smile on his face. However, his smile soon turned upside down. A frown? Have we, unworthy followers, done something to displease our Lord? Our Lord has spoken. Master Kumiro repeated himself as all of us quieted down, waiting for his words. Today's sacrifice was nothing more than a pathetic contribution. He has grown bored of such boring ways. Oh, a pathetic contribution? Lord, we apologize for all of the displeasure we've caused. We must atone for our sins. We must atone for our sins. All of us moved in a trained manner, already knowing our customs. We unsheathed our knives, placing a palm on the ground, we all stabbed into that palm, impaling it on the ground. The ground started turning red, as all of my brothers bled for our collective sins. It is necessary to pay in earnest when displeasing our Lord, for he has given us so much, yet we can only provide him with so little. Such a way of praying for forgiveness. My devout followers, I commend you for your readiness and praise you for your unwavering faith. Master Kumiro's words rang like a song to our ears, as we bore through the pain. However, Master's next words immediately dampened our spirits, Lord Jashin will not be pleased with just this tonight. We have received his direct orders. To repent, we must slaughter a village of blasphemous pagans in his name. Master Kumiro spread out his hands, opening up his palms and smiling warmly at all of us. Yes. Lord Jashin is giving us a way out. A way to repent for our sins. It shall be done. It shall be done. Our shouts echoed throughout the forest, as we all got up and started bandaging our bleeding palms. Tonight we shall lead many wayward souls to our Lord Jashin. Praise be. POV Ken. Crazed cultists, the lot of them. Seeing them burn up a woman was crazy enough. Seeing them all plunge a blade into their own hands is something else entirely. People are always much more open to causing pain to others than to themselves. These people are too far gone. And that man leading them. Master Kumiro? I don't know what his deal is, but it almost feels like he is dead. For some strange reason. It's almost as if nature energy just doesn't stick to him for some reason. All living organisms must have nature energy inside of them, but for him, it seems to be constantly spilling out. One thing's for sure, he feels dangerous. He gives me a strange feeling of uncertainty, I'm not sure if I can fight him on my own even. Maybe I should have brought Saburo with me. Hmm. Too late for regrets. But do I even need to fight this weirdo? The commission was not worth much money, to begin with. At least nowhere near enough for all of this trouble. I do have a choice to make though. 
Letting these crazed cultists roam the world freely will definitely lead to a lot of innocent lives being taken. I wouldn't really give a shit if they only targeted shinobi, but civilians didn't sign up for their lives being put in danger. Huh. Well, I guess I can deal with this branch at least. I'm assuming they have more, but I'm not going to search the world for cultists. I'm not that big of a busybody, though things might change if I get paid enough. Anyway, since I'm here, might as well give these cultists a bit of a lesson on brutality. In the first place, I don't have to fight this weirdo in any way. I just have to kill him. Kill him in such a fashion that I strike fear into the hearts of all of the other dregs that are near him. With his death, they are bound to scatter like rats, after that it'll just be a game of hunting down as many rats as I can. In my past life, there were plenty of people stronger than me, but they all still died to me, this situation isn't all that different. Hmm, I can see that they're starting to head in one direction. Probably going for that village they want to sacrifice to their Lord Jashin or whatever. Better get some traps ready, just in case. POV narration. And so, the blind assassin got to work, easily tracking the large group of fanatics and realizing the route they were taking. They were headed for the third closest village to their base, one that was obstructed by trees. A great spot for a slaughter. Unfortunately for the cultists, the ground would only be painted red with their blood. Ken quickly got to work, setting up as many traps as humanly possible halfway to the village. He didn't have the time to warn the villagers and evacuate them. But he didn't need to, at the end of the day he only needed to kill the cultists, and that would be the end of it. Once the leader is dead, they're unlikely to continue with their march towards the village anyway. Ken used all of the metallic wire inside his bag, setting up trap after trap, throwables and nets, even resorting to pitfalls filled with sharp sticks. The holes were dug up in a hurry using his tail, but they were going to hold up. After all, the rest of the cultists were mostly regular humans, not even shinobi. Only two or three people besides the leader of the cult even had any chakra above genin levels, so Ken wasn't really concerned about them. The leader himself seemed to be wielding a weapon, a large two-bladed red scythe that was tied to his wrist by a long chain that was wrapped around his arm. The blind assassin stalked the group for a while, he had also managed to count them finally. There were a total of 87 people. Ken knew that he needed to kill them all, leaving even one of them alive would just lead to the cult rebuilding itself. Eventually, the time came for Ken to kill their leader, as they were reaching the place where he had placed traps. Ken stalked the trees until he was directly above the madman. With a flick of the wrist, a puff of smoke appeared and a large windmill shuriken unfolded itself in his hand. A nice toy he had managed to buy at some point in his bounty hunting journey from a wayward shinobi. He even had a few of them custom made since he found them particularly useful. Ken's chakra immediately flared up, and the windmill shuriken buzzed with life, spinning in his hand as it radiated lighting. With another flick of the wrist, the shuriken flew towards the leader's head, aiming to decapitate him outright. Just as the shuriken was about to cut into him, Kumiro raised his hand and turned his scythe at an angle, blocking the projectile with relative ease. The shuriken slid off to the side, causing sparks as it came in contact with the mad leader's weapons. It then embedded itself deep into the ground, creating a rather sizable hole as it only stopped spinning after a few seconds. Oh my! It seems we've got a rat! Kumiro shouted as the Jashinists behind him all took out their weapons, consisting mostly of Tontos. Kumiro looked up, only to raise an eyebrow as he didn't see anyone there. He turned around a few times, scowling as he prepared to disembowel whoever got too close to him. Above, on the branches, Ken had already moved his position. He moved his mask to the side of his head and quickly made a few hand signs. His speed was decent, but it was not all that great when compared to Jonin. Thankfully, he wasn't in any hurry. As he finished his hand sings, his chest flared up, and he brought his head back, before opening his mouth and spitting forward a gigantic fireball. Fire release, great blaze ball. One of the techniques he had gained recently, it was extremely flashy and just as deadly. The fire immediately caught Kumiro's attention, who raised his head and looked at it with a scowl. You worms. Quickly form a wall around me. He quickly ordered his men, who followed suit, protecting their leader with their bodies. The fireball hit the ground in front of them, and the ensuing explosion shook the entire forest, as the trees around them fell to the side. 
Ken landed on the ground and wiped his mouth a bit, before placing his mask back on and tapping his wrist once more, taking out his long blade in a quick motion, already unsheathed. Was that enough, I wonder? Ken walked forward carefully, the smoke was hindering his sense of smell, and the crackling of the fire was somewhat annoying his ears, but he could still feel that a lot of people had been burnt to a crisp thanks to that jutsu of his. Just as he prepared to blow the smoke away with a swing of his blade, a scythe rushed towards him from behind the smoke screen. The blind swordsman wasn't taken by surprise at all, he simply leaned to the side and batted the weapon away using his blade. As expected, cockroaches don't die that easily. Ken then swung his blade in front of him with a lot of force, causing a large gale that blew Kumuro away and revealed the area to everyone that was still to the side. There were dozens of burnt corpses, cultists turned to charcoal. Still, just as many had survived, not being close enough to the explosion. Kumuro already had his scythe back, having used it to slow himself down. Now he was standing right where he had been when the attack had started. TSK! You dare kill my devout followers? Lord Jashin will not forgive such transgression. Kumuro shouted in anger, as the cultists that should have been cowering in fear, were only emboldened, all rushing towards Ken with their weapons out. As expected? You can't scare away madmen. Ken thought to himself as he parried a few knives, before swinging his blade and cutting into their wielders with ease, bisecting them as he dodged a red scythe from the side. The scythe lodged itself into the heads of one of the cultists, but no one seemed to care, they all continued rushing Ken with crazed expressions. Stop moving around, you pest! Kumuro shouted as he tried to pull back his weapon from the head of the cultists. Ken just scowled underneath his mask, before he turned and made a quick hand sign. The ground underneath Kumuro shifted as the cult leader had just managed to pull back his weapon, grasping the handle in his hand. Alas, he only had time to look down before a clone of Ken impaled him through the chest with a chakra blade, pushing his heart out of his body and onto the dirt in front of him. The clone then exploded into a burst of lighting, further frying the cult leader as he was dying. The windmill shuriken that Ken had thrown earlier had just been a lightning clone, the fireball had been nothing more than a distraction, to take Kumuro's thoughts away from the shuriken. And it seemed to have worked. I guess he wasn't much after all. The blind assassin thought to himself as he jumped up and dodged a few slashes from the fanatical cultists. The forty or so cultists that were left didn't even notice that their leader had his heart gouged out. They simply continued attacking Ken with fervor, waiting for him to land. Ken, while in midair, started spinning more and more. As soon as he landed, the cultists tried attacking him, but it was too late. He had already gathered enough momentum, and a violent tornado quickly formed around him as he continued spinning. Dragon Twister The tornado grew in size, as it lifted all of the cultists off their feet and threw them into the sky. Ken continued spinning more and more, some of the collapsed trees also being pulled into the tornado and thrown into the sky. From a distance, it just looked like a small natural disaster. Then, Ken stopped spinning abruptly, he stood still in the eye of the tornado for a bit before slashing down his blade, breaking the wind stream apart and the tornado at the same time. All of the cultists that had been thrown into the sky forcefully hit the ground, dying on impact as Ken dodged a few of their bodies and trees. And just like that, the cult of Jashin was exterminated. Ken proceeded to walk over to the leader's body, sensing it from up close as he tried to figure out just what about him had managed to creep him out. Even after his heart was gouged out, it still feels the same. Though he is certainly dead, there's no trace of his wounds healing in any way. Ken reached his hand down, wanting to feel the wound himself. Just as he did, the body moved, the red scythe slashing towards him at insane speeds. Ken managed to block it, raising his blade just in time, but Kumuro's other hand also moved, pulling a steel rod from his sleeve and thrusting it towards his chest. The blind swordsman managed to slightly bend his body, but the steel rod still stabbed into his shoulder. Ken rolled away as he narrowly avoided getting cut by the red scythe on his way out. What the hell? How can he survive something like that? Even I'm not sure if I could. Ha ha ha. Curse technique, death controlling possessed blood. Kumuro burst out laughing as he licked Ken's blood from the steel rod in his hand. The blood from his chest seemed to fall and form into a strange symbol on the ground. Just like that, 
Ken sensed a strange energy creating a connection between the two of them. Ken scowled at that, he prepared to dash forward, but the madman seemed to be just as fast as he was. Lord Jashin. I offer this heathen's blood to you. May it satiate your hunger. Kumiro raised his scythe, and plunged it into his own stomach, smiling sadistically as he did so. Ken was shocked when he sensed that. But what shocked him more was the fact that he was forced to stop his advance, clutching at his stomach with a scowl on his face. He was so shocked in fact, that he fell to one knee. W what? Ha 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 ha. You fool. To think you would try to face Lord Jashin's brilliance on your own. Foolish. The man then looked at the ground, at his feet was his heart. He smiled sadistically as he kneeled and looked Ken in the eye, before stabbing into it with his steel rod. Sleep tight. The mad cult leader said as he watched Ken's body go limp. POV Ken. It's strange. Not feeling your heartbeat in your body, feeling your hands grow colder and colder as the supply of blood to your brain made your vision foggy. It's been quite some time since I've tasted my own blood like this. So much is coming out that I can't even keep it all in my mouth. However, despite the obvious blood loss and pain, it seems that my regeneration can keep up with this. Just barely. If this had been a year or two back, then I surely would have died from this, but as I am now, I can still hang on. If he stabs his heart again and does more harm to himself, then I might actually die. Apparently, healing a missing slash burnt off arm is easier than healing critical damage done to your heart. This might be because the heart seems to also store chakra, which seems to somewhat conflict with nature's energy. You'd think that you'd be able to move away chakra in your own body freely, but something in my heart seems to want to keep some chakra in there constantly. I need to do some more research on this. I don't understand how his technique works still. I've never seen anything like it either. Is it some sort of sacrificial technique? Something that takes the life of the opponent away? Wait, is he moving still? Is this man truly immortal? It's almost as if he doesn't need anything to survive. He did defend himself from fire using his followers as meat shields. Would a surprise attack with flames actually be able to kill him? But what do I do when my opponent both can't die, and whatever I do to him, happens to me as well? There must be a way out of this. Even now, I sense a string of unidentifiable energy connecting the two of us. It feels like chakra, but also not at the same time. It's broodier than usual. There's no use in fighting him while this energy is connecting us, it would only be a waste of time on my end. An exercise in futility. Oh, right. His blood formed some sort of circle, didn't it? Will our connection be severed if he leaves it? If not, then I'll have to play dead for a bit longer. Let's just hope everything goes well. POV narration. Kumiro panted a bit as he looked at his opponent's dead body. Yet another offering to Lord Jashin. But at what cost? The cult leader looked around, to see all of his disciples had already been killed. Maybe he could have saved them had he acted sooner, but he was unsure that he would have been able to take the masked assassin on without that surprise attack. And I thought we'd be safe if we stayed away from the five great shinobi villages. Every other worshipper of our lord that was under me is dead. All because of that trash. Kumiro was frustrated and angry. His pious and determined spirit trembled in rage when seeing the mangled corpses of his devout believers. Alas, he managed to calm himself down. I'll surely get scolded for this. I need to quickly rebuild as much as I can. Kumiro slowly walked away from the circle of blood, scowling as he did so. The symbol of Jashin that had been formed from his blood was a powerful technique. Jujitsu. A special type of jutsu that relied on curse-like effects which normally stuck to others. It was a rather esoteric and poorly researched art, but that was just because finding someone capable of jujitsu was extremely rare. So rare in fact, that you would be able to count the people capable of performing cursed techniques on one hand. Now, the cult of Jashin and its high-ranking cultists were the exception to that. As they at least had a few dozen capable of performing jujitsu with the help of their god, Lord Jashin. Kumiro was leading nothing more than a small branch of the cult. They were a very widespread religion which had managed to stay hidden for a very long time. It was only due to Kumiro's bad leadership that people managed to track them down. It was a great failure on his part, which even he acknowledged. At least Lord Jashin will forgive me, for I have already spilt the blood of the one responsible for this. 
Normally, his curse technique would have transformed the user's body slightly, turning their skin dark and creating white bone-like markings on it. However, Kumuro already had those tattoos imprinted on his body, so it had no visible effect or difference. The branch leader slowly walked closer to the corpse of the assassin that had assaulted them, finally getting a better look at his figure. This runt? Kumuro got closer and closer, before raising his scythe and bringing it down towards Ken's back with bloodthirsty and ferocity. Hitting a corpse was not beneath the cult branch leader after all. Unfortunately for him, the corpse he was trying to stab fought back. As soon as he raised his scythe, Kumuro felt a bit of pain, then blood spilt on his face. Looking down, Ken had his blade raised and was already crouching instead of laying down. Before the arm with the scythe even fell to the ground, Ken went for the other arm, swinging his blade again. This time Kumuro reacted and dodged out of the way, rolling backwards as his arm finally hit the ground. W what? Are you also a follower of Lord Jashin? Kumuro shouted as he held on to his bleeding stump, his tattooed face widening slightly as the foe he had thought dead was seemingly just fine. Shit. This guy's instincts are a lot better than I thought. Ken scowled a bit underneath his mask. Yes indeed. This was merely a small test. Ken stuck his long blade into the ground and cracked his neck. The blind swordsman hoped to try and buy some time, to think up a strategy against the immortal cultist. His immortality may be better than mine, but he can't actually heal himself or at least he can't accelerate healing. In the end, the most obvious strategy was also the simplest one. Dismemberment and capture. If Ken could make him drop his guard by pretending to be a follower of Jashin, then things would certainly go much better. T-Test? You call this a test? After murdering all of my followers? Kumuro didn't seem too pleased with the idea. Those that aren't strong enough aren't worthy of Lord Jashin's love. Ken immediately entered his bullshitting mode. Trying to use whatever information he had gathered from listening in on them to try and appear as one of them. W which branch are you from? The mad cultist unfortunately seemed to be asking some hard-hitting questions. Ken couldn't just give him a random number or area where his branch was. Instead, he chose the safest option. If there are several branches, there must also be. I am from the main base, an emissary for Lord Jashin. I am to make sure that all of the lower branches have adequate members and that their efforts are enough to please our Lord. I am also tasked to test the faith and power of each branch leader. I must say, I am quite pleased with your show of faith. You placed your trust into our lord till the very end of our fight. Ken crossed his arms as he spoke, looking at the long blade that was still embedded in the ground in front of him. A main base? I was not aware of missionaries being sent to test us and our faiths. Kumuro still sounded confused, he rubbed his chin a bit. He also seemed quite flattered at Ken's praise. The blind swordsman was sure to pick up on that. It seems that having his faith praised is most effective on this man. As expected. It wouldn't have been much of a test if the branch leaders were made aware of it. This was meant to be a surprise. We were also told to kill all of the unfit members in the name of Lord Jashin. Ken turned his head slightly and pretended to look around the battlefield. I see. It's my bad for recruiting such unworthy disciples. Kumuro nodded, closing his eyes and gritting his teeth. It is fine. Your devotion to Lord Jashin could be seen in the sheer number of recruits. My report will certainly be a positive one. Ken smiled underneath his mask as he continued to bullshit the man. Be but what will happen now? Should I start rebuilding right away? Kumuro asked, his tone a bit confused, as he went and collected his heart. You will start rebuilding, but not in this area. Rumors say that you've been a bit too high profile. Ken's voice gained an accusatory undertone, as he pretended to stare at the cult branch leader with his arms crossed. Apologies. Kumuro seemed to hang his head in shame, seemingly already aware of his own mistakes. You will apologize directly to our superiors and Lord Jashin. All branch leaders were called to the main base. I am to also act as an escort, to make sure you reach the main branch safely. Ken continued on with the charade, wondering how to try and squeeze some more information out of Kumuro. I'll extend this for as long as I can, gather as much information as I can while he's still willing to talk. Even if I don't plan to go after them, having more information on them will be beneficial. A general gathering after the test? 
I guess it does make sense. The worst of us will likely be judged. Will the blessings of Lord Jashin be inverted as well? Kumuro rubbed his chin after he placed his heart in his back pocket. Immediately, he gave a rather interesting piece of information. So this blessing can be retracted, huh? I'm guessing he's referring to his immortality? I was not made privy to those details. Depending on the results, it is possible, it is all Lord Jashin's choice, however. I will put in a good word for you. Ken shook his head and continued building rapport with the madman. I see. Thank you. Kumuro smiled and nodded. His tone was honest, losing some of its previous insanity. Are we heading for MT Shimatama right away? The cult leader asked as he started walking towards his arm, trying to collect it. MT Shimatama, huh? Worth looking into. Yes, Lord Jashin waits for no one, and you know it, Ken spoke out in a resolute tone, making Kumiro smile even wider and nod. By the way, you never introduced yourself. Since you have a blessing, I'm guessing I already know you, right? We are after all the chosen few. Shit. I can't really bullshit my way out of answering that question. Well, I could if I really tried, but he's giving me a great opportunity now. Don't think I'll get much more information out of him like this anyway. In the end, Ken chose to follow his instincts. To take the opportunity that was presented to him so graciously. Just as Kumuro crouched down and went to pick up his arm, Ken kicked the blade that was in front of him. The sword came out of the dirt instantly, cutting through it with ease as it spun in the air and cut into the madman's legs, its exceedingly sharp edge making his legs fly off instantly. W-Kumuro didn't even get the chance to react, he only felt himself slipping forward as he lost his balance before he was attacked again. The blind assassin caught his spinning sword in one hand and slashed away the remaining arm of the immortal cult leader. Well now, this was surprisingly easy. I guess there really was no need to fight you. Ken shrugged as he shoved the tip of his sword into the madman's mouth. The cult leader seemed to go mad at that point, trying to trash around, his limbs flailing by themselves as Ken started tying him up in metal chains. The blind swordsman also gagged him, wrapping the chains around and into his mouth with a deft hand. Ah? Peace and quiet. Ken sighed as he slowly started packing the cult leader's pieces and tying them to his torso. It formed a rather strange and morbid backpack for Ken to carry around easily. On one hand, Ken could have tried to extend the information gathering a bit more. But there was no guarantee that he would have gotten any chance as good as that one to dispatch the mad cultist. Kumuro's speed and reflexes did seem to match his own, so it would have been a rather annoying waiting game to play. There was also the fact that the longer that charade kept going, the more the possibility of getting an answer wrong grew. And that would have certainly made the mad cultist put his guard back up. No use thinking about it anymore. Our resident cult leaders already turned into a rather fine backpack. Ken strapped the Kumiro backpack to his back before he started fleeing from the scene. It's only a matter of time before the shinobi of this land show up, I don't want them to get involved with them. At least not while carrying such an important research subject. Oh yes. Saburo is going to be extremely pleased with this. POV Ken. Before leaving the scene, I collected my traps and burned all the bodies in a large pile to make things harder to track whoever might be looking for these cultists. The traps ended up going unused, but that can't be helped. I didn't think the madman would completely forget about their initial objective and focus on me. Regardless, after burning the bodies till they were not distinguishable from firewood, I started my journey. It's already been an entire day. The best thing about traveling alone is the peace and quiet you get. The wind buzzing in your ears as you jump from tree to tree, speeding alongside breathtaking masterpieces of nature has become one of my favorite pastimes. Sometimes I wish I could see them as well, but at this point, I've gotten used to my lack of sight. It actually makes my life a bit more enjoyable. Enjoyable as in, I can feel everything else a lot more vividly thanks to my lack of vision. I feel more… alive? I guess that would be the word. Unfortunately, having enhanced hearing can turn into a downside at times. Oi! Put me down you heathen! Sometimes, the chain I used to cover the mouth of my backpack slipped off. My backpack must be a new model, it's quite intelligent and extremely loud, kind of like an alarm clock. I tried knocking this guy out a few dozen times at this point, but it seems he just won't stay unconscious. 
My guess is that being unconscious for him is basically like dying since his body doesn't function like that of a normal human. So whatever is making him immortal is inadvertently making him impossible to knock out. Why do you always have to be so loud? My quiet voice sounds more like a frustrated teacher at this point. This ingrate that I am carrying on my back must be in the top 5 most annoying lifeforms alive. Well, alive is a strong word for him. Lord Jashin will never forgive such transgression against his disciples. You shall get divine retribution for this madness. His speech is always so grating on the ears. As if being loud wasn't enough, he must also be annoying. I don't see Lord Jashin coming to your rescue now. Not that I would be able to see him at all. Humph. It's just a matter of time before the main branch investigates this. Undoubtedly, they will find you and your associates. You shall make perfect offerings to appease Lord Jashin's rage. In all honesty, I think this idiot does make a decent point. Even after burning the bodies, they will still logically conclude that they belong to their cultists. His superiors will 100% trace him down after they realize something is wrong. And I doubt the villagers that made the initial request will keep quiet when questioned and tortured by madmen. This whole operation turned out to be a bit more trouble than it's worth by the looks of it. I might have to pay a visit to their headquarters myself. I wouldn't have any problems with them coming after me, but my recruits aren't quite ready to fight against some immortal lunatics. Saburo and Tasha would fend for themselves quite well, but if an army of cultists descends upon us, then protecting the children would be quite hard. What was that old saying? To remove weeds you need to pluck out the roots as well? Something along those lines. I didn't bother talking to my backpack anymore though, I just stuck a piece of cloth in his mouth and tied a chain tightly around his face again. So much better. Dealing with the cult of Jashin will certainly be dangerous, especially if they have more people like Kumuro here. Well, I now know the gist of how their abilities work, I just need to prepare properly. As for any other abilities that may appear, I'll deal with them as I go. The fact that I almost died does make me a bit wary of going directly to them. But I have plenty of time to make a decision. I should continue going to base first, I'll have to talk a bit with Saburo, and maybe send him on a bit of a scouting mission to this MT Shimatama. We'll need to first look into it and see where exactly it's located. So much work. POV narration. An undying man? Akira immediately perked up, walking over to Ken as soon as he reported the situation a bit. Yes, also really loud and annoying. Ken nodded, and Kumuro looked at everyone in the room with absolute resentment. They were currently in Ken's office. The blind assassin had placed the branch leader on the table as if he was a display piece. Around them were three masked people, each having a number of lines on the middle of their masks. His mouth was still stuffed, as Ken had had his fill of the immortal man's voice throughout the trip. He does look to be immortal. Tasho muttered as he took the man's heart and inspected it with a curious gaze. Saburo looked down on the immortal branch cult leader. Both metaphorically and physically. Immortal, yet still ended up on our leader's table. I guess that's to be expected. The researcher had already started with his projects regarding Genjutsu. But now another opportunity presented itself if Ken granted him the right to experiment on their new prisoner. Research into both the source of that immortality and the techniques he was using was something that Saburo wanted to look into dearly. Before he could even open his mouth to ask for permission, Ken turned his head towards him. I know what you must be thinking. And you don't just have my permission. I ask you to place this task on the highest priority, and get started as soon as possible. Saburo smiled immediately underneath his mask, nodding his head as his mood skyrocketed. The blind swordsman slowly turned around and placed his mask on the table, right beside the raving cultist. Kumuro-e eyes widened immediately, both while trying to understand what the people around him were talking about, and when finally seeing Ken's true face. But he didn't have much time to process it, as the second he saw it, two masked men entered the room, placed a black sack over his head and dragged him, and his body parts, away to the laboratory that was hidden underground. Then, another masked man entered the room and walked up to Tasho, who just nodded and nodded and handed over the cultist's heart. Thank you, leader. I'll look into him and come back to you as shortly as I can. Saburo immediately bowed as he spoke. Of course. It should be mentioned that the other branches of his cult might start looking for us after noticing he's gone. 
So the sooner you find out more about him the better. Ken also smiled, showing his canines to the three blades in front of him. Wait a moment leader. We aren't prepared to fight such an organization in our current state. Tasho interjected immediately, sounding rather concerned underneath his mask. Akira also nodded his head, seemingly agreeing with his fellow blade. We are not going to wait for the cult to attack us directly. Their investigation might take a while anyway, so we have time to strategize. Ken rubbed his chin, his deformed face morphing into a thoughtful expression, though it was hard to tell. Do we have any information on their location? Saburo asked as he ran a hand through his black hair, swiping it backwards. They are located at MT Shimatama, that's what I managed to gather from the immortal I brought in before capturing him. Ken nodded as he spoke, proceeding to sit on his chair and raise his legs on the wooden table. MT Shimatama. Sabro immediately started brainstorming. The elemental nations were a rather large continent, and they had a somewhat complex geography. Thankfully, Saburo couldn't be called anything but well-studied. That is part of the Land of Lightning. If I remember correctly, somewhere off nearer to the sea than the mainland. The Land of Lightning was situated more as a peninsula, right near the Land of Hot Water and the Land of Frost. Ken had been there before, but he didn't have absolute knowledge of the land's geography. That's a problem. I was going to ask you to send a clone or two to scout it out. Ken instantly sighed when hearing where it was located. Yes. I wouldn't be able to stay here and research, I can't stretch out my clones that far. Saburo also sighed, knowing that he would have likely been their best bet when it came to resisting the strange curse technique the cult of Jashin were using. After all, his clones didn't bleed, they weren't truly alive. And as long as they didn't touch his main body, his clones would be able to fight the cultists endlessly. Finding out more about their immortality and cursed techniques should be a priority. Ken shook his head, instantly prioritizing the research process first. I can go and scout it out. The one to speak was the youngest among the blades, the third blade, Akira. It's an extremely dangerous cult. I'm afraid they are beyond your capabilities. Tasha was immediately against the idea, finding that Akira was the only other agreeable member of the Blades. He didn't want to lose him, in short. Ken turned his head and stared at Akira, weighing his options for a few moments. He could feel the third Blade's determination. Fine. You are to observe them from a safe distance. Ken ended up accepting, judging that Akira had already advanced enough in his technique to stay out of sight. At the very least, he's able to hide his presence for a few minutes. It should be good enough to help him escape if things sour. Thank you for trusting me, leader. I will go right away. Akira didn't wait any longer, Saburo simply handed him a map of the land of lighting on his way out. Be careful, Saburo said, causing Akria to nod with a smile under his mask. It felt nice, having people care about him. It was rather novel for him, as he had once been an orphan himself. Unfortunately, Saburo's true thoughts were far from caring. We can't afford to lose such talented pawns in our current state. But if he can't handle this much then he's not even a pawn worth keeping. As soon as Akira stepped out of the room, he turned into an afterimage and immediately left the compound, showcasing his speed, which was only rivaled slash surpassed by Ken in the organization. The strawman observed the third blade leave through the eyes of his clones. Accounting for rest time, he should reach the mountain in two weeks time if he keeps up this speed. Saburo immediately calculated the time it would take for him to arrive. Good. Let us continue with our work until then. Ken clapped his hands, and Tasho simply nodded and went back to training the children outside. Saburo also bowed slightly and left the room, surely eager to finally start experimenting on an immortal subject. Ken sighed after seeing them leave, he immediately started strategizing on a game plan. We can't face them head on. You also can't quite assassinate an immortal opponent. Ken rubbed his chin for a few moments before remembering a rather crucial detail. Fire. Fire was something that even the immortal man he had captured seemed to be afraid of. Otherwise, why would he have asked his disciples to block his fire-style justu with their bodies? And it did make sense as well. After all, they seemed immortal, but they had merely achieved some sort of semi-immortality. They couldn't regenerate. So if we turn them to ashes? Then the fight is done. 
Even if they could still live as ashes, somehow, they would just be dust in the wind. But there was also the problem of information. Not knowing how many immortals there were was concerning. And Ken was sure he couldn't fight all of them if they were as strong as Kumuro. It was clear that assassinating them wouldn't be easy, especially since fire was relatively easy to notice. I need allies. Someone to call upon for aid. The first person that came to mind was the Land of Iron. The daimyo did owe him a favor for saving the little princess that one time. But the Land of Iron would never agree to send its samurai to a foreign land. It would be akin to a declaration of war to the Land of Lightning. Simply not something I can ask for. That was the one glaring issue with the situation. No matter how much the daimyo owed him, it would simply be unfair to ask so much of him, it would break any amicable relationship that they might have had. There's always. That. Well, I'll have to make a trip personally, it seems. Ken sighed as he tapped his fingers on his mask. Better get to it quickly. I might even catch up to Akira along the way. POV narration. Unlike before, Ken didn't bother announcing his departure this time. He dashed from the window in his office straight into the forest, becoming a blur as the wind bent around him. Saburo's clone still noticed his departure, as Ken realized it was important for them to at least know when he was away and act accordingly. Ken's speed was great, but his real best asset was his stamina. The nature energy constantly revolving inside his body made it hard for him to ever run out of stamina as long as he was just traveling. The masked assassin didn't need more than 10 minutes to catch up to the third blade, who was also jumping from tree to tree at a rather impressive pace. Ken felt a bit bored, so he decided to prank him. Using his superior speed and stealth, he quickly passed by his subordinate and went further in front of him, far enough to start setting some traps. He immediately hooked some barely visible wires to some trees and prepared traps similar to the ones he had used to catch Akira initially, only slightly modified to fit an enemy fleeing from tree to tree instead of on the ground. Let's see how much he's progressed? A good leader needed to be aware of the state of his recruits after all. And Akira was considered the weakest of the blades, so Ken needed to make sure he was at the very least growing as much as his potential allowed him to. The blind swordsman was quick in setting up the traps, leaving himself enough time to sneak up behind his subordinate once more, managing to reach an appropriate position right before Akira ran into any traps. Ken then took out a regular katana from the seal on his wrist, transformed himself into a grass shinobi, and threw said katana right at Akira's back. By some stroke of luck, Akira seemed to notice the sound of wind being cut as the katana barreled towards him. With almost inhuman reflexes, Akira spun in the air and kicked the katana upwards using his momentum, immediately landing on a sturdy tree branch. Akira then quickly took out his weapon of choice, a small tanto, only as long as his forearm. Assassins? Are people already targeting us? The third blade immediately panicked. A flurry of shuriken and kunai then started flying his way, forcing him to backflip onto another tree and bat away some of them with his blade. He's pretty skilled. But I can sense where he is. Akira then quickly made a few hand signs. Immediately, more and more throwables seemed to be headed his way, further giving away the position of his assailant. But Akira's hands moved fast, turning into blurs as he finished his jutsu almost immediately. He quickly moved his mask slightly to the side, revealing his mouth. Wind release, great breakthrough Akira's chest immediately inflated, and he spit out a great torrent of wind, which immediately shotgunned the projectiles right back towards his assassin, the trees even up to 10 meters in front of him seemed to break almost instantly. Ken smiled a bit under his mask and transformation as he turned and used a tree as cover against the strong gust of wind and projectiles. The tree stood tall for a few seconds before Ken felt it snap completely, and he felt himself falling backwards. Without any panic, he rolled off to the side, using the tree as a stepping stone and started running towards Akira, who had already run out of air. Akira's eyes widened underneath his mask as he looked at his assassin approaching him, jumping from tree to tree. He also immediately recognized the figure. A grass umbu? Akira's face morphed a bit underneath his mask, becoming rather angry at the mere sight of a shinobi belonging to the village that had almost killed him. But he didn't act rashly, instead, he took a deep breath and calmed down in that same second. The grass shinobi moved fast, almost as fast as Akira, 
and the third blade immediately made the split-second decision of turning around and fleeing. I need to get rid of him and return to base, warn the others. Akira proceeded to cut some of the trees and branches around him using a wind chakra blade that extended from his tanto, aiming to slow down his pursuer as he jumped from tree to tree. Just as he was about to advance further and further into the forest, something glinted in his eye. A metallic string. But Akira's speed was already too fast to stop quickly, instead, he jumped a bit higher, flipping right above the wire and landing on a branch. Unfortunately for him. That was about the end of his journey, as the sturdy branch he landed on immediately broke, Ken having loosened it beforehand. The third blade was left, free falling right into a concealed metallic wire net, which immediately enclosed him as soon as he touched it. Shit. I can't believe I got caught. Akira tried to struggle for a second, but the shinobi that had been pursuing him had already reached the metallic wire, touching it with his palm. Akira immediately reacted, trying to throw his tanto at the shinobi's head with a flick of his wrist. The wire then immediately electrified, paralyzing Akira slightly, as he finally felt that the situation was a bit familiar. The shock wasn't strong actually, and it stopped instantly, leaving the third blade a bit flabbergasted, as he then felt the wire holding the net get cut. Akira turned around a few times before landing on the ground in a crouched position. Clap clap turning his head up, Akira noticed the figure of the grass shinobi that had been hunting him down morph completely, turning into a much more familiar short figure of his leader. Impressive progress? You actually fought back splendidly. Though you fell for a rather similar trap as before. Ken then jumped down, and Akira just sighed in relief at the voice of his leader. So it was just a test? Well, it's better than getting killed, I guess. I hope you were able to learn something from this, Akira. Ken then unentangled Akira and helped him up. Akira was still speechless as he stood up, only nodding his head after a few seconds. Thank you for the lesson leader. I'll take it to heart. However, the leader's presence rose quite a few other questions for the third blade. Is he also joining me on this scouting mission? Does he not trust me enough? I'm sure you're wondering why I'm here, and no, I am not joining you. But we are headed in the same direction. Ken nodded as he started collecting his wires from the net. I, I see. Thank you for entrusting me with this. Akira immediately straightened his back his tone gaining back quite a bit of confidence as his worries were answered instantly by his perceptive leader. No need for thanks, you are carrying out your duty as the third blade. If I am unable to trust you, then I am unable to trust anyone. Ken shook his head as he jumped back up and collected the last few wires from his other traps. Right. But what other mission are you going on? Is it related to the cult? Akira jumped after him collecting his tanto as Ken had embedded it into a tree right near the trap he was collecting. In some ways it is. We will need allies to take down an organization of this size, they are also bound to have powerful shinobi. Ken nodded as he finally finished collecting the last trap. Ken then turned around and started continuing their journey, adjusting his pace so that Akira could keep up, at least for now. Are we allying ourselves with some other bounty hunters from the Land of Lightning? Akira asked as he followed after his leader. I had thought about that. But no amount of nameless bounty hunters will cut it for this one. We need something reliable. Something that would also be interested in getting rid of a pest that resides within their territory. Ken shook his head slightly as he continued jumping from tree to tree. W wait, so we are allying ourselves with the village hidden in the clouds. Akira's eyes widened underneath his mask as he quickly came to that conclusion. There really weren't any other powers in that region that could be interested in the destruction of the cult. But would the village hidden in the clouds even want to ally themselves with us? Well, they might be up for it since the cult is a problem for their territory as well. Akira wasn't exactly the most adept when it came to politics, but even he realized that the cult of Jashin was something akin to a parasite in the land of lightning. Still, allying ourselves with a hidden village might break the image of neutrality that we have. Wouldn't that also affect our relations with the Land of Iron? Even if he wasn't a diplomatic genius, he had still listened to all the reports and he knew the internal situation of their organization very well. Well? I had thought of that before as well. Ken smiled a bit under his mask, as he could somewhat guess the thoughts running through Akira's head. 
But we aren't exactly allying ourselves with the Cloud Village, nor are we asking them for help. Ken's confident words seemed to confuse Akira, who could barely pay attention to his steps at that point, almost slipping and falling from the trees. Thankfully, Ken grabbed him by the collar and stabilized him. You may be confused, but it's rather straightforward. I am simply going to the Cloud Village to assist them with some information regarding the cult, and to provide them with our services. For the right price, of course. Ken's smile turned a bit devious underneath his mask as he brought Akira up to speed on his plans. The third blade immediately gained quite a bit of clarity, he immediately turned his head and looked at his leader with quite a bit of reverence. That reverence managed to once again blind him to the branch that he managed to run into directly. Ken just sighed as he stopped and turned his head back to his subordinate. He's still got a long way to go. The two of them continued traveling together for the following week, Acria continuing his training directly under Ken despite it being a mission. Ken didn't train him in anything physical, as the two of them only ever stopped whenever Akira was already tired from running. Instead, the blind swordsman showed him a few more techniques and usages of chakra that relied on coding. Akira was already decent at it, but he was far from sending a flying slash, despite the fact that his chakra nature was wind. Akira in fact had two chakra natures, one being wind and the other fire. Ken made sure to teach him how to constantly adjust the size of his chakra blade, in order to catch an enemy off guard. It was difficult and required a lot of concentration, but the blind swordsman believed that Akira was talented enough to get it eventually. The two of them eventually reached the land of lightning, where it was time for them to finally part ways. Ken had to go straight for the cloud village, while Akira still had quite a bit left to empty Shimatama. The blind leader left the third blade with a few parting words. If I find myself having to collect your body, I will find some way to revive you just to kill you myself, are we clear? Akira gulped a bit and simply nodded, before continuing on his way. The second they parted ways, Ken picked up the pace, turning into a blur once more as he started making his way to the cloud village, doing his best to judge his direction using a small compass and a few villages as landmarks. It only took him a few days in total, he managed to avoid all shinobi as he traveled, making sure to stay undetected in general. But he wasn't going to attempt to sneak into the village. In the first place, sneaking into the village was simply impossible. All of the five great hidden villages had seals placed around them to prevent people from sneaking in. And the seals were not some cheap variants like the one that the grass village had. Some still managed to overcome the detection using specific ways of hiding their presence from said seals. But that required some specific knowledge in Fuenjutsu, knowledge that Ken lacked. So, Ken only bothered to stay hidden before he started approaching the hidden village, after which he simply started walking towards the village gates. At some point, he passed through the formations, and he could tell that he had created a ripple as he passed through. He didn't bother walking faster though, he just continued on his way normally. Before he even reached the gates, Umbu had already surrounded him, all of them having their blades drawn and looking at him warily. Ken wasn't able to tell much about their appearances, but he knew they were Umbu just from their masks. All special operatives in villages seemed to wear masks in order to hide their identities, the Cloud Village was no different. The Umbu also seemed to immediately recognize the famous bounty hunter. State your business, Red Dot. The Umbu leading the squad said as he carefully approached the reportedly violent bounty hunter that was already close to their gates. I've come here with some interesting information for the rakage. I don't wish to make enemies with your village, so you can put your blades down. Ken simply raised his arms as a criminal would when encountering the police, appearing as harmless as he possibly could, his fingers far apart from one another to not alert them into thinking he was trying any jutsu. The Umbu didn't seem to want to put their weapons away, though. It seemed that Ken's reputation had well and truly changed after the incident with the Grass Village. Information? What information could you have that interests us? The squad leader asked as he tilted his head slightly. The squad leader then signaled to the rest of his team to put their weapons away. He was already aware that the Rakage had tried to contact the Red Dot in the past, so he wasn't outright hostile, regardless of the man's reputation. The umbu around him listened reluctantly, and Ken finally sighed and put his hands down. It's regarding some strange cult that has made its headquarters on your territory. 
Ken nodded as he told the squad captain the gist of the situation without any hesitation. After all, all of the Umbu would likely be made aware of the situation, and they were likely going to partake in the operation as well. The shinobi were immediately alerted by that, all of them looking at each other in confusion. Ken could hear some murmurs from some of the members. He managed to catch something about the situation being related to some disappearances that had been reported. The shinobi took a few seconds to talk amongst themselves before the squad captain nodded and looked at Ken once more. Lord Rakage will want to speak to you personally. The squad captain then gestured for Ken to follow him. Ken simply nodded and followed, the other Umbu tagging by all sides, as if to make sure he wouldn't try anything while in their village. But that was never Ken's intention in the first place, so he just quietly followed the Umbu. That's the easy part done. Now, let's hope the Rakage takes the bait. POV Narration From the moment Ken started following the Umbu at a slower pace, one of the members ran ahead and informed the rakage of the situation directly. The rakage was a rather tall man, standing at 205 meters, or 6.73 feet a dark-skinned man with an extremely muscular and well-defined build, with only one large scar visible on his chest. He had long white hair that flowed down his back, coupled with a trimmed white beard. He wore a pair of black sandals dark blue sweatpants, along with a single-strap white shinobi jacket with no other clothing underneath and a black forehead protector that he wore like a bandana. He didn't really bother diversifying his wardrobe. I didn't quite know what to expect when hearing that he was receiving a surprise guest with more information regarding the ongoing issue they were facing with disappearing villagers. The identity of the guest was actually the interesting part for him. The Red Dot? I had tried to contact him plenty of times, only to be ignored or refused by Ken time and time again. The rakage thankfully didn't have anything else important to do, but even if he had, he would have scrapped all plans. Recruiting Ken was far more important to the rakage than anything else. I was even willing to make him, an outsider, the Umbu captain, even give him a position in the council as long as he was willing to join the Cloud Village. The rakage really couldn't care less if others in the council were against that choice, he knew better than anyone how much a powerful shinobi could benefit their village. Even if he's here on different matters, I'll try to steer the subject in that direction eventually. Just as the rakage was having these thoughts, the door to his office opened up, and the masked assassin walked in alone, the umbu that had guided him remaining outside. Lord rakage. A pleasure to finally meet someone of your stature. Ken spoke as he tilted his head and raised a hand, aiming to shake the Kage's own. A simply smiled when seeing that gesture. He hadn't expected Ken to be that polite towards him, at least not after recent reports regarding his actions, but it was a welcomed surprise. I should be saying that, Red Dot. I've been trying to reach you for quite some time now. The rakage accepted the handshake, his large fingers wrapping around Ken's entire hand. Ken couldn't help but be a bit impressed when feeling the strength of the rakage grip, he rarely met people physically stronger than him after all. Apologies for being a bit harder to get in contact with. You must understand that I normally refrain from interacting much with any of the hidden villages. Ken smiled a bit under his mask as he spoke, retracting his hand in the process. I did notice that. But what changed now? I narrowed his eyes a bit as he asked the most important question of their meeting. What made the Red Dot, a notoriously neutral figure, get in touch with me? Well, now I have already started an independent organization in the Land of Iron, so I don't just act for myself, but I represent an entity. Ken simply shrugged as he used his organization as a sort of shield. The rakage was immediately surprised to hear that Ken had gone a different route. He, and all of the other Kage, had been just waiting for the Red Dot to join a village or a land by himself at that point. But it seemed his ambitions were a bit larger than they had all expected. I could respect that. But it wasn't like the organization could be ignored as something insignificant either. Ken already proved to be able to wipe out a smaller hidden village just by himself, any organization that he joined, let alone created, would be put on the map as a significant threat to the authority of the other five hidden villages. An organization huh? That raises quite a few more questions. What are your intentions? Will they clash with the already existing forces in the elemental nations? Even though A could respect a man's ambition, that didn't mean he wouldn't care more about the interests of his village. 
The appearance of a sixth power to contend with the five great villages was not good news, no matter the angle one looked at it. After all, they only had so many resources to fight over. My group will be mainly a brotherhood of assassins and bounty hunters. We don't plan to get involved with the hidden villages needlessly, and we especially don't want to join your wars. Ken was quick to lessen A's worries, assuring him that the organization would be acting much like the blind assassin when it came to involvement with the shinobi world. I'll take your word on it for now. Don't make me regret this. A said as he crossed his arms and gave Ken a rather hostile look. Don't worry. Today's matters are a bit more concerning, however. Ken was quick to change the subject slowly walking over to the rakage desk and leaning on it. Concerning? I guess you can call it that. I did learn quite a bit from this small interaction already. The rakage slowly walked over and sat down on his chair. What we talked about till now will feel trivial real soon, I assure you of that. Ken smiled deviously under his mask as he then quickly started retelling the tale of the cult of Jashin, at least what he was able to find. A cult of madmen worshipping some strange god that they claimed granted them powers. They seemed to be masterful users of jujitsu and their experiments had gone so far as to grant a few of them immortality. He made sure to keep the fact that the Dark Brotherhood was contracted by villagers to hunt them down out of the picture. Making it look like it was less of a priority for Ken and his organization to get rid of the cult. The blind assassin talked about encountering and killing an entire branch of that cult somewhere in the land of hot water while out on a journey. He told him how they had been kidnapping others and using them as sacrifices. I killed all of them and burnt their bodies, only keeping their immortal leader alive for interrogation. Ken smiled as he finally finished recounting a part of his tale. Well, if he's truly immortal as you claim, then it doesn't sound like you had many choices but to bring him in alive. The rakage scowled a bit, as he tried to take in the information Ken was providing him. I did find out that their immortality is rather weak against fire, so I should have still been able to kill him. Ken shrugged as he continued speaking. A seemed to appreciate the extra information, slowly things were starting to tie together in his mind as well. A cult that kidnaps and uses others as sacrifices. I understand why the Umbu wanted me to meet this man, he really does bring an answer to our disappearing civilians problem. I had already guessed that a branch of that ghoulish cult was likely hiding within their territory, a bit shameful but it couldn't be helped. The leader confirmed that the main base of this cult is situated in MT Shimatama. Ken's words did make a quite a bit more frustrated though. The main base? Hiding in MY territory? Is this information trustworthy? MT Shimatama is barren, and even patrolled regularly, like all other areas in the Land of Lightning. I was quick to ask for clarification. It did after all feel like a rather concerning crack in their defenses if an entire worldwide organization had made their main base in his territory. I gathered this information while masquerading as a member of the cult, got the branch leader that I captured to mention the location of the base. I couldn't help but curse a bit under his breath when hearing that. Information gathered while in disguise was oftentimes more trustworthy than information gained from torture, so he now needed to really look into the matter. I've already sent one of my men to scout it out. But if your people have also patrolled it before, then it's likely not going to have a noticeable entrance. Hidden in plain sight? Or using seals of some sort? Ken rubbed his chin a bit and sighed in disappointment as he realized that he might have to scout out the place himself in the end. Shit! The rakage punched his desk, his fist slightly crackling as some lighting started coming out of his skin and his hair rose up slightly. His outburst ended up slightly startling the umbu that were hiding in the room. Akage's office was never truly empty after all, the rakage still had a multitude of shinobi hiding in the room, in every shadow that they could fit, even sticking to the ceiling. It was a common practice among Kage, especially when entertaining guests. Ken obviously knew about them, so he wasn't exactly surprised when he felt them stir in fear. Even his own men are afraid of his power. As expected of the Kage of one of the five great hidden villages. No need to lose your cool over this, and it's no reason to be ashamed. This cult likely has some sort of branch or offshoot in the territory of the other great hidden villages as well. Ken tapped the tall man on the shoulder, stretching up a bit to do so. Still, it is quite shameful that an outsider had to bring this to my attention. 
The Cloud Village certainly owes you a favor for this information. The Rakage was quick to calm down as well, he was also fast in offering Ken his thanks, in the form of a favor, which was worth a lot more than a few words of gratitude. After all, Ken didn't just tell them information regarding the location of the cult, he also gave them a rather glaring weakness in their techniques, like how their curses all likely relied on blood or how their immortality was susceptible to fire. It was all vital information that the Cloud Village needed in order to prepare for their upcoming battle. After all, there was no way the Land of Lightning would let such a cult thrive on their territory much longer. I appreciate the gratitude, Lord Rakage. Ken slightly bowed, smiling widely underneath his mask as the first part of his plan was done rather well, he had managed to completely remove himself and his organization from the situation, while also gaining favor from the Cloud Village. Oh please, just call me A. You're not a subordinate of mine. A smiled a bit, being quite pleased with Ken's demeanor. Well, in that case, you may also call me by my name, Ken. Though you may already know it. The blind swordsman didn't have any qualms about building a relationship with the rakage, having friends in high places could prove worthwhile after all. It would also make the next part of their conversation much easier when it came to negotiation. I did know it, fine. I'll just call you Ken, makes things feel less impersonal and cold. The rakage swarm smile made it clear that he truly did have a good impression of Ken, that he did appreciate Ken's efforts in gathering and bringing him so much information on the cult of Jashin. Indeed. Now, I'm guessing you'll be taking care of the cult soon, right? Ken ran a hand through his long hair, raising the black strands of hair and stopping them from covering his mask further. Yes, we will be taking care of it shortly. The second shinobi war just finished, and another one will be starting soon, so we need to do it as soon as possible. The rakage didn't seem to be against giving Ken a bit of information regarding the state of the operation, assuming that the blind bounty hunter was curious about how the cult would end up. Hmm? Do shinobi already have plans for another war? Will the people of the elemental nations ever know what peace looks like? Ken simply sighed in disappointment when hearing that, even though he had already known that another war was going to happen, he was still disheartened to hear of it happening so soon after the last one. Heh. Peace isn't in our nature, I'm sure you'd understand given your profession. And this war has already been planned out before the last one even finished. It's just the nature of these things, unfortunately. A shook his head and gave Ken a bit of a grim smile as he spoke. I see. Ken also ended up shaking his head and going back on track. I was asking about the cult. As I'd like to offer the services of my organization to the Land of Lightning. Even though we are still a small organization, we still have around 40 capable men that you can hire. All are Chunin level and above. A immediately raised an eyebrow when hearing that. It wasn't often that a new organization started off with that many powerful shinobi after all. Normally you'd have to go through the daimyo if you wanted to get hired by the Land of Lightning. A hidden village normally doesn't hire the services of other organizations for such matters. The rakage didn't seem to be all that willing at first, which was what Ken had expected anyway. That I understand, your village is full of capable and able-bodied shinobi, you normally wouldn't need to hire outsiders for such a job. However the situation is a bit different, we know how to fight this cult the best, so hiring us might lead to fewer casualties on your end as well. The blind swordsman was quick to start attempting to convince A that hiring the Dark Brotherhood was truly his best option. Unfortunately, the rakage wasn't looking all that impressed. You did already give us plenty of useful information in combating this cult, I doubt our casualties will be that major. A rubbed his chin a bit looking thoughtful for a second before suddenly smiling as if he had just gotten an idea. Say, our village would certainly be willing to hire you. Just you. A's smile seemed to become wider and wider by the second, as excitement gripped at his mind. This is a good chance. Get him to see what cooperating with us feels like. Asking him to join us later will come much easier. Even if Ken was now the leader of his own organization, that didn't mean he wasn't recruitable anymore in A's eyes. After all, the organization Ken had created was still new, so it could just as easily be disbanded or swallowed up by the Cloud Village. My direct services don't come cheap. Even if we are on friendly terms. Ken crossed his arms and pretended to sigh in disappointment. Such a shame. 
It seems that my organization will have to not spend any resources to get rid of the cult after all. The blind swordsman had been aiming to receive such a proposal since the beginning. After all, he was well aware that the rakage would never hire his organization, especially since it had plenty of unknown shinobi. I simply couldn't trust them, as the Dark Brotherhood didn't have much renown tied to its name. But Ken felt that simply providing his personal assistance directly was a bit inelegant. It also made it harder to negotiate a good price. Hence, the blind assassin steered the conversation in such a way. Maybe a better diplomat would have seen through Ken's scheme if they had enough knowledge of his character. But A was neither the greatest of diplomats nor did he truly know Ken. Ha! Huh. I'd be willing to spare no expenses if it means hiring the best in the business. With the two of us there, there's really no need for any other shinobi anyway. The rakage had taken the bait in his mouth instantly, chewing and swallowing without any hesitation. Hmm? Well, if that's the case then I'll go easy on you. 500 million Rio, and we'll see this through to the end, together. A smile seemed to become a bit strained when hearing that. 500 million Rio? It wasn't a small sum, not by any means. The regular bounty for an S-rank shinobi was in the 20 to 50 million range, depending on their strength and the severity of their crimes. Ken's entire bounty hunting trip had barely made him around 200 million Rio, and he had only stolen around 600 million from the grass village, which was rather poor in comparison to the land of lighting. But 500 million is not a small sum, even for the land of lightning. He'll likely talk me down a lot from this position, so it's good that I started high. However, the world, and the rakage himself, had different plans. Hmm? Fine. 500 million it is. To Ken's immense shock, A agreed almost instantly after a bit of consideration. The rakage even smiled as he extended his hand, hoping to shake Ken's hand and close the deal verbally first. His logic for this rather sudden decision? Well, I wouldn't sell my services for anything less than 500 million. Ken was technically a person at the level of a Kage, now A actually had the opportunity to judge his skills personally. There was also the fact that A wanted to get in Ken's good graces and get him to join the Cloud Village. Entering a heated debate and negotiating prices with him like a shrewd merchant wasn't going to help him reach that goal. That's? Well then. I'm glad we could come to an agreement. Ken instantly shook the rakage's hand, not wasting any time, fearing that the man would reconsider his decision. And so the two of them shook hands and sealed the deal, with Ken managing to double the reserves of his organization in a single move. POV Narration Ken didn't leave the Cloud Village after completing his deal with the rakage, choosing to stay there and wait for a report from both Saburo and Akira regarding their findings. He made sure to send a message through their summons to Toso, informing him of his stay at the rakage residence and asking him to send over the reports of the other two blades as fast as possible. The rakage seemed to be okay with waiting a bit for Ken's information gathering to conclude before attacking the cult's main base of operations. While waiting, Ken was allowed to live inside one of the free rooms inside the Kage's mansion. The elders and some of the shinobi in the village were vehemently against his presence, but A didn't seem to care. Many were also obviously against the rakage's choice to hire the Red Dot for such a large cost, or in general. But A was able to convince them that it was better for their village in the end. They were dealing with an exceedingly dangerous organization, one which A was confident would be able to cause plenty of casualties among his shinobi. So, instead of throwing men and women at the cult until it fell, he would personally take care of it alongside Ken, a person powerful enough to watch his back if need be. After all, the blind assassin's power was not something being debated. It was already believed that he was capable enough to wipe out a hidden village by himself. So the council of the Cloud Village only really wanted to complain about the price. And the fact that they couldn't quite trust an outsider with such a job. The rakage was still confident in his choice, and he later signed the written contract, officially confirming the payment, and even giving Ken half of it before the operation. To him, the red dot could be trusted. He had a rather good track record when it came to tasks, he almost never showed any aggression towards people that weren't his targets. The situation with the grass village was a bit more complex, but at that point, it was already known by the more important people of the world that the grass village was the one to act first against the bounty hunter. Ken spent a few days uneventfully in that place, mainly just meditating. 
It was only when he decided to practice his swordsmanship in the courtyard that something unusual occurred. The blind swordsman was simply sitting under a tree in a meditative position, with a regular katana by his side. From time to time, he would tap the tree heavily with his elbow, causing leaves to fall off the tree. He would then unsheath his blade and slice all of the leaves in half before even one of them touched the ground. His blade was nothing more than a blur, as he remained in the same seated position throughout the exercise. It wasn't something overly difficult for him now. It was something he had been doing ever since childhood, so now it was just something he did for fun. Hearing the leaves falling around him, the wind trying to carry them away, the exercise helped him calm his mind as well. At least he would have been calm, if not for a random stranger pestering him. What are you doing here, Bakayaro? A strange man that appeared to be at least in his twenties from his size and voice kept trying to talk to him while making gang signs of some sort that Ken couldn't quite understand. The man seemed to be overly muscular, carrying with him quite a few blades and wearing clothes quite similar to those of the rakage. He also had short hair, swept backwards, and a goatee. Please leave me alone. The blind swordsman said as he sheathed his katana and hoped for the best. Uha! You came through my door, uninvited and unsure but now you're chillin' in my space, making yourself at home, Ken could feel exasperation rise inside his soul as the person in front of him continued to rap in a melodic tune. Feelin' comfortable? Like you've known me all your life, but let me remind you, this is my house, I call the shots tonight so now, you better tell me, what you doing here? The rapper continued throwing gang signs as he crouched down in front of Ken. Before stopping, muttering something about some good bars and taking out a notebook to write them down. The blind swordsman wasn't even sure what to do at that point. Despite sounding a bit forceful, the rapper was mostly confused going by what Ken could feel. At least there was absolutely no hostility coming off of him. Which was a very good thing as the man's mere presence sent shivers down Ken's spine. No? It's not from him directly. Rather, it's something inside of him that makes me uneasy. Such a great amalgamation of chakra, it's beyond anything I've ever felt. My name is Ken. Others know me as the Red Dot. I was contracted by the Rakage for a mission, currently resting here while waiting for some more information from my subordinates. Ken decided to just give the man a rundown of the situation, wanting to avoid any conflict with him almost instinctively. I'm in no way prepared to fight whatever beast is inside this man. Oh. My name is B, Killer B you may call me Lord Jinchuriki. Kanayaro, B quickly introduced himself as he clapped and did a few more gang signs. I think I mentioned something about you, said you were staying over, what do you plan to do, the man continued speaking in that same tone, with the same intonation, rapping his words out like lyrics constantly. Ken smiled a bit under his mask as he slowly stood up. Of all things, I wasn't expecting to hear rap music in this world. I was just training, wasting some time. It's nice to meet you, B. The blind swordsman extended his hand towards Killer B, smiling as he did so. The Jinchuriki answered in kind, smiling widely as he shook the red dot's hand rhythmically. He was about to open his mouth to start rapping again, but a flash of lightning appeared by their side and punched him into the ground with a loud roar. B. You absolute moron. Lord Rakage told you not to bother our guest. The man that spoke this time around had a much rougher voice, sounding a tad older. Ken's smile trembled a bit as he had sensed the man's approach, but he also felt something rather obvious. This guy is even faster than I am. Ken felt as if he could have still reacted to that attack, but it was clear that the man was much faster than him. The technique he was using was also strange. But the blind swordsman didn't have much time to study it before the man turned it off. Sorry about that, Red Dot. My sworn brother here has a slight problem with personal space and common sense. My name is A. A also shook hands with Ken, his smile feeling a bit more political or forced than that of his brother. A? Wasn't the rakage also named A? Ken sweated a bit as he felt a bit awkward at their naming sense. His hairstyle was much the same as his brother, and his clothes were also similar, just the collar from his inner sleeveless shirt was a bit higher, going all the way up to his cheeks and covering the sides of his neck completely. Pleasure to meet you, I am assuming you are the rakage son? Ken asked as he tilted his head slightly. You are assuming right? Father already informed me of your presence, we were away on a mission until now, hence our absence. 
A spoke in a polite tone, clearly not wanting to disrespect Ken in any way, despite the fact that he didn't seem outright okay with his presence in the village. That is quite fine, I am glad to finally meet the rakish son and pupil, I have heard quite a bit about you. Your strength seems to live up to your reputation, that's for sure. Ken turned his head towards Killer B, who was still twitching on the ground beside them. Ha! Huh. That's high praise coming from you. I'll be honest now since I'm sure you can see through this quite easily. A's gaze instantly turned a bit colder as he dropped all pretenses and looked at Ken's mask directly. I am not sure why father decided to take you on this mission, it actually feels like wasted money. I and my brother will be coming as well, of course. Which is why I don't see how someone like you would be helpful. A's gaze seemed almost judgmental at that point. Ken suppressed an exasperated sigh, as he realized that A in front of him was likely a more shrewd version of the rakage. I understand that the three of you together should be strong enough to handle anything. But we are dealing with powers we barely understand here. Your father was wise to hire additional help, as other shinobi besides us could have just as easily slowed the three of you down. At the very least I'll be able to keep up with you all. Thankfully, Ken himself was nothing to scoff at when it came to convincing others. His words seemed to make a thoughtful, as it was undeniable that they barely had any understanding of jujitsu, cursed techniques, and the techniques the cult of Jashin would be using. I still find it difficult to justify your asking price. So I'll have to test you myself. A then cracked his knuckles and gave Ken a cocky smile. The blind swordsman simply sighed. Is there any way we can avoid this? Wasting energy like this before a mission isn't exactly professional. Don't try to weasel your way out of this. Your tongue sure is trained, but I'll personally have to make sure whether or not you can keep up with us. I didn't seem to budge though, cracking his neck and walking a bit further away on the training grounds. Ken also slowly followed behind a killer bee to the side had finally regained consciousness, only to see that his sworn brother was off to spar with Ken. He was visibly confused, before just scratching the back of his head and deciding to observe the fight silently. I won't be going easy on you, Red Dot. A said as lightning nature chakra covered his body like a cloak, his entire body buzzed with energy, his hair rising upwards as Ken took out his long blade and braced himself. You better not. The blind assassin only got to say that before A already appeared in front of him. Ken only managed to bend his body away slightly, causing A's fist to miss by a few inches, but cracking his mask nonetheless. Such speed and power. He didn't even need to touch me to cause damage. Ken immediately rolled away, swinging his blade forwards as A followed after him swiftly. The blind swordsman could clearly trace A's movements, he immediately imbued his long blade with lighting nature chakra and sliced the air in front of him and causing the shinobi to stop in his tracks. Ken then quickly took off his mask, not wanting it to be damaged further, and threw it on the ground. Ken could immediately feel a faltering at the sight of his face, and the blind swordsman took that opportunity in stride. His blade whizzed forward, taking the shinobi by surprise. But A was still faster, he was able to take a step backwards and dodge the blade with a sneer on his face. That sneer didn't last long though, as he was immediately hit by a flying slash that came out from the edge of Ken's blade. Shit. A couldn't help but curse himself for his carelessness, as he felt himself being sent barreling backwards, dozens of meters away, his back breaking through a few trees. Ken turned to his blade with a bit of frustration. I wasn't able to cut him. He had felt the flying slash connect, but he had been unable to feel if he had managed to even put a scratch on A's body. That was a head-on collision. So not only is he annoyingly agile, he is also extremely durable. Ken scowled a bit as he made a few hand signs and created two lighting clones. If taking him on alone is annoying, then I'll just do it like this. A's next attack was just as fast as before, he seemed to almost instantly appear in front of Ken, his fist already cocked back. However, this time around he was assaulted from three directions energized blades trying to cut at his body viciously. However, Ken could feel the blades of his clones almost bounce off the man's skin. A's punch ended up being deflected into the ground, as Ken pushed the hilt of his blade into the bridge of his nose, making his head move backwards but otherwise doing no visible damage. No matter how durable he is, he must have some weak spot. Ken's scowl deepened as he and his clones continued to keep A in place. 
The shinobi would sometimes try to land a hit, only to be deflected. The blind swordsman had already gotten used to his speed, showcasing his talent in the process. By now, he was already reacting before A moved, which caused a lot of frustration in the future rakage. To the side, Killer B almost couldn't believe what his eyes were seeing. His sworn brother was incredibly powerful, the only one capable of standing up to the rakage and one day succeeding in that position. It was just surprising to see a bounty hunter keep up with him. After all, the lightning release chakra mode was an incredibly powerful technique which granted the rakage and his pupil speeds far exceeding all other ninjas. Anyone even able to keep up with them was simply at the top of the world. Even the other four great kage had trouble facing the rakage by themselves thanks to that technique. But Ken had no way of knowing that. To him, he was simply facing off against one of the most annoying opponents he had ever fought. No way to advance forward, retreating was also not an option, as his opponent was much faster and could catch up instantly. Instead, he was stuck in a battle of attrition against A. But Ken's frustration simply couldn't compare to that of A. Why won't any of my punches just land? It was as if his opponent had some sort of sickeningly accurate sixth sense. Either that or a shocking amount of fighting experience, allowing him to accurately guess A's next moves at all times. It was jarring, seeing Ken tilt his head or twist his body perfectly and avoid his hits every time. Then, Ken decided to try and put his all into a swing. As soon as he deflected one last hit from A, he dispelled his clones and directed all of his chakra into his blade, causing it to glow brightly and causing lightning to arc off in all directions. A saw that and smiled. Finally meeting me head on. He immediately recovered and prepared to use Hell Stab with his four fingers extended. Ken felt the chakra gathering around A's arm and forming a spear, he simply clenched his teeth and prepared for impact. I'll deplete all of my chakra in this move, to try and finish the fight in one fell swoop. If it fails, then I'll enter the scaled sage mode and go from there. Ken didn't just stop at his chakra though, he also allowed his nature energy to flow freely and rapidly causing a dangerous mix within the blade. My strongest slash. I've never tested this against an opponent before, let's see how it holds up. Just as the blade and the spear were about to meet each other, both Ken and A seemed to be forced to stop abruptly, their momentum dying off in an instant. What the hell are you doing, eh? A loud voice was heard as a figure appeared in between them, stopping Ken's blade by grasping the hilt with one hand while grasping A's wrist with the other. The blind swordsman immediately tried to pull back his blade when he felt the rakage appear between him and A, causing the slash to die out and allowing the rakage to catch it with ease. Ken's mind stirred, as he felt a different type of lighting around the rakage as he stopped both of their attacks masterfully. Only A managed to recognize it at that moment. Black Lighting Release Chakra Mode His father, the third rakage was well known for his master over black lighting. But few had ever seen the black lighting release chakra mode. It was an advanced version that combined the rakage's mastery over black lighting with the regular chakra mode. Which caused the end result to be the most powerful technique in the history of the land of lightning. Ken immediately stopped, not wanting to face off against the rakage as well, who somehow felt even faster than his pupil. The rakage let go of his hilt as soon as he felt no more resistance, allowing Ken to take a step backwards and put his blade back into the seal on his wrist. However, A was still struggling with something. He had seen a hint of fear in his father's eyes. I am still not strong enough to cause him to enter the black lighting release chakra mode. So that must mean? It was only then that it clicked for him. If he had clashed with Ken just now. I would have died. POV Narration the rakage had been observing his son sparring with Ken since the beginning. To be exact, the umbu he had trailing Ken had informed him of Killer B bothering him, and he decided to observe the situation personally ever since. He knew Killer B to be a rather arrogant young man, cocky and confident in his own abilities thanks to his status as a Jinchuriki, he hoped that he wouldn't try and antagonize Ken in any way. Thankfully, it seemed that B was in a very good mood, as he seemed quite friendly with Ken, not showcasing much of his usual arrogance. Unfortunately, the rakage son, A, didn't seem to be in that same mood as he acted exactly as the rakage had feared. It was rather ironic since he had gone as far as to admonish Killer B while he himself was doing a rather large mistake. 
The rakage was thinking of stepping in and stopping the duel from happening before it even began, but a part of him hesitated. He wanted to see just how strong Ken was. After all, taking on a weak village didn't mean much to someone like the rakage, who had fought and suppressed the Eight Tails numerous times. It was only in that spar that the rakage was able to appreciate Ken's speed in person. He was able to keep up with A, who was enhanced by the lighting release chakra mode. To the rakage's knowledge, there were no other shinobi capable of doing so in the world. Even if Ken was outmatched in speed, he seemed to somehow dwarf a when it came to skill, fighting experience and talent. Within a few short moves, he was able to understand, dissect and counter A's fighting style, which turned the fight into a complete stalemate, as he locked A in place with well-placed attacks. That was how the rakage had figured the fight would end. As a stalemate. After all, Ken seemed to not have any way of damaging A. At least until the last strike was about to happen. Just from looking at Ken's blade, the rakage had gotten a foreboding feeling, instantly entering his chakra mode and preparing for the worst. Only when seeing the lighting radiate off of the blade and scorch the earth around Ken and A did the rakage realize that the regular lighting release chakra mode wouldn't be able to block something like that. After all, the lighting release chakra mode consisted of coating your body in lighting chakra as one would a weapon. And the technique granted almost absolute defense. Unless one used a similar technique, or one strong enough to pierce the defenses. Immediately, a fatherly instinct overtook the rakage, and he rushed in to save his son and pupil. The rakage immediately used his trump card, the blue lightning around him turning completely black as he passed his son in a split second, who seemingly had no idea of his impending doom. He deflected both attacks using his superior speed. Thankfully Ken had also sensed him and stopped himself properly. A immediately turned off his chakra mode and looked at the scorched ground around them with fear in his eyes. I didn't even notice how much power there was behind that blade. I was so engrossed and frustrated with our exchange that I tunnel visioned on the red dot. He was immediately admonishing himself inwardly. Killer B came to his side, concerned, meanwhile the rakage faced Ken, who had already put his weapon away. Lord Rakage. Ken took a slight bow as the rakage also turned off his chakra mode, looking at his previously nice garden with a frustrated gaze. Ken? I understand that this matter wasn't your fault. But please refrain from such spars in the future. On one hand, the rakage wanted to try and punish Ken in some way, but on the other, he knew that it was completely the fault of his son. After all, A had also used Hell Stab, which, at least in the rakage's opinion, was no doubt going to kill Ken had it landed. I shall do so for as long as I remain in this cloud village. I apologize for using a lethal technique in what was supposed to be a friendly spar. Ken nodded as he slowly took out his mask and put it back on. No need to apologize. We can just agree that the fault lies on both sides. After all, some of it certainly lies with my son and me. He somewhat forced you into this duel, and I hadn't stopped it in time, allowing it to escalate to this point. The rakage decided to end the matter diplomatically in the end. After all, he still wanted to eventually recruit Ken into their cloud village, keeping a grudge on what could have happened wasn't something he could afford as the rakage. I understand, in that case, I believe we can just bury the hatchet regarding this matter. Ken nodded as raised his hand and felt some of the cracks on his mask, before sighing and realizing that he'd have to repair it once again. Meanwhile, the rakage had already resolved himself. I need to ensure that this man joins us in the future. He could prove essential in paving a path of greatness for my son and the Cloud Village. Even if he wishes to remain neutral, at the very least we can forge some sort of amicable relationship through business. The rakage's mind had already done the calculations, and seeing some of Ken's powers and abilities only made him realize that recruiting Ken was both a lot more important than he had thought, and a lot harder. A person capable of defeating the future rakage was not someone that would easily submit to others. Alas, the strong had all the right to have their pride in the rakage size. I'll go back to meditating. Calm my mind before the mission. My men should report by the end of the week. Ken nodded as he turned around and walked back to one of the trees in the garden, before sitting down at its roots and leaning on it. Just like that, the situation was over, and A was off to the rakage's office, where he was to receive a private scolding from his father alongside B.U.B. was less at fault for what had happened, 
only being scorned a bit for also not trying to stop the battle from happening, which was a bit of hypocrisy on the rakage's part. But A was in heaps of trouble, from disrespecting his father's orders to not antagonize Ken to even going as far as to fight him and create an awkward situation by almost dying as a result of that spar. In the end, after a verbal lashing, A was grounded, in the most basic way possible. Not allowed to leave his room for the rest of the week, only allowed to come out when they were to head out and take down the cult of Jashin. As promised, Saburo delivered the reports in a timely manner through their turtle summoning. Along with that was a bit of information, claiming they would meet up with Akira near the base, where he would relay the information he had gathered. The part with Akira was delivered verbally by the turtle, while the written reports were a tad longer and more complex. Ken didn't read them personally, not that he could. He instead walked up to the rakage's office and placed them on his table directly. The rakage wasted no time in picking them up and starting to read through them with an interested look in his eyes. He read the reports out loud so that Ken could also listen along and interject with any additional information or confirmation. In the end, the reports turned out to be interesting. They were both concise and extremely informative. Providing both the notes and thoughts of the researcher. All of the documents were signed with, the second blade, which the rakage assumed was a higher ranking member of Ken's organization. The rakage was genuinely impressed to find out that such a great mind was already in Ken's employ. From the second blade's reports, they were able to find out more about the actual method that the cult of Jashin had used to gain their immortality. By the researcher's description, from what I've studied, this seemed to be an odd amalgamation of curses and cursed techniques of all kinds mashed into a person. The one that did this likely tested on the cultists for extensive periods of time in order to reach such a result, and it's unlikely to be compatible with all people, as some curses have different effects on different people. Ken nodded when reading that. Saburo was able to give a rather satisfying breakdown of the cult of Jashin's immortality. The blind swordsman also noticed that Saburo had called the immortality a rather large disappointment in various paragraphs, showcasing his disdain at the barbaric and wishy-washy handiwork of who they assumed was the supreme leader of the cult of Jashin. The rakage himself was smirking when writing what was essentially a hit piece on said supreme leader, as the second blade broke down all of the weaknesses of their immortality. One of them was the fact that the cursed ones weren't actually immortal, they just couldn't die from injuries. The second blade was able to find out that said immortals would still continue to grow older, and they still needed nutrition, namely food and water, in order to survive, even when their heads were separated from their bodies. In dissecting the branch leader that they had captured, the second blade was also able to find out that the multitude of curses had already killed off a lot of the bodily functions of the immortals. It ended up making them unable to urinate or defecate, which actually led to them having to cut open their guts regularly in order to not implode after eating too much. The second blade was also able to confirm the weakness to fire, but he also confirmed that they were relatively weak to seals in general, as a few seals could end up undoing some of the jujitsu that was still keeping them alive. Then came the things that could change differing from immortal to immortal. Some would have a reluctant resistance to fire at the cost of their skin being eroded. Some could have all of their reasoning wiped out completely, turning into mindless puppets. And some could be completely missing parts of their bodies and organs. Either that or slowly rotting away inside due to some of the curses. There were some other variables as well, but Saburo was unable to calculate all of them from one single test subject. Just the amount of information he was able to extract was already impressive. It was clear that Saburo had worked tirelessly and without sleeping alongside several clones ever since Ken had left for the Cloud Village. Overall, Saburo was able to conclude that the immortality was nothing more than a fluke that enabled them to use some of their more powerful jujitsu techniques like the one that Ken had been struck with. This does help give us some assurance. The rakage put the papers down as he stroked his beard with a smile on his face. So it would seem. Let's just hope we're able to use all of this to our advantage. Ken tapped his chin with a smile underneath his mask, as he turned his head to the rakage. From this report, we can safely assume that some of the other immortals we'll face won't be as strong as the one you faced. Most of them are likely to be crippled in some way or another. The rakage narrowed his eyes as he turned his head to look out the window for a bit. 
The seals mentioned could be useful, but I'm assuming the Cloud Village doesn't have any techniques similar to the ones described, right? Ken crossed his arms and slowly paced around the room as he started thinking of a few viable strategies. Saburo had only mentioned that some seals could affect the curses present on the bodies of the immortals. He didn't give exact examples of said seals, but he described the effects that those seals would need to have in order to disrupt the curses. Unfortunately, our village is quite lacking when it comes to few Jutsu, but I believe we should be fine as we are. The two of us, as well as A and B, should be more than enough to deal with anything that comes our way. Fair enough. I guess we'll just have to be careful. Jujitsu does appear to be particularly difficult to deal with. Ken nodded as he continued slowly pacing around the room. Just don't bleed and we'll be fine. As long as we fight carefully, it should all go smoothly. The rakage then slowly stood up, dusting off his coat as he slowly walked over to the door. What, we're heading there now? Ken tilted his head in confusion as he spoke. Yep. No reason to waste time here. I'll go grab A and B. Meet you at the gate in a few minutes. The rakage said his piece and disappeared in a flash of lightning, earning an exasperated sigh from Ken, who ended up just shaking his head and disappearing, leaving only an afterimage for the umbu to look at. I guess we'll have to go meet up with Akira now. I hope he was at least able to find out a few things about the cult before we jump headfirst into their territory. POV Narration Ken decided to take his time as he walked through the village unsupervised for the first time. He was still headed for the gate, he just decided to make the others wait a bit for him, as the rakage did start the mission suddenly. The blind swordsman took a few moments to admire the brickwork in that village, it was built on a mountain range, reaching all the way up to the clouds. It was actually a rather impressive structure overall, one that Ken hadn't gotten to admire much when arriving, as he had been too bothered with his thoughts. Now he could enjoy it all, the wind, the clouds, the strangely cheery atmosphere which reminded him that the hidden villages were filled with a lot more people than just shinobi. It was rather strange for him to see children playing around in the streets. Especially since he knew that most children would end up as child soldiers in the future, forced to fight in a war they had no understanding of. Alas, Ken wasn't the arbiter of justice in the world, he couldn't stop wars from happening, and he was far from having the influence to stop child solders from being a thing. Maybe one day he would have the influence to do so, but many had tried and failed in the past, including the A God of Shinobi Hazarama, who Ken had only heard about in a few books. Alas, even the village that said God of Shinobi founded was using child soldiers from what Ken remembered, so completely abolishing the practice would likely be almost impossible so long as the wars continued. I'll see what I can do about it, but there's no reason to stress over it. Can't control all warmongering lords. As long as there's money to be made from it, war will never truly end. At least I'll build my own little slice of heaven. The blind child continued walking around for a bit, enjoying the scenery as best he could while steadily getting closer to the gate, where he assumed the rakage and the others were already expecting him. The cluster of the city helped dampen his senses, thankfully he could still feel the signatures of everyone around him. Surprisingly, he also ran into a more familiar face. A woman whose aura Ken could still recognize. Ken? Even her voice was familiar, coded in the same confusion and wariness that had appeared the first time they had met. It wasn't exactly something he could forget at the end of the day. The moment he hunted his first bounty, he had technically used the woman as bait. Mabui! Fancy meeting you here? The blind assassin nodded towards the fledgling Jonin as he enjoyed her confusion for a few moments. Ken didn't know what to think about the woman, the only thing he knew about her was that she was a bit sloppy when it came to actual shinobi work. She's likely more suited for a logistic position. Though I'm guessing all Jonin need to lead a team of Jenin at some point. What are you doing here? She asked as she turned and looked around them, likely searching for any umbu that were trailing Ken. But there were none in sight, meaning he wasn't being escorted personally. Which could have meant one of two things. One, in the short two weeks she had been missing, Ken had already forged amicable relationships with the cloud and or joined them. Two, he had infiltrated the village and had somehow gone undetected till now at least those were the two options that came to her mind. I guess you were away on a mission till now. I've been contracted for a special assignment by the rakage. 
Ken smiled underneath his mask as he turned his head to the woman and focused on her a bit more. She seemed to be wearing Jonan garb, donning a long-sleeved shirt this time around, not showcasing any cleavage. Not that Ken would have had any eyes to admire it anyway. A contract? With an outsider? Ken could feel Mabui's eyes widening as she exclaimed out loud, attracting the attention of plenty of people around them. People were already instinctively keeping a certain distance from Ken since plenty of civilians knew of him already. His reputation was still not exactly good, as the grass village had done a great job of making him look like a madman. Needless to say, catching their attention in that way certainly didn't help ease any of their nerves. Yep, nothing too major, though I am getting paid a pretty penny for it. Ken nodded twice as he walked a bit closer to the woman and tapped her on the shoulder. She was either startled, or too scared to react, but Ken had to cut their conversation short, unfortunately, as he assumed that the rakage and the others growing impatient. You'll have to talk to the rakage directly for more details, but you'll have to do it later. We'll be heading off now, good luck with your students. Ken then waved at her a bit and disappeared, leaving only an afterimage behind as he rushed forward to the entrance of the village. Mabui only got to have a glimpse at his disappearing back. She had many questions on her mind, she was also quite confused and wanted to know more about his side of the grass village situation. But the first thought that surfaced in her mind after she blinked a few times was completely unrelated to any of her curiosities. Did he get taller? POV Ken. It's always nice running into someone you know in a crowd of strangers, even if said someone is nothing more than a brief acquaintance that you once used as bait to fish out a bloodthirsty criminal. Now that I think about it, that criminal might have been just thirsty in general, but that's not really important anymore, there's plenty of water in the afterlife. Ken! What took you so long? The rakage is already in my face from the moment I appeared in front of them. I just felt like strolling through the village for a bit, nothing major. Too bad I didn't get to try out any of your traditional foods. Maybe some other Kage would have been a bit warier of me strolling around their village, but the rakage seems quite unbothered. He's either really confident that I am an ally and has no plans of antagonizing me, or he's so sure of his strength that he's not bothered by me. Well? Try to do that some other time. It ain't my fault that you decided to spend all of your free time till now sitting on your ass and meditating. He still seems a bit critical of how I spend my free time. To the rakage's words, I just nodded, can't really refute them after all. What can I say? I really enjoy peace and quiet. Maybe because of my enhanced hearing? It does make it annoying to be near some people. People like Killer B and even A, who both seemed to be quite loud during our first meetings, but now seem to be rather quiet. I guess that little spar left a strong impression on them, though I don't get why B is also affected by it. Still, I feel dissatisfied at not getting to test out that final slash. It's not even a named attack, but I'm quite sure it's my strongest. Though some attacks in my scaled sage mode might be able to match it. No reason to cry over it though. I'm sure I'll get the opportunity to test it out in this little mission. POV Narration The four shinobi dashed through the barren wastes that comprised the land of lighting. It wasn't exactly a land filled with lush forests, the forests were actually few and far between, so it was mostly open terrain and caves. Ken was fine with it. Though it did feel a lot quieter than he was used to. He had gotten so used to nature all around him that he hadn't even realized just how much noise it actually made. It was only then that Ken realized he mostly enjoyed the ambience of nature more so than actual quiet. But he wasn't the only one caught up in his own thoughts. Everyone else was also the exact same. The rakage was pondering on their mission, as well as trying to imagine what other curses they might end up encountering while facing the cult of Jashin. Meanwhile, both A and B sometimes glanced at Ken, who was easily keeping up with them. Neither of them was truly focused on the mission, as they both seemed to focus more on Ken. A for one was still a bit annoyed at having been grounded in his room as a 30-year-old, but he didn't voice out that frustration, nor did he plan to ever try and take it out on Ken. Instead, he looked at Ken with a more respectful gaze now, hoping to be able to use the blind swordsman as motivation and strive to become stronger. Meanwhile, B was having an entirely different internal debate. I still don't get it. Why exactly are you this wary around this bounty hunter? Killer B's thoughts lacked the usual rhyme that his voice would have had. The voice that responded was a lot different, sounding more monstrous, and inhuman. 
I'm telling you, never try to antagonize this thing. This bounty hunter of yours is not even human, he feels more like a tailed beast. But it's not chakra that he's made out of. The voice that responded was the eight tails that was still sealed within Killer Bee. Also named Gyuki. The large monster was a mix of octopus and bull. It was one of the nine-tailed beasts, arguably the second strongest right behind the nine-tailed fox. Like all tailed beasts, Gyuki was a being made out of chakra, normally impossible to kill, but also too powerful to be left to its own devices. That was the main reason why the villages sealed the tailed beasts? That and personal power. After all, the Jinchuriki, the tailed beast carriers, were all valuable assets to villages. As a Jinchuriki, Killer Bee still had a bit to go before completely mastering the use of the tailed beast's chakra, but Gyuki did speak to him quite often, and the two of them were somehow managing to get along. The second that the tailed beast had sensed Ken though, that was when things went awry. It was just something off about his presence, the tailed beast couldn't quite put its large finger on it at first, but the more Ken stayed at the Rakage's mansion the more the tailed beast was able to figure a few things out. At first, Gyuki thought that Ken seemed to be a bit similar to the father of tailed beasts, Hagoromo. But after taking a better look, that clearly wasn't the case. Ken didn't seem to have any special bloodline limit or any actual connection to the Sage of Six Paths. At least no connection that the tailed beast was able to detect. So, it ended up realizing that instead of being similar to Hagoromo, Ken was a lot more similar to Gyuki himself. The tailed beast was able to notice an overwhelming amount of nature energy inside Ken's body, on the surface, it didn't look any different from a regular human's body, but it couldn't be more different. His state was something that the Gyuki would describe as a tailed beast, but it seems he is made out of nature energy more so than chakra. That was about the extent of what Gyuki could tell from observing Ken, but it was already a lot more than Ken himself knew. In the end, Gyuki did also care for Killer Bee, despite his sometimes odd mannerisms. And that care was what prompted the tailed beast to advise him against getting involved too deeply with Ken. The silence stretched out for the entirety of the journey, which only took around two days, as the four moved at rather impressive speeds. After a while, the rakage did inform Ken that they were approaching the mountain. He could even feel it in the distance, a rocky and jagged mountain that felt more like a giant earth spike than anything. So, they were getting closer and closer to their objective, eventually even reaching the base of the mountain, stealthily. There was a problem, however. Where is Akira? POV narration. Wasn't your scout supposed to be around these parts, Ken? The rakage asked as he looked around the barren base of the mountain range. Indeed. He said he'd be waiting nearby. Ken took a deep breath and allowed his senses to stretch out all around him, focusing on every movement he could feel. Every bird, every critter, and every animal nearby. He could feel them, he could feel the vibrations within the earth, yet he could feel no trace of his subordinate. Well now, this is rather concerning. Do you think he was captured? Killer B asked as he looked around as well. The rakage and a looked at him with a bit of scorn, not appreciating his input much. It couldn't be helped though, he was currently perceived as the youngest in the team, and the most inexperienced. He was not even 18 after all, and he was still just a chunin. Alas, they had no way of knowing that Ken was technically not even a teenager yet. It's a possibility. But I can't feel any signs of struggle, not burnt ground or kunai fragments around, no traces of jutsu being used. Ken took off his mask and took a deep breath, scowling as he did so. There is the faint scent of blood. But it doesn't smell like my subordinate, though it is hard to tell. Ken then dashed forward, and the three cloud shinobi just looked at each other and followed suit. Ken then abruptly stopped, sniffing the air a few times before dragging his feet on the ground, pushing away some thick dust to reveal a rather large patch of dried up blood. The rakage seemed shocked when seeing that. His nose is better than a summoned beast's. His senses really are scary. Killer B thought absent-mindedly as he stared at the baffling scene in front of him. It's to be expected. I already told you he's a monster, don't compare yourself to him even if you're a Jinchuriki. You can think of him as a bloodhound if it makes you feel better. The tailed beast within B was less impressed, it had already expected that much out of what was essentially a nature-born, tailed, beast. Ken then crouched down and touched the dirty ground, 
the tips of his fingers dragging across it and rubbing against the blood splatter. It's already a few days old. It seems that someone with proper skill hid most of the traces of a fight. They also likely created a dust storm or something similar to cover the blood, since cleaning it would have taken too long. Ken then slowly stood up and licked the tips of his fingers his nose scrunching up slightly as he confirmed his suspicion. Yep. It's not the third blade's blood. Likely some cultist. Ken then tapped his wrist and took out the long sheath of his blade, just the sheath. The rakage and A both seemed to understand what Ken was planning, they both moved back and A also dragged B along with them. The blind swordsman then swung the sheath with unnatural strength, creating a gust of wind strong enough to blow away all of the dust nearby, sending it flying further away into the mountain range alongside some rocks. The ground around them somewhat cleared, and now it became relatively clear that something had happened. There were dried up splatters of blood everywhere in the vicinity, it was a large fight. It's also possible that this is related to some of their rituals, right? The rakage wasn't about to try and dash Ken's hopes of finding his subordinate alive though. The blind swordsman wasn't exactly irrational enough to buy it. If your patrols haven't spotted the cultists before then it's unlikely that they carry out their rituals out in the open. Ken shook his head, his long spiky black hair swaying from side to side. Killer B grimaced a bit, as A scowled and looked to the side, clearly not all that invested in the life of Ken's subordinate. He was however still quite annoyed that they now had lost one of their information sources. My subordinate got a bit too close, he only has himself to blame, but I'll make sure to punish him properly when we find him. The bounty hunter shook his head slightly as he reached to his belt and put his mask back on. But what if he's already DEA dash, be gulped a bit as he swallowed his words as the rakage gave him a sideways glare. Hmm. It's likely he died already. But they also might have captured him for one of their rituals, which means there's a chance he still lives. The rakage nodded when hearing that, before looking around the empty mountain range. So, do we just scout the surroundings now? We don't exactly know where to find the entrance, without your scout we might spend some time just running around the mountain. A looked at his father before looking at Ken. This is a rather large blunder. I believe you would understand us if we plan to reconsider the amount for your payment in this mission, as it was largely dependent on the information you provided. A scowled as he spoke, not bothering to be respectful anymore, possibly emboldened by being in the presence of his father. The rakage looked at his son with a frustrated gaze, shaking his head slightly in disappointment. I thought I trained him better. At the very least well enough to recognize the usefulness of having someone like Ken around. He was about to open his mouth and disregard his son's words personally, as he was a man of his word at the end of the day, but Ken beat him to it. The contract we signed only consisted of hiring me personally, not the Dark Brotherhood, my organization. The Third Blades report was not essential to the contract in any way. Besides that, I can deal with finding the entrance to their hideout. I just scoffed, looking at the large mountain range. How long will it take you exactly? This is the second largest mountain in our land. The blind swordsman just turned his head toward A, a small smile spreading on his lips. Ken then tapped the hilt of his blade heavily on the ground, causing it to slightly cave in as cracks spread out all around him. The blind child listened to the vibrations, he felt them as he crouched down once more to touch the ground. After a few seconds, he stood back up and turned to the three confused cloud shinobi. We are above a network of caves, it lays deep within the ground. I can find an entrance to it if we walk around the mountain range for a few minutes. I was instantly silenced by that sentence, as the rakage smiled confidently. As expected of you, Red Dot, you do deserve your reputation at the end of the day. I'm sure we'll find your subordinate, better start looking quickly, the sooner, the better. Don't worry about the contract, by the way, it remains as initially established. The rakage was quick to praise and reassure the assassin as he patted him on the shoulder. Ken's entire body shook at the strength of the tan man's arms, but he didn't complain. A looked a bit bitter, but he stopped complaining when seeing how his father treated Ken. Heh. I guess that's why you don't question professionals. B also chuckled a bit internally, already expecting something like that to happen. Well, he did just manage to smell a few days old dried up blood splatter from a few hundred meters away. I'm guessing he is the best sensor in the world, though I could be wrong. He's certainly better than me. 
The eight tails within be also commented on the scene. The tailed beasts were also able to act as censors, and quite good ones at that. But Gyuki was quite sure that none among his brothers and sisters could match Ken when it came to their sensorial powers. Such is the way nature energy works. Though I still fail to understand how the body of this Ken actually functions. Gyuki pondered for a few moments as Ken started moving. The rakage and the rest followed suit, dashing through the cloud of dust that Ken had raised with confidence in their eyes before they were filled with dust. Ken didn't have any issues, as he wore a mask, it wasn't like he had any eyes that dust could affect though. The rakage and had just used their lighting style chakra mode. Killer B was a bit less fortunate, having to cover his eyes with an arm as he ran forwards. In the end, it didn't take Ken more than a few moments to find the entrance to the hideout, more specifically, he found a less underground part of the cave system, a place where they could create an entry. A's eyebrow trembled a bit when Ken had managed to find a potential entrance so quickly, but that did also raise another question in his mind. If you're able to find an entrance so easily, then why did you send someone ahead of time? It was a rather decent point, but it also assumed that Ken had sent the third blade to look for an entrance. My man was only here to keep an eye for any movements. He was never meant to get close enough to discover any entrances. Ken slowly walked around a bit before finding the perfect point to create a cave entrance. Enough with the interrogation A. Eh? We'll have a talk about your behavior again when we get back home. The rakage had also gotten fed up with his son's willfulness. He hadn't expected that much arrogance out of the one he had prepared to become the next rakage, it was shocking to see that Killer B was more behaved than him. A just looked to the side and mumbled something, while B just sighed and scratched the back of his head. Sue. Are the three of you ready? We're going to be fighting quite a few people, the numbers of this organization are actually rather staggering, certainly greater than the ones of the grass village from what I can sense. The blind swordsman said as he turned his head to the ground below them. Heh. To think such a force was hiding in our midst. The rakage spat out with a scowl on his face and frustration in his gaze. No need to fuss over it. We'll handle everything now. Ken spoke out as he tapped his wrist and took out his long blade, brandishing it with one hand without any difficulty. He also placed the sheath of the blade back into the seal, as he wasn't planning on using it. I'll make the entrance, Ken said as he signaled for the three of them to stand back. He then grabbed his long sword with both hands, covering it in chakra as it sparkled with lighting, looking as if it had just gained life. The masked assassin then jumped to the sky, twisting around a few times and building momentum with ease. The surrounding wind twisted and turned, as he swung his blade down to the ground below, sending a sizable flying slash towards the ground. The entire ground shook and caved in, as the flying slash fragmented the earth all around them, with the rakage and the rest having to jump up in order to not lose their balance. The dust that rose up to engulf all of their surroundings disappeared just as quickly as it had appeared, as Ken swung the blunt side of his blade and blew it all away. B was almost blown away alongside it, but he managed to hold on by forcefully landing and sticking to the ground. Now they all had a clear view. Below them was a rather large drop, leading to a gigantic hall, one that had been carved out from stone. Hundreds of cultists were already looking up at the crack in their ceiling, and many people within the cave system were alerted to the tremor as soon as it happened. Further inside, one man with two pairs of eyes slowly opened them, tattooed all across his body were the signs of Jashin, not one part of his skin was left uncovered, and the signs also seemed to be tattooed on his eyes. So we have more visitors. Ha! Huh? The man then slowly gestured to some of the people that stood kneeling inside the room, as a confident smile rose to his face. Devout followers of Jashin? Those who have gained his blessing and those that have proved their adoration. Go out there and make sure that our Lord's most sacred grounds are not tarnished by these dirty heathens. The man spoke out with authority, and a dozen men and women of different shapes and sizes all got up slowly, each wearing long robes and carrying different red weapons. We shall paint the halls with their blood. The ten devout followers chanted as they then took off, each faster than the last. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.